The Abominations of Yondo by Clark Ashton Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Abominations of Yondo by Clark Ashton Smith. The sand of the desert of Yondo is not as the sand of other deserts, for Yondo lies nearest of all to the world's rim, and strange winds, blowing winds, blowing from a gulf no astronomer may hope to fathom, have sown its ruinous fields with the gray dust of corroding planets, the black ashes of extinguished suns. The dark orb-like mountains which rise from its wrinkled and pitted plain are not all its own. For some are fallen asteroids, half buried in that abysmal sand. Things have crept in from nether space, whose incursion is forbid by the gods of all proper and well-ordered lands. But there are no such gods in Yondo, where live the hoary genie of stars abolished, and decrepit demons left homeless by the destruction of antiquated hells. It was noon of a vernal day when I came forth from that interminable cactus forest in which the inquisitors of Ong had left me, and saw at my feet the grey beginnings of Yondo. I repeat, it was noon of a vernal day, but in that fantastic wood I had found no token or memory of spring, and the swollen, fulvous, dying, and half-rotten growth through which I had pushed my way were like no other cacti, but bore shapes of abomination scarcely to be described. The very air was heavy with stagnant odors of decay, and leprous lichens mottled the black soil and russet vegetation with increasing frequency. Pale green vipers lifted their heads from prostrate cactus bowls and watched me with eyes of bright ochre that had no lids or pupils. These things had disquieted me for hours past, and I did not like the monstrous fungi, with hueless stems and nodding heads of poisonous mauve, which grew from the sodden lips of fetid tarns, and the sinister ripples, spreading and fading on the yellow water at my approach, were not reassuring to one whose nerves were still taut from unmentionable tortures. Then, when even the blotched and sickly cacti became more sparse and stunted, and rills of ashen sand crept in among them, I began to suspect how great was the hatred my heresy had aroused in the priests of Ong, and to guess the ultimate malignancy of their vengeance. I will not detail the indiscretions which had led me, a careless stranger from far-off lands, into the power of those dreadful magicians and mysteriarchs who served the lion-headed Ong. These indiscretions and the particulars of my arrest are painful to remember, and least of all do I like to remember the racks of dragon-gut strewn with powdered adamant, on which men are stretched naked, or that unlit room with six-inch windows near the sill, where bloated corpse-worms crawled in by hundreds from a neighboring catacomb. Sufficient to say that, after expending the resources of their frightful fantasy, my inquisitors had borne me blindfolded on camelback for incomputable hours to leave me at morning twilight in that sinister forest. I was free, they told me, to go whither I would, and in token of the clemency of Ong, they gave me a loaf of coarse bread and a leathern bottle of rank water by way of provision. It was at noon of the same day that I came to the desert of Yondo. So far, I had not thought of turning back for all the horror of those rotting cacti or the evil things that dwelt among them. Now I pause, knowing the abominable legend of the land to which I had come, for Yondo is a place where few have ventured wittingly and of their own accord. Fewer still have returned, babbling of unknown horrors and strange treasure, and the lifelong palsy which shakes their withered limbs, together with the mad gleam in their starting eyes beneath whitened brows and lashes, is not an incentive for others to follow. So it was that I hesitated on the verge of those ashen sands, and felt the tremor of a new fear in my wrenched vitals. It was dreadful to go on, and dreadful to go back, for I felt sure that the priests had made provision against the latter contingency. So after a little I went forward, sinking at each step in loathly softness, and followed by certain long-legged insects that I had met among the cacti. These insects were the color of a week-old corpse, and were large as tarantulas. But when I turned and trod upon the foremost, 
a mephitic stench arose that was more nauseous even than their color. So for once, I ignored them as much as possible. Indeed, such things were minor horrors in my predicament. Before me, under a huge sun of sickly scarlet, Yondo reached interminable as the land of a hashish dream against the black heavens. Far off on the utmost rim were those orb-like mountains of which I have told. But in between were awful blanks of gray desolation, and low treeless hills like the back of half-buried monsters. Struggling on, I saw gray pits where meteors had sunk from sight, and divers colored jewels that I could not name glared or glistened from the dust. There were fallen cypresses that rotted by crumbling mausoleums, on whose lichen-blotted marble fat chameleons crept with royal pearls in their mouths. Hidden by the low ridges were cities of which no stala remained unbroken, immense and immemorial cities lapsing shard by shard, atom by atom, to feed infinities of desolation. I dragged my torture-weakened limbs over vast rubbish heaps that had once been mighty temples, and fallen gods frowned in rotting Samite, or leered in riven porphyry at my feet. Over all was an evil silence, broken only by the satanic laughter of hyenas, and the rustling of adders and thickets of dead thorn or antique gardens given to the perishing nettle and fumatory. Topping one of many mound-like ridges, I saw the waters of a weird lake, unfathomably dark and green as malachite and set with bars of profulgent salt. These waters lay far beneath me in a cup-like hollow, but almost at my feet on the wave-worn slopes were heaps of that ancient salt, and I knew that the lake was only the bitter and ebbing dregs of some former sea. Climbing down, I came to the dark waters, and began to lave my hands. But there was a sharp and corrosive sting in that immemorial brine, and I desisted quickly preferring the desert dust that had wrapped me about like a slow shroud. Here I decided to rest for a little, and hunger forced me to consume part of the meager and mocking fare with which I had been provided by the priests. It was my intention to push on, if my strength would allow, and reach the lands that lie to the north of Yondo. These lands are desolate, indeed, but their desolation is of a more usual order than that of Yondo, and certain tribes of nomads have been known to visit them occasionally. If fortune favored me, I might fall in with one of these tribes. The scant fare revived me, and for the first time in weeks of which I had lost all reckoning, I heard the whisper of a faint hope. The corpse-colored insects had long since ceased to follow me, and so far, despite the eeriness of the sepulchral silence and the mounded dust of timeless ruin, I had met nothing half so horrible as those insects. I began to think that the terrors of Yondo were somewhat exaggerated. It was then that I heard a diabolic chuckle on the hillside above me. The sound began with a sharp abruptness that startled me beyond all reason, and continued endlessly, never varying its single note like the mirth of an idiotic demon. I turned and saw the mouth of a dark cave, fanged with green stalactites, which I had not perceived before. The sound appeared to come from within this cave. With a fearful intentness, I stared at the black opening. The chuckle grew louder. But for a while I could see nothing. At last I caught a whitish glimmer in the darkness. Then, with all the rapidity of nightmare, a monstrous thing emerged. It had a pale, hairless, egg-shaped body, large as that of a gravid she-goat. And this body was mounted on nine long, wavering legs with many flanges, like the legs of some enormous spider. The creature ran past me to the water's edge, and I saw that there were no eyes in its oddly sloping face, but two knife-like ears rose high above its head, and a thin, wrinkled snout hung down across its mouth, whose flabby lips, parted in that eternal chuckle, revealed rows of bat's teeth. It drank avidly of the bitter lake. Then, with thirst satisfied, it turned and seemed to sense my presence, for the wrinkled snout rose and pointed toward me sniffing audibly. Whether the creature would have fled or whether it meant to attack me, I do not know, for I could bear the sight no longer, but ran with trembling limbs amid the massive boulders and great bars of salt along the lake shore. Utterly breathless, I stopped at last, and saw that I was not pursued. I sat down, still trembling, in the shadow of a boulder. 
but I was to find little respite. For now began the second of those bizarre adventures which forced me to believe all the mad legends I had heard. More startling even than that diabolic chuckle was the scream that rose at my very elbow, from the salt-compounded sand, the scream of a woman possessed by some atrocious agony, or helpless in the grip of devils. Turning, I beheld a veritable Venus, naked in a white perfection that could fear no scrutiny, but immersed to her navel in the sand. Her terror-widened eyes implored me, and her lotus hands reached out, with beseeching gesture. I sprang to her side and touched a marble statue, whose carven lids were drooping in some enigmatic dream of dead cycles, and whose hands were buried with the lost loveliness of hips and thighs. Again I fled, shaken with a new fear, and again I heard the scream of a woman's agony, but this time I did not turn to see the imploring eyes and hands. Up the long slope to the north of that accursed lake, stumbling over boulders of basinite and ledges that were sharp with verdigree covered metals, floundering in pits of salt on terraces wrought by the receding tide and ancient eons, I fled as a man flies from dream to baleful dream of some cacodemoniacal night. At whiles there was a cold whisper in my ear which did not come from the wind of my flight, and looking back as I reached one of the upper terraces, I perceived a singular shadow that ran pace by pace with my own. This shadow was not the shadow of man nor ape, nor any known beast. The head was too grotesquely elongated, the squat body too gibbous, and I was unable to determine whether the shadow possessed five legs or whether what appeared to be the fifth was merely a tail. Terror lent me new strength, and I had reached the hilltop when I dared to look back again. But still the fantastic shadow kept pace by pace with mine, and now I caught a curious and utterly sickening odor, foul as the odor of bats who have hung in a charnel house amid the mold of corruption. I ran for leagues while the red sun slanted above the asteroidal mountains to the west, and the weird shadow lengthened with mine but kept always at the same distance behind me. An hour before sunset I came to a circle of small pillars that rose miraculously unbroken amid ruins that were like a vast pile of potsherds. As I passed among these pillars I heard a whimper, like the whimper of some fierce animal between rage and fear, and saw that the shadow had not followed me within the circle. I stopped and waited, conjecturing at once that I had found a sanctuary my unwelcome familiar would not dare to enter. And in this the action of the shadow confirmed me, for the thing hesitated, then ran about the circle of columns, pausing often between them, and, whimpering all the while, at last went away and disappeared in the desert toward the setting sun. For a full half hour I did not dare to move. Then the eminence of night, with all its probabilities of fresh terror, urged me to push on as far as I could to the north, for I was now in the very heart of Yondo, where demons or phantoms might dwell who would not respect the sanctuary of the unbroken columns. Now as I toiled on, the sunlight altered strangely, for the red orb, nearing the mounded horizon, sank and smoldered in a belt of miasmal haze where floating dust from all the shattered fanes and necropoli of Yondo was mixed with evil vapors, coiling skyward from black enormous gulfs lying beyond the utmost rim of the world. In that light, the entire waste, the rounded mountains, the serpentine hills, the lost cities, were drenched with phantasmal and darkening scarlet. Then, out of the north, where shadows mustered, there came a curious figure, a tall man fully caparisoned in chainmail, or rather what I assumed to be a man. As the figure approached me, clanking dismally at each step on the sharded ground, I saw that its armor was of brass mottled with verdigris, and the cask of the same metal, furnished with coiling horns and a serrate comb, rose high above its head. I say its head, for the sunset was darkening, and I could not see clearly at any distance. But when the apparition came abreast, I perceived that there was no face beneath the brows of that bizarre helmet, whose empty edges were outlined for a moment against the smoldering light. Then the figure passed on, still clanking dismally, and vanished. But on its hills, ere the sunset faded, there came a second apparition, striding with incredible strides, and halting when it loomed almost upon me in the red twilight, 
the monstrous mummy of some ancient king, still crowned with untarnished gold, but turning to my gaze a visage that more than time or the worm had wasted. Broken swathings flapped about the skeleton legs, and above the crown that was set with sapphires and orange rubies, a black something swayed and nodded horribly. But for an instant, I did not dream what it was. Then, in its middle, two oblique and scarlet eyes opened and glowed like hellish coals, and two ophidian fangs glittered in an ape-like mouth. A squat, furless, shapeless head on a neck of disproportionate extent leaned unspeakably down and whispered in the mummy's ear. Then, with one stride, the titanic lich took half the distance between us, and from out the folds of the tattered sere cloth a gaunt arm arose, and fleshless taloned fingers, laden with glowering gems, reached out and fumbled from my throat. Back, back through eons of madness and dread, in a prone, precipitate flight, I ran from those fumbling fingers that hung always on the dusk behind me. Back, back forever, unthinking, unhesitating to all the abominations I had left. Back in the thickening twilight, toward the nameless and sharded ruins. The haunted lake, the forest of evil cacti, and the cruel and cynical inquisitors of Ong, who wait my return. End of The Abominations of Yondo by Clark Ashton Smith Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick Larry Thomas bought a cuckoo clock for his wife without knowing the price he would have to pay. That night, at the dinner table, he brought it out and set it down beside her plate. Doris stared at it, her hand to her mouth. My God, what is it? She looked up at him, bright-eyed. Well, open it. Doris tore the ribbon and paper from the square package with her sharp nails, her bosom rising and falling. Larry stood watching her as she lifted the lid. He lit a cigarette and leaned against the wall. A cuckoo clock, Doris cried. A real old cuckoo clock like my mother had. She turned the clock over and over, just like my mother had when Pete was still alive. Her eyes sparkled with tears. It's made in Germany, Larry said. After a moment, he added, Carl got it for me wholesale. He knows some guy in the clock business. Otherwise, I wouldn't have. He stopped. Doris made a funny little sound. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. He scowled. What's the matter with you? You've got your clock, haven't you? Isn't that what you want? Doris sat, holding on to the clock her fingers pressed against the brown wood. Well, Larry said, what's the matter? He watched in amazement as she leaped up and ran from the room, still clutching the clock. He shook his head, never satisfied. They are all that way. Never get enough. He sat down at the table and finished his meal. The cuckoo clock was not very large. It was handmade, however, and there were countless frets on it, little indentations and ornaments scored in the soft wood. Doris sat on the bed, drying her eyes and winding the clock. She set the hands by her wristwatch. Presently, she carefully moved the hands to two minutes of ten. She carried the clock over to the dresser and propped it up. Then she sat waiting, her hands twisted together in her lap, waiting for the cuckoo to come out, for the hour to strike. As she sat, she thought about Larry, and what he had said, and what she had said, too, for that matter. Not that she could be blamed for it. After all, she couldn't keep listening to him forever. Without defending herself, you had to blow your own trumpet in the world. She touched her handkerchief to her eyes suddenly. Why did he have to say that about getting it wholesale? 
Why did he have to spoil it all? If he felt that way, he needn't have got it in the first place. She clenched her fists. He was so mean, so damn mean. But she was glad of the little clock sitting there, ticking to itself with its funny grilled edges and the door. Inside the door was the cuckoo waiting to come out. Was he listening? his head cocked on one side, listening to hear the clock strike so that he would know to come out. Did he sleep between hours? Well, she would soon see him. She could ask him, and she would show the clock to Bob. He would love it. Bob loved old things, even old stamps and buttons. He liked to go with her to the stores. Of course, it was a little awkward, but Larry had been staying at the office so much, and that helped. If only Larry didn't call up sometimes, too. There was a whir. The clock shuddered, and all at once the door opened. The cuckoo came out, sliding swiftly. He paused and looked around solemnly, scrutinizing her, the room, the furniture. It was the first time he had seen her, she realized, smiling to herself in pleasure. She stood up, coming toward him shyly. Go on, she said. I'm waiting. The cuckoo opened his bill. He whirred and chirped quickly, rhythmically. Then, after a moment of contemplation, he retired. The door snapped shut. She was delighted. She clapped her hands and spun in a little circle. He was marvelous, perfect, and the way he had looked around, studying her, sizing her up, he liked her. She was certain of it, and she, of course, loved him at once, completely. He was just what she had hoped would come out of the little door. Doris went to the clock. She bent over the little door, her lips close to the wood. Do you hear me? She whispered. I think you're the most wonderful cuckoo in the world. She paused, embarrassed. I hope you'll like it here. Then she went downstairs again, slowly, her head high. Larry and the cuckoo clock really never got along well from the start. Doris said that it was because he didn't wind it right, and it didn't like being only half wound all the time. Larry turned the job of winding over to her. The cuckoo came out every quarter hour and ran the spring down without remorse, and someone had to be ever after it winding it up again. Doris did her best, but she forgot a good deal of the time. Then Larry would throw his newspaper down with an elaborate weary motion and stand up. He would go into the dining room where the clock was mounted on the wall over the fireplace. He would take the clock down and making sure that he had his thumb over the little door, he would wind it up. Why do you put your thumb over the door? Doris asked once. You are supposed to. She raised an eyebrow. Are you sure? I wonder if it isn't that you don't want him to come out while you're standing so close. Why not? Maybe you are afraid of him. Larry laughed. He put the clock back on the wall and gingerly removed his thumb. When Doris wasn't looking, he examined his thumb. There was still a trace of the nick cut out of the soft part of it. Who or what? had pecked at him. One Saturday morning, when Larry was down at the office working over some important special accounts, Bob Chambers came to the front porch and rang the bell. Doris was taking a quick shower. She dried herself and slipped into her robe. When she opened the door, Bob stepped inside, grinning. Hi, he said, looking around. It's all right. Larry's at the office. Fine. Bob gazed at her slim legs below the hem of the robe. How nice you look today. She laughed. Be careful. Maybe I shouldn't let you in after all. They looked at one another, half amused, half frightened. Presently, Bob said, if you want, I'll... No, for God's sake. She caught hold of his sleeve. Just get out of the doorway so I can close it. Mrs. Peters, across the street, you know. She closed the door. And I want to show you something, she said. You haven't seen it. He was interested. An antique? 
or what? She took his arm, leading him toward the dining room. You'll love it, Bobby. She stopped, wide-eyed. I hope you will. You must love it. It means so much to me. He means so much. He, Bob frowned. Who is he? Doris laughed. You're jealous. Come on. A moment later, they stood before the clock, looking up at it. He'll come out in a few minutes. Wait until you see him. I know you two will get along just fine. What does Larry think of him? They don't like each other. Sometimes when Larry's here, he won't come out. Larry gets mad if he doesn't come out on time. He says, says what? Doris looked down. He always says he's been robbed, even if he did get it wholesale. She brightened, but I know he won't come out because he doesn't like Larry. When I'm here alone, he comes right out for me every 15 minutes, even though he really only has to come out on the hour. She gazed up at the clock. He comes out for me because he wants to. We talk. I tell him things. Of course, I'd like to have him upstairs in my room, but it wouldn't be right. There was the sound of footsteps on the front porch. They looked at each other, horrified. Larry pushed the door open, grunting. He set his briefcase down and took off his hat. Then he saw Bob for the first time. Chambers, I'll be damned. His eyes narrowed. What are you doing here? He came into the dining room. Doris drew her robe about her helplessly, backing away. I, Bob began, this is... We, he broke off, glancing at Doris. Suddenly, the clock began to whir. The cuckoo came rushing out, bursting into sound. Larry moved toward him. Shut that den off, he said, raising his fist toward the clock. The cuckoo snapped into silence and retreated. The door closed. That's better. Larry studied Doris and Bob, standing mutely together. I came over to look at the clock, Bob said. Doris told me that it's a rare antique, and that, nuts. I bought it myself. Larry walked up to him. Get out of here. He turned to Doris. You too, and take that damn clock with you. He paused, rubbing his chin. No, leave the clock here. It's mine. I bought it and paid for it. In the weeks that followed after Doris left, Larry and the cuckoo clock got along even worse than before. For one thing, the cuckoo stayed inside most of the time, sometimes even at 12 o'clock, when he should have been busiest. And if he did come out at all, he usually spoke only once or twice, never the correct number of times, and there was a sullen, uncooperative note in his voice, a jarring sound that made Larry uneasy and a little angry. But he kept the clock wound because the house was very still and quiet, and it got on his nerves not to hear someone running around, talking and dropping things, and even the whirring of a clock sounded Sounded good to him, but he didn't like the cuckoo at all, and sometimes he spoke to him. Listen, he said late one night to the closed little door. I know you can hear me. I ought to give you back to the Germans, back to the Black Forest. He paced back and forth. I wonder what they're doing now, the two of them, that young punk with his books and his antiques. A man shouldn't be interested in antiques. That's for women. He set his jaw. Isn't that right? The clock said nothing. Larry walked up in front of it. Isn't that right? He demanded. Don't you have anything to say? He looked at the face of the clock. It was almost eleven, just a few seconds before the hour. All right, I'll wait until eleven. Then I want to hear what you have to say. You've been pretty quiet the last few weeks since she left. He grinned wryly. Maybe you don't like it here since she's gone. He scowled. Well, I paid for you, and you're coming out whether you like it or not. You hear me? Eleven o'clock came. 
Far off at the end of town, the great tower clock boomed sleepily to itself, but the little door remained shut. Nothing moved. The minute hand passed on, and the cuckoo did not stir. He was someplace inside the clock, beyond the door, silent and remote. All right, if that's the way you feel, Larry murmured, his lips twisting. But it isn't fair. It's your job to come out. We all have to do things we don't like. He went unhappily into the kitchen and opened the great gleaming refrigerator. As he poured himself a drink, he thought about the clock. There was no doubt about it. The cuckoo should come out, Doris or no Doris. He had always liked her from the very start. They had got along well, the two of them. Probably he liked Bob, too. Probably he had seen enough of Bob to get to know him. They would be quite happy together, Bob and Dolores and the cuckoo. Larry finished his drink. He opened the drawer at the sink and took out the hammer. He carried it carefully into the dining room. The clock was ticking gently to itself on the wall. Look, he said, waving the hammer. You know what I have here. You know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to start on you first. He smiled. Birds of a feather. That's what you are, the three of you. The room was silent. Are you coming out, or do I have to come in and get you? The clock whirred a little. I hear you in there. You've got a lot of talking to do. Enough for the last three weeks. As I figure it, you owe me. The door opened. The cuckoo came out fast, straight at him. Larry was looking down, his brow wrinkled in thought. He glanced up, and the cuckoo caught him squarely in the eye. Down he went, hammer and chair and everything, hitting the floor with a tremendous crash. For a moment, the cuckoo paused, its small body poised rigidly. Then it went back inside its house. The door snapped tight shut after it. The man lay on the floor, stretched out grotesquely, his head bent over to one side. Nothing moved or stirred. The room was completely silent, except, of course, for the ticking of the clock. I see, said Doris, her face tight. Bob put his arm around her, steadying her. Doctor, Bob said, can I ask you something? Of course, the doctor said. Is it very easy to break your neck, falling from so low a chair? It wasn't very far to fall. I wonder if it might not have been an accident. Is there any chance it might have been? Suicide, the doctor rubbed his jaw. I never heard of anyone committing suicide that way. It was an accident, I'm positive. I don't mean suicide, Bob murmured under his breath, looking up at the clock on the wall. I meant something else, but no one heard him. End of Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlie Dykeman, Boston, April 2023. The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It's equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that, 
Neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice their imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack, but in the matter of old wines he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today but I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Amontillado, a pipe? Impossible, and in the middle of Carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado, I have my doubts. Amontillado, and I must satisfy them. Amontillado, as you are engaged, and I am on my way to Lucchesi. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he, he will tell me, Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Oh, come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi, oh, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado! You have been imposed upon, and as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a rocolaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and I had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. Oh, it's further on, said I. But I observed the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned toward me, and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Niter? he asked at length. Niter, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me it is no matter. We will go back, you will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draft of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He once again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. 
The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A human foot door and field azure. The foot crushes a certain rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la cecit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by the arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed, the drop of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we'll go back ere it is too late. Your cough... It is nothing, he said. Let us go on, but first, another draught of this medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it out of breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement. A grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? It, impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roquelaire. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the amontillado. Be it so, I said. Replacing the tool beneath my cloak and again offering him my arm, he leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt, in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height seven or six. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of the circumscribing walls with solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the amontillado. As for Lucchesi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other by about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links round his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was much too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall, and you cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low, moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction. 
I seized my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interrupting the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tiers. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of an instant it reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished the portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out of the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed, and an excellent jest. We shall have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo, <laughs> over our wine. The Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado, but is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato, and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes, for the love of God! But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust the torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in reply only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. End of the cask of Amontillado. The Chair by Dr. Harry E. Marinus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chair by Dr. Harry E. Marinus, former physician at Sing Sing Prison. The minute hand on my watch indicates 5.44 a.m. I am standing in a direct line with the chair. My gaze is directed to the left side of the room and down a short, narrow, heavily walled corridor that forms the communication between the condemned cells and the execution chamber. There are a number of guards standing quietly about, and on my right, back of a rope stretched across the room, sit the witnesses. There is a tension in the very air of the chamber. Absolute quiet prevails. A few seconds pass, eternally long they are. Then comes a sound, a muffled goodbye all. The sound reaches the ears of the witnesses, and involuntarily they straighten up on their stools. There is some scuffling of feet, and one witness, possibly a trifle more nervous than the rest, clears his throat. Everyone is now keenly alert. I hear the chant of the priest, the response of the condemned man, the low, quavering, and broken response, Have mercy on me. The little procession now enters the corridor. I see the condemned man, stocking-footed and with his right trouser leg flapping, grimly ludicrous, for it has been slit up to the knee in order to facilitate the application of the leg electrode.
He is between the deputy warden and his assistant, each supporting an arm as they slowly enter the death chamber. At the sight of the fateful and fatal chair, the condemned man involuntarily shrinks back, but the guards are prepared for this, and their hold becomes a little firmer. There is no halt in their step, but five paces away, inanimate, portentous, and ominous, the chair. After the first sight, after that sharp, quivering intake of breath, the gaze of the condemned man shifts about the room. His expression haunts one. You feel that it is both all-seeing and unseeing. The fear of death, a definite emotion, is here portrayed in a fashion that but few have beheld. There is utter finality in that look. His eyes rest upon you. You feel that he sees you, but that you are simply one of the images in the general makeup of the last picture that is conveyed to his brain. There is no recognition in the glance, just a vague, hopeless, and apparently vacant stare, but one which you feel discerns the sharp outlines of the persons and objects in the room, without recognizing features or details. To me, that quick survey of his surroundings, that final glance of the unfortunate being on the very threshold of his meeting with his god is the most harrowing of all the gruesome details connected with the administration of man-made law's decree. My watch indicates 5.45 a.m. The condemned man is seated in the chair. The guards work quickly, two at either side, and one at the head of the chair. The arm straps are buckled fast, the leg straps next, then the face strap, which has an opening for the chin and the upper part of which mercifully blindfolds the eyes. The cap, a soft, pliable thing made of a fine copper mesh and lined with sponge, which has been moistened in salt water, is placed upon the head and molded to fit its contour. To a binding post on the cap is adjusted the heavy wire that conveys the terrific current from the dynamo in a distant part of the prison. To the bare right leg, another electrode is applied. A full minute has elapsed since I heard the goodbye all. The guards have completed their task. My notes now read, entered 544-10. Chair and strapped 545. Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, have mercy on me, chants the priest, and have mercy on me comes the broken, almost inaudible, and inarticulate response. I retain my position, notebook, and watch in my left hand. I am standing on the right side of, and in the same direct line with the chair. The chair and its occupant, the electrician and myself, form a right angle. I occupy the angle, for at the ends of the lines which make up that angle are the two things that demand my undivided attention, the electrician and the condemned. From my point of vantage, I can see both. My eyes are on the condemned man. I feel the eyes of the electrician upon me. I have a new bright yellow pencil, freshly sharpened. It is quite necessary for my notes. I hold it vertically on my notebook and watch the occupant of the chair. The overwhelming mental tension, coupled with the knowledge of the proximity of death, has a fearsome reaction upon the chair's victim. With each rapid inspiration, there is a slight elevation of the shoulders, and as expiration takes place, the shoulders sag. This is the very instant I have awaited. The lungs are practically free from air. I drop my pencil quickly from the vertical toward the horizontal. There is a sudden click. The body in the chair straightens, and from the mouth comes a low, sibilant hiss. The straps creak, and you feel that if the straps should break, the body would be catapulted over the rope and amidst the witnesses. For ten seconds, the high current of 1850 volts and 8 to 9 amperes is on. Then, for 40 seconds, the voltage is dropped to 200. 
During this period, the body sags perceptibly. At the end of 40 seconds, the current is again increased, and the body again straightens and strains against the straps. After the final 10 seconds of the fatal minute, the current is switched off. The body in the chair actually shrinks before your very eyes. I step up to the chair. A guard tears open the shirt and bares the chest. As I place my stethoscope over the heart, I am conscious that the body is intensely hot. I know from experience that the heat generated by the rapidity of the passage of the current has raised the temperature from subnormal to between 120 and 130 degrees. I hear a racing, tumultuous rat-a-tat-tat. Possibly, I can count the heartbeats. I lift the face strap and with thumb and forefinger separate the lids. The eyes are glazed, but the pupils are small. I feel the great arteries in the neck. I continue to get a pulsation that tells me that the vital forces have not yet ceased. My notes now read, first contact, one minute, 545.10 to 546.10. I step off the rubber mat and nod to the electrician. The current is again thrown on, this time for five seconds. When I now listen over the heart, I am reminded of a clock that is running down. The heartbeats are fainter. They become slower. They commence to skip. I fail to feel the pulsation in the neck. There is a heavier glaze over the eyes. The pupils, small and contracted a moment before, are now widely dilated. The head rests on the shoulders, and the face is directed toward the chandelier with its many lights. But there is no reaction of the pupil. As the bright light strikes the eye, it remains wide and big. The muscles of the face are set, and saliva drools from the angles of the mouth. I again place my stethoscope upon the chest, but no sound reaches my ear. I listen for five, for ten, for twenty seconds. There is nothing. All the vital reactions have disappeared. Physicians among the witnesses are invited to listen. They take their time, for there is no reason to hurry now. After the last one finishes, I make a final examination. It is as before, nothing. My notes now state, second contact, five seconds, 547 pronounced dead at 5.52. I turn toward the warden and say, I pronounce this man dead. The law has been obeyed. The general attitude of tenseness is relieved. The guards quickly unbuckle the straps and carry the body to the autopsy room, and after placing it upon the stone-topped table, begin to remove the clothes. The hum of conversation becomes general. The witnesses are departing. I commence the autopsy, feeling that my report will be autopsy upon the body of number convicted of murder, first degree, and today executed at this prison showed all organs and tissues to be normal. As I begin my long sweeping incision, the thought always strikes me. This must also be done because it is the law. And the invariable question comes, is it really the law, or is it to ensure the carrying out of the law? In other words, if the chair fails, the post-mortem succeeds. There is little left to tell. The evening papers will state that so-and-so, convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death, was electrocuted at Sing Sing Prison early this morning. They will rehearse the gruesome history of the crime and will tell how the murderer, with firm step, entered the execution chamber at 5.44.10 a.m. and was strapped in the chair at 5.45 a.m. These details are quite correct. I can vouch for them, for I let the reporters take my notes, which are official, and they copy the data and embody it in their stories. They invariably dress up the first contact, however, so their stories read about like this. At 5.45.10, 
Warden Blank threw the switch, pressed the button, or dropped his handkerchief as a signal. It is always one of these three. Well, I'm rather glad that they credit it to the Warden. And I really feel better that I and my new bright yellow pencil, freshly sharpened, have been overlooked. End of The Chair by Dr. Harry E. Marinus Read by D. Searles The City of Blood From Dreams and Dream Stories by Anna Kingsford this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I dreamed that I was wandering along a narrow street of vast length, upon either hand of which was an unbroken line of high straight houses, their walls and doors resembling those of a prison. The atmosphere was dense and obscure, and the time seemed that of twilight, in the narrow line of sky visible far overhead between the two rows of house roofs, I could not discern sun, moon or stars, or colour of any kind. All was grey, impenetrable and dim. Underfoot, between the paving stones of the street, grass was springing. Nowhere was the least sign of life. The place seemed utterly deserted. I stood alone in the midst of profound silence and desolation. Silence, no, as I listened, there came to my ears from all sides, dully at first and almost imperceptibly, a low, creeping sound like subdued moaning, a sound that never ceased, and that was so native to the place, I had at first been unaware of it. But now I clearly gathered in the sound and recognized it as expressive of intensest physical suffering. Looking steadfastly towards one of the houses from which the most distinct of these sounds issued, I perceived a stream of blood slowly oozing out from beneath the door and trickling down into the street, staining the tufts of grass red here and there as it wound its way towards me. I glanced up and saw that the glass in the closed and barred windows of the house was flecked and splashed with the same horrible dye. Someone has been murdered in this place, I cried, and flew towards the door. Then, for the first time, I perceived that the door had neither lock nor handle on the outside, but could be opened only from within. It had, indeed, the form and appearance of a door, but in every other respect it was solid and impassable as the walls themselves. In vain I searched for bell or knocker, or for some means of making entry into the house. I found only a scroll fastened with nails upon a crossbeam over the door, and upon it read the words, This is the laboratory of a vivisector. As I read... The wailing sound redoubled in intensity, and the noise as of struggling made itself audible within, as though some new victim had been added to the first. I bet madly against the door with my hands and shrieked for help, but in vain. My dress was reddened with the blood upon the doorstep. In horror I looked down upon it, then turned and fled. As I passed along the street, the sounds around me grew and gathered volume, formulating themselves into distinct cries and bursts of frenzied sobbing. Upon the door of every house some scroll was attached, similar to that I had already seen. Upon one was inscribed, Here is a husband murdering his wife. Upon another, Here is a mother beating her child to death. Upon a third, this is a slaughter house. Every door was impassable, every window was barred. The idea of interference from without was futile. Vainly I lifted my voice and cried for aid. The street was desolate as a graveyard. The only thing that moved about me was the stealthy blood that came creeping out from beneath the doors of these awful dwellings. Wild with horror, I fled along the street, seeking some outlet, the cries and moans pursuing me as I ran. 
At length the street abruptly ended in a high dead wall, the top of which was not discernible. It seemed indeed to be limitless in height. Upon this wall was written in great black letters, There is no way out. Overwhelmed with despair and anguish, I fell upon the stones of the street, repeating aloud, There is no way out. Hinton, January 1877 End of the City of Blood Recording by Claudia Caldi The Closing Hand by Farnsworth Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Closing Hand by Farnsworth Wright Solitary and forbidding, the house stared, specter-like, through scraggly trees that seemed to shrink from its touch. The green moss of decay lay on its dank roofs, and the windows, set in deep cavities, peered blindly at the world as if through eyeless sockets. So forbidding was its aspect that boys, on approaching its cheerless gables, stopped their whistling and passed on the opposite side of the street. Across the fields, a few huddled cottages gazed through the falling rain, as if wondering what family could be so bold as to take up its abode within the gloomy walls of that old mansion, whose carpetless floors for two years had not felt the tread of human feet. In an attic room of the house, two sisters lay in bed, but not asleep. The younger sister cringed under the dread, inspired by the bleak place. The elder laughed at her childish fears, but the younger felt the spell of the old building and was afraid. I suppose there is really nothing to frighten me in this dreary old house, she admitted without conviction in her voice. But the very feel of the place is horrible. Mother shouldn't have left us alone in this gruesome place. Stupid, her sister scolded. With all the silverware downstairs, somebody has to be here for fear of burglars. Oh, don't talk about burglars, pleaded the younger girl. I am afraid. I keep imagining I hear ghostly footsteps. Her sister laughed. Go to sleep, Goosey, she said. Haunted houses are nothing but superstition. They exist only in imagination. Why has nobody lived here for two years then? They tell me that for five years every family moved out after being here just a short time. The whole atmosphere of the house is ghastly, and I can't forget how the older Burkheim girl was found stabbed to death in her bed, and nobody ever knew how it happened, why she may have been murdered in this very room. Go to sleep and don't scare yourself with such silly talk. Mother will be with us tomorrow night, and Dad will be back the next day. Now go to sleep. The elder sister soon dropped into slumber, but the younger lay open-eyed, staring into the black room and shuddering at every stifled scream of the wind or distant growl of thunder. She began to count, hoping to hypnotize herself into drowsiness, but at every slight noise she started and lost her count. Suddenly, she turned and shook her sister by the shoulder. Edith, somebody is prowling around downstairs, she whispered. Listen, oh, what shall we do? The elder sister struck a match and lit the candle. Then she slipped on her dressing gown and drew on her slippers. You're not going down there, Edith. Tell me you're not going downstairs. It might be that murdered Bergheim girl. Edith, don't. Edith shot a glance of withering scorn at her sister, who lay on the bed with blanched face and wide, terrified eyes. There is something moving around downstairs, and I'm going to find out what it is, she said.
taking the candle, she left the room. Her younger sister lay in the darkness, listening to the pattering of rain on the roof and straining her ears to catch the slightest sound. The noise downstairs ceased, but the wind rose, and the rain beat upon the roof in sudden furious blasts that made her heart jump wildly. Ten minutes passed, twenty minutes, and Edith had not returned. A door slammed, and the younger sister thought she heard something moving again, but the wind began to sob and drowned out all other noises. Between gusts, she heard the portentous sound, and each time it seemed nearer. Then she started as she realized that something was coming up the stairs. Once she thought she heard a cry to which the wind joined its plaintive voice in a weird duet. Nearer and nearer the strange noise came. It mounted the stairs step by step. Heard only when the wind and rain softened their voices. It passed the first landing and moved slowly up the second flight while the girl fearfully awaited its coming. The wind howled until the house quaked. It shrilled past the eaves and fled across the fields like a hunted ghost. And now the girl's pounding pulses drowned out the screaming of the wind, for the presence had invaded her bedroom. She cowered under the covers, a cold perspiration chilling her body until her teeth chattered. Her imagination conjured up frightful things, a disembodied spirit come to destroy her, a corpse from the grave gibbering in terror because it could not tear the cerements from its face. The murdered Burkheim girl with a knife still sheathed in her heart, or some escaped beast licking its lips in greedy anticipation of the feast her tremulous body would provide. Or was it a murderer who, having killed her sister, was now bent on completing his bloody work? A flash of lightning split the sky, and the thunder bellowed its terrifying warning. The girl threw back the bedclothes and shrank to the wall, her eyes starting from their sockets, fearful lest another flash reveal some sight too ghastly to contemplate. Slowly, the being dragged itself across the floor, lifted itself onto the bed, and uttered a choking sound of agony. The girl sat petrified. Then, timorously, she extended a shaky hand, but quickly withdrew it in dread of some hideous contact. Again, she thrust her trembling hand into the gloom farther farther until it touched something shaggy and wet. A clammy hand closed over hers and she started to her feet with a horrified scream. The icy hand tightened with a sickening tremor and dragged her down. Then her tortured senses gave way and she fell back unconscious upon the bed. When she awoke it was day. Beside her, on the bed, lay the bleeding body of her sister, Edith, stabbed in the breast by the burglar she had tried to frighten away. The younger sister was clutching the clotted wisps of hair that had fallen across the breast of her sister, whose cold hand had closed over hers in the last convulsive shudder of death. End of The Closing Hand by Farnsworth Wright Read by D. Searles The Curse of Yig by Zelia Brown Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Yoganand. The Curse of Yig by Zelia Brown Reed. In 1925, I went into Oklahoma looking for snake law, and I came out with a fear of snakes that will last me the rest of my life. I admit it is foolish, since there are natural explanations for everything I saw and heard, but it masters me nonetheless. If the old story had been all there was to it, 
I would not have been so badly shaken. My work as an American Indian ethnologist has hardened me to all kinds of extravagant legendary and I know that simple white people can beat the Redskins at their own game when it comes to fanciful inventions. But I can't forget what I saw with my own eyes at the insane asylum in Guthrie. I called it the asylum because a few of the oldest settlers told me I would find something important there. Neither Indians nor white men would discuss the snake god legends I had come to trace. The oil boom newcomers, of course, knew nothing of such matters, and the red men and old pioneers were plainly frightened when I spoke to them. Not more than six or seven people mentioned the asylum, and those who did were careful to talk in whispers. But the whisperers said that Dr. McNeil could show me a very terrible relic and tell me all I wanted to know. He could explain why Yig, the half-human father of serpents, is a shunned and feared object in central Oklahoma, and why old settlers shiver at the secret Indian orgies which make the autumn days and nights hideous with the ceaseless beating of tom-toms in lonely places. It was with the scent of a hound on the trail that I went to Guthrie, for I had spent many years collecting data on the evolution of serpent worship among the Indians. I had always felt from well-defined undertones of legend and archaeology that great Quetzalcoatl, benign snake god of the Mexicans, had had an older and darker prototype. And during recent months, I had well-nigh proved it in a series of researches stretching from Guatemala to the Oklahoma Plains. But everything was tantalizing and incomplete, for above the border, the cult of the snake was hedged about by fear and furtiveness. Now it appeared that a new and copious source of data was about to dawn, and I sought the head of the asylum with an eagerness I did not try to cloak. Dr. McNeil was a small, clean-shaven man of somewhat advanced years, and I saw at once from his speech and manner that he was a scholar of no mean attainments in many branches outside his profession. Grave and doubtful when I first made known my errand, his face grew thoughtful as he carefully scanned my credentials and the letter of introduction which a kindly old ex-Indian agent had given me. So you have been studying the Yig legend, eh? He reflected sententiously. I know that many of our Oklahoma ethnologists have tried to connect it with Quetzalcoatl, but I don't think any of them have traced the intermediate steps so well. You have done remarkable work for a man as young as you seem to be, and you certainly deserve all the data we can give. I don't suppose old Major Moore or any of the others told you what it is I have here? They don't like to talk about it, and neither do I. It is very tragic and very horrible, but that's all. I refuse to consider it anything supernatural. There's a story about it that I'll tell you, after you see it. A devilish sad story, but one that I won't call magic. It merely shows the potency that belief has over some people. I'll admit there are times when I feel a shiver that's more than physical, but in daylight, I set all that down to nerves. I'm not a young fellow anymore, alas. To come to the point, the thing I have is what you might call a victim of Yik's curse, a physically living victim. We don't let the bulk of the nurses see it, although most of them know it is here. There are just two steady old chaps whom I let feed it and clean out its quarters. It used to be three, but good old Stevens passed on a few years ago. I suppose he'll have to break in a new group pretty soon. For the thing doesn't seem to age or change much, and we old boys can't last forever. Maybe the ethics of the near future will let us give it a merciful release, but it's hard to tell. Did you see that single ground glass basement window over in the east wing when you came up the drive? That's where it is. I'll take you there myself. You needn't make any comment. Just look through the movable panel in the door and thank God the light isn't any stronger. Then I'll tell you the story, or as much as I've been able to piece together. We walked downstairs very quietly and did not talk as we threaded the corridors of the seemingly deserted basement. Dr. McNeil unlocked a grey painted steel door, but it was only a bulkhead leading to a further stretch of hallway. At length, he paused before a door marked B116 opened a small observation panel which he could use only by standing on tiptoe and pounded several times upon the painted metal as if to arouse the occupant, whatever it might be. A faint stench came from the aperture as the doctor unclosed it and I fancied his pounding elicited a kind of low hissing response. Finally, he motioned me to replace him at the peephole and I did so with a costless and increasing tremor. The barred ground glass window 
close to the earth outside admitted only a feeble and uncertain pallor and i had to look into the malodorous den for several seconds before i could see what was crawling and wriggling about on the straw covered floor emitting every now and then a weak and vacuous hiss then the shadowed outlines began to take shape and i perceived that the squirming entity bore some remote resemblance to a human form laid flat on its belly i clutched at the door handle for support as i tried to keep from fainting the moving object was almost of human size and entirely devoid of clothing it was absolutely hairless and its tawny looking back seemed subtly squamous in the dim cowlish light around the shoulders it was rather speckled and brownish and the head was very curiously flat as it looked up to hiss at me i saw that the beady little black eyes were damnably anthropoid but i could not bear to study them long they fastened themselves on me with a horrible persistence so that i closed the panel gaspingly and left the creature to wriggle about unseen in its matted straw and spectral twilight i must have reeled a bit for i saw that the doctor was gently holding my arm as he guided me away i was stuttering over and over again but but for god's sake what is it dr macneil told me the story in his private office as he sprawled opposite him in an easy chair the gold and crimson of late afternoon changed to the violet of early dusk but still i sat awed and motionless i resented every ring of the telephone and every whir of the buzzer and i could have cursed the nurses and interns whose knocks no one then summoned the doctor briefly to the outer office night came and i was glad my house switched on all the lights scientist though i was my zeal for research was half forgotten amid such breathless ecstasies of fright as a small boy might feel when whispered witch tales go the rounds of the chimney corner it seems that yig the snake god of the central plains tribes presumably the primal source of the more southerly quetzalcoatl or quetzalcan was an odd half anthropomorphic devil of highly arbitrary and capricious nature he was not wholly evil and was usually quite well disposed toward those who gave proper respect to him and his children the serpents but in the autumn he became abnormally ravenous and had to be driven away by means of suitable rites this was why the tom toms in the pawnee wichita and caddo country pounded ceaselessly week in and week out in august september and october and why the medicine men made strange noises with rattles and whistles curiously like those of the aztecs and mayas yik's chief trait was a relentless devotion to his children a devotion so great that the redskins almost feared to protect themselves from the venomous rattlesnakes which thronged the region frightful clandestine tales hinted of his vengeance upon mortals who floated him or wreaked harm upon his wriggling progeny his chosen method being to turn his victim after suitable tortures to a spotted snake in the old days of the indian territory the doctor went on there was not quite so much secrecy about yig the plain stripes less cautious than the desert nomads and pueblos talked quite freely of the legends and autumn ceremonies with the first indian agents and let considerable of the law spread out through the neighboring regions of white settlement the great fear came in the land rush days of 89 when some extraordinary incidents had been rumored and the rumors sustained by what seemed to be hideously tangible proofs indian said that the new white men did not know how to get on with yig and afterward the settlers came to take the theory at face value now no old timer in middle oklahoma white or red could be induced to breathe a word about the snake god except in vague hints yet after all the doctor added with the most needless emphasis the only truly authenticated horror had been a thing of pitiful tragedy rather than of bewitchment it was all very material and cruel even that last phase which had caused so much dispute Dr. McNeil paused and cleared his throat before getting down to a special story, and I felt a tingling sensation as when a theatre curtain rises. The thing had begun when Walker Davis and his wife Audrey left Arkansas to settle in the newly opened public lands in the spring of 1889, and the end had come in the country of the Wichitas, north of the Washita River, in what is at present Caddo County. There is a small village called Binger there now, and the railway goes through, but otherwise the place is less changed than other parts of Oklahoma. there is still a section of farms and ranches quite productive in these days since the great oil fields do not come very close walker and audrey had come from franklin county in the ozarks with a canvas topped wagon two mules an ancient and useless dog called wolf and all their household goods 
They were typical hill folk, youngish and perhaps a little more ambitious than most, and looked forward to a life of better returns by the hard work than they had in Arkansas. Both were lean, raw-boned specimens, the man tall, sandy and grey-eyed, and the woman short and rather dark, with a black straightness of her hair suggesting a slight Indian admixture. In general, there was very little of distinction about them, and but for one thing, their annals might not have differed from those of thousands of other pioneers who flocked into the new country at that time. That thing was Walker's almost epileptic fear of snakes, which some laid to prenatal causes, and some said came from a dark prophecy about his end with which an old Indian squaw had tried to scare him when he was small. Whatever the cause, the effect was marked indeed, for despite his strong, gentle courage, the very mention of a snake would cause him to grow faint and pale, while the sight of even a tiny specimen would produce a shock sometimes bordering on a convulsion seizure. The Davises started out early in the year in the hope of being on their new land for the spring ploughing. Travel was slow, for the roads were bad in Arkansas, while in the territory there were great stretches of rolling hills and red sandy barrens without any roads whatever. As the terrain grew flatter, the change from the native mountains depressed them more, perhaps, than they realized. But they found the people at the Indian agencies very affable, while most of the settled Indians seemed friendly and civil. Now and then they encountered a fellow pioneer, with whom crude pleasantries and expressions of amiable rivalry were generally exchanged. Owing to the season, there were not many snakes in evidence, so Walker did not suffer from a special temperamental weakness. In the earlier stages of the journey, too, there were no Indian snake legends to trouble him, for the transplanted tribes from the southeast do not share the wilder beliefs of their western neighbors. As fate would have it, it was a white man at Okmulgee in the Creek country who gave the Davises the first hint of the Yig beliefs, a hint which had curiously fascinating effect on Walker, and caused him to ask questions very freely after that. Before long, Walker's fascination had developed into a bad case of fright. He took the most extraordinary precautions at each of the nightly camps, always clearing away water vegetation he found and avoiding stony places wherever he could. Every clump of stunted bushes and every cleft in the great slab-like rocks seemed to him now to hide malevolent serpents, while every human figure, not obviously part of a settlement or emigrant train, seemed to him a potential snake god, till nearness had proved the contrary. Fortunately, no troublesome encounters came at this stage to shake his nerves still further. As they approached the Kikapu country, they found it harder and harder to avoid camping near rocks. Finally, it was no longer possible, and poor Walker was reduced to the puerile expedient of droning some of the rustic anti-snake charms he had learned in his boyhood. Two or three times a snake was really glimpsed, and these sights did not help the sufferer in his efforts to preserve composure. On the 22nd evening of the journey, a savage wind made it imperative, for the sake of the mules, to camp in as sheltered a spot as possible and Audrey persuaded her husband to take advantage of a cliff which rose uncommonly high above the dry bed of a former tributary of the Canadian River. He did not like the rocky cast of the place, but allowed himself to be overruled this once. Leading the animals sullenly toward the protecting slope, which the nature of the ground would not allow the wagon to approach. Audrey, examining the rocks near the wagon, meanwhile noticed a singular sniffing on the part of the feeble old dog. Seizing a rifle, she followed his lead, and presently thanked the stars that she had forestalled Walker in her discovery. For there, snugly nested in the gap between two boulders, was a sight it would have done him no good to see. Visible only as one convoluted expanse, but perhaps comprising as many as three or four separate units, was a mass of lacy wriggling which could not be other than a brood of newborn rattlesnake. Anxious to save Walker from a trying shock, Audrey did not hesitate to act, but took the gun firmly by the barrel and brought the butt down again and again upon the writhing objects. Her own sense of loathing was great, but it did not amount to a real fear. Finally, she saw that her task was done, and turned to cleanse the improvised bludgeon in the red sand and dry, dead grass nearby. She must, she reflected, cover the nest up before Walker got back from tethering the mules. Old wolf, tottering relic of mixed shepherd and coyote ancestry that he was, had vanished, and she feared he had gone to fetch his master. Footsteps at that instant proved a fear well founded. A second more, and Walker had seen everything. Audrey made a move to catch him if he should faint, but he did no more than sway. 
Then the look of pure fright on his bloodless face turned slowly to something like mingled awe and anger, and he began to upbraid his wife in trembling tones. God's sake, Odd, but why do you go for to do that? And you heard all the things they have been telling about the snake devil Yig? You'd ought to have told me, and we'd have moved on. Don't you know there's a devil god what gets even if you hurts his children? What for you do you think the Injuns all dances and beats their drums in the fall about? This lands under a curse, I tell you. Nigh every soul we ever talked to since we came in said the same. Yig rules here, and he comes out every fall for to get his victims and turn them into snakes. Why, or oh, they won't none of them Injuns across the canyon kill a snake for love nor money. God knows what you have done to yourself, girl, a stomping out a hull brood of Yig's children. You'll get your show sooner or later, unless I can buy a charm of in some of the Indian medicine men. He'll get you. He'll get you, Ord. I sure there's a god in heaven. He'll come out of the night and turn you into a crawling spotted snake. All the rest of the journey, Walker kept up the frightened reproofs and prophecies. They crossed the Canadian near Newcastle, and soon afterward met with the first of the real Plains Indians they had seen, a party of blanketed Wichita's whose leader talked freely under the spell of the whiskey offered him and taught poor Walker a long-winded protective charm against Yig in exchange for a quart bottle of the same inspiring fluid. By the end of the week, the chosen site in the Wichita country was reached and the Davises made haste to trace their boundaries and perform the spring plowing before even beginning the construction of a cabin. The region was flat, drearily windy and sparse of natural vegetation that promised great fertility under cultivation. Occasional outcroppings of granite diversified a soil of decomposed red sandstone, and here and there a great flat rock would stretch along the surface of the ground like a man-made floor. There seemed to be very few snakes, a possible dens for them, so Audrey at last persuaded Walker to build the one-room cabin over a vast, smooth slab of exposed stone. With such a flooring, and with a good-sized fireplace, the wettest weather might be defied, though it soon became evident that dampness was no salient quality of the district. Logs were hauled in the wagon from the nearest belt of woods many miles toward the Wichita mountains. Walker built his white chimneyed cabin in crude barn with the aid of some of the other settlers, though the nearest one was over a mile away. In turn, he helped his helpers at similar house racings, so that many ties of friendship sprang up between the new neighbors. There was no town worthy the name nearer than El Reno, on the railway thirty miles or more to the northeast and before many weeks had passed, the people of the section had become very cohesive despite the wideness of the scattering. The Indians, a few of them had begun to settle down on branches, were for the most part harmless, though somewhat quarrelsome when fired by the liquid stimulation which found its way to them despite all government bans. Of all the neighbours, the Davises found Joe and Sally Compton, who likewise hailed from Arkansas, the most helpful and congenial. Sally is still alive, known now as Grandma Compton and his son Clyde, then an infant in arms, has become one of the leading men of the state. Sally and Audrey used to visit each other often, for their cabins were only two miles apart, and in the long spring and summer afternoons they exchanged many a tale of old Arkansas and many a rumour about the new country. Sally was very sympathetic about Walker's weakness regarding snakes, but perhaps did more to aggravate than cure the parallel nervousness which Audrey was acquiring through his incessant praying and prophesying about the curse of Yig. She was uncommonly full of gruesome snake stories, and produced a direfully strong impression with her acknowledged masterpiece, the tale of a man in Scott County who had been bitten by a whole horde of rattlers at once and had swelled so monstrously from poison that his body had finally burst with a pop. Needless to say, Audrey did not repeat this anecdote to her husband, and she implored the Comptons to beware of starting it on the rounds of the countryside. It is to Joe's and Sally's credit that they heeded this plea with the utmost fidelity. Walker did his corn planting early, and in midsummer improved his time by harvesting a fair crop of the native grass of the region. With the help of Joe Compton, he dug a well which gave a moderate supply of very good water, though he planned to sink an artesian later on. He did not run into many serious snake scares, and made his land as inhospitable as possible for wriggling visitors. Every now and then he rode over to the cluster of thatched conical huts which formed the main village of the Wichita's and talked long with the old men and shamans about the snake god and how to nullify his wrath. Charms were always ready in exchange for whiskey, but much of the information he got was far from reassuring. Yig was a great god. He was bad medicine, 
he did not forget things. In the autumn, his children were hungry and wild, and Yig was hungry and wild too. All the tribes made medicine against Yig when the corn harvest came. They gave him some corn and danced in proper regalia to the sound of whistle, rattle and drum. They kept the drums pounding to drive Yig away and called down the aid of Tirawa, whose children men are, even as the snakes are Yig's children. It was bad that the squaw of Davis killed the children of Yig. Let Davis say the charms many times when the corn harvest comes. Yig is Yig. Yig is a great god. By the time the corn harvest did come, Walker had succeeded in getting his wife into a deplorably jumpy state. His prayers and borrowed incantations came to be a nuisance. And when the autumn rites of the Indians began, there was always a distant wind-borne pounding of tom-toms to lend an added background of the sinister. It was maddening to have the muffled clatter always stealing over the wide red plains. Why would it never stop? Day and night, week on week, it was always going in exhaustless relays, as persistently as the red dusty winds that carried it. Audrey loathed it more than her husband did, for he saw in it a compensating element of protection. It was a sense of a mighty, intangible bulwark against evil that he got in his corn crop and prepared cabin and stable for the coming winter. The autumn was abnormally warm, and except for the primitive cookery, the Davises found scant use for the stone fireplace Walker had built with such care. Something in the unnaturalness of the hot dust clouds preyed on the nerves of all the settlers, but most of all on Audrey's and Walker's. The notions of a hovering snake curse and the weird, endless rhythm of the distant Indian drums formed a bad combination which any added element of the bizarre went far to render utterly unendurable. Notwithstanding this strain, several festive gatherings were held at one or another of the cabins after the crops were reaped, keeping naively alive in modernity those curious rites of the harvest home which are as old as human agriculture itself. Lafayette Smith who came from southern Missouri and had a cabin about three miles east of Walker's, was a very passable fiddler, and his tunes did much to make the celebrants forget the monotonous beating of the distant tom-toms. Then Halloween drew near, and the settlers planned another frolic, this time, had they but known it, of a lineage older than even agriculture. The dread witch sabbath of the primal pre aryans kept alive through ages in the midnight blackness of secret woods, and still hinting at vague terrors under its later-day mask of comedy and lightness. Halloween's was to fall on a Thursday, and the neighbours agreed to gather for their first revel at the Davis cabin. It was on that 31st of October that the warm spell broke. The morning was grey and leaden, and by noon the incessant winds had changed from searingness to rawness. People shivered all the more because they were not prepared for the chill, and Walker Davis's old dog, Wolf, dragged himself wearily indoors to a place beside the hearth. But the distant drums still thumped on, nor were the white citizenry less inclined to pursue their chosen rites. As early as four in the afternoon, the wagons began to arrive at Walker's cabin, and in the evening, after a memorable barbecue, Lafayette Smith's fiddle inspired a very fair-sized company to great feats of saltatory grotesqueness in the one good-sized but crowded room. The younger folk indulged in the amiable inanities proper to the season and now and then old wolf would howl with doleful and spine-tickling ominousness at some especial spectral strain from Lafayette's squeaky violin, a device he had never heard before. Mostly, though, the spattered veteran slept through the merriment, for he was past the age of active interests and lived largely in his dreams. Tom and Jeanne Rigby had brought their colleague Zeke along, but the canines did not fraternize. Zeke seemed strangely uneasy over something and nosed around curiously all the evening. Audrey and Walker made a fine couple on the floor, and Grandma Compton still likes to recall her impression of their dancing that night. Their worries seemed forgotten for the nuns, and Walker was shaved and trimmed into a surprising degree of spruceness. By ten o'clock, all hands were healthy tired, and the guests began to depart family by family with many handshakings and bluff assurances of what a fine time everybody had had. Tom and Jenny thought Zeke's eerie halls as he followed them to the wagon where marks of regret at having to go home, though Audrey said it must be the faraway tom-toms which annoyed him, for the distant thumping was surely ghastly enough after the merriment with him. The night was bitterly cold, and for the first time, Walker put a great log in the fireplace and banked it with the ashes to keep it smouldering till morning. 
old wolf dragged himself within the ruddy glow and lapsed into his customary coma. Audrey and Walker, too tired to think of charms or curses, tumbled into the rough pine bed and were asleep before the cheap alarm clock on the mantel had ticked out three minutes. And from far away, the rhythmic pounding of those hellish tom-toms still pulsed on the chill night wind. Dr. McNeil paused here and removed his glasses, as if a blurring of the objective world might make the reminiscent vision clearer. You will soon appreciate, he said, that I had a great deal of difficulty in piecing out all that happened after the guests left. There were times, though, at first, when I was able to make a try at it. After a moment of silence, he went on with the tale. Audrey had terrible dreams of Yig, who appeared to her in the guise of Satan, as depicted in cheap engravings she had seen. It was indeed from an absolute ecstasy of nightmare that she started suddenly awake to find Walker already conscious and sitting up in bed. He seemed to be listening intently to something, and silenced her with a whisper when she began to ask what had roused him. Hark out, he breathed. Don't you hear something singing and buzzing and rustling? Do you reckon it's a fall crickets? Certainly there was distinctly audible within the cabin such a sound as he had described. Audrey tried to analyse it, and was impressed with some element at once horrible and familiar which hovered just outside the rim of her memory. And beyond it all, waking a hideous thought, the monotonous beating of the distant tom-toms came incessantly across the black plains on which a cloudy half-moon had set. Walker, suppose it's the, the curse of Yig? She could feel him tremble. No, girl, I don't reckon he comes that away. He's shaped like a man, except you look at him closed. That's what Chief Grey Eagle says. This year is some vomits coming out in the cold, not crickets, I calculate, but some out like them. I ought to get up and stomp him out afore makes much headway or get at the kibble. He rose, felt for the lantern that hung with an easy reach, and rattled the tin matchbox nailed to the wall beside it. Audrey sat up in bed and watched the flare of the match grow into the steady glow of the lantern. Then, as the eyes began to take in the whole of the room, the crude rafters shook with the frenzy of their simultaneous shriek. For the flat, rocky floor revealed in newborn illumination was one seething, brown-speckled mass of wriggling rattlesnakes slithering toward the fire and even now turning the loathsome heads to menace the fright-blasted lantern-bearer. It was only for an instant that Audrey saw the things. The reptiles were of every size, of unaccountable numbers, and apparently of several varieties, and even as she looked, two or three of them reared their heads as if to strike at Walker. She did not faint. It was Walker's crash to the floor that extinguished her lantern and plunged her into blackness. He had not screamed a second time. Fright had paralyzed him, and he fell as if shot by a silent arrow from no mortal spell. To Audrey, the entire world seemed to whirl about fantastically, mingling with the nightmare from which she had started. Voluntary motion of any sort was impossible, for will and the sense of reality had left her. She fell back inertly on a pillow, hoping that she would wake soon. No actual sense of what had happened penetrated her mind for some time. Then, little by little, the suspicion that she was really awake began to dawn on her, and she was convulsed with a mounting blend of panic and grief which made her long to shriek out despite the inhibiting spell which kept her mute. Walker was gone, and she had not been able to help him. He had died of snakes, just as the old witch woman had predicted when he was a little boy. Poor Wolf had not been able to help either, probably had not even awaked from his senile stupor. And now the crawling things must be coming for her, writhing closer and closer every moment in the dark, perhaps even now twining slipperily about the bedpost and oozing up over the coats, woolen blankets. Unconsciously, she crept under the clothes and trembled. It must be the curse of Yig. He had sent his monster children on All Hallows' Night, and they had taken Walker first. Why was that? Wasn't he innocent enough? Why not come straight for her? Hadn't she killed those little rattlers alone? Then she thought of the curse's form as told by the Indians. She wouldn't be killed, just turned on to a spotted snake. Ah! <sighs> so she would be like those things she had glimpsed on the floor, those things which Yig had sent to get her and enroll her among their number. She tried to mumble a charm that Walker had taught her, but found she could not utter a single sound. The noisy ticking of the alarm clock sounded above the maddening beat of the distant tom-toms. 
The snakes were taking a long time. Did they mean to delay on purpose to play on her nerves? Every now and then, she thought she felt a stealthy, insidious pressure on the bedclothes, but each time it turned out to be only the automatic twitchings of her overwrought nerves. The clock ticked on in the dark, and a change came slowly over her thoughts. Those snakes couldn't have taken so long. They couldn't be Yik's messengers after all, but just natural rattlers that were nested below the rock and had been drawn there by the fire. They weren't coming for her, perhaps. Perhaps they had sated themselves on poor Walker. Where were they now? Gone? Coiled by the fire? Still crawling over the prone corpse of their victim? The clock ticked, and the distant drums throbbed on. At the thought of her husband's body lying there in the pitched blackness, a thrill of purely physical horror passed over Audrey. That story of Sally Compton's about the man back in Scott County, he too had been bitten by a whole bunch of rattlesnakes, and what had happened to him? The poison had rotted the flesh and swelled the whole corpse, and in the end the bloated thing had burst horribly, burst horribly with a detestable popping noise. Was that what was happening to Walker down there on the rock floor? Instinctively, she felt that she had begun to listen for something too terrible even to name to herself. The clock ticked on, keeping a kind of mocking, sardonic time with the far-off drumming that the night wind brought. She wished it were a striking clock, so that she could know how long this eldritch vigil must last. She cursed the toughness of fibre that had kept her from fainting, and wondered what sort of relief the dawn could bring, after all. Probably neighbours would pass. No doubt somebody would call. Would they find her still sane? Was she still sane now? Morbidly listening, Audrey all at once became aware of something which she had to verify with every effort of her will before she could believe it, and which, once verified, she did not know whether to welcome or dread. The distant beating of Indian tom-toms had ceased. They had always maddened her, but had not Walker regarded them as a bulwark against nameless evil from outside the universe? What were some of those things he had repeated to her in whispers after talking with Grey Eagle and the Wichita medicine men? She did not relish this new and sudden silence after all. There was something sinister about it. The loud ticking clock seemed abnormal in its new loneliness. Capable at last of conscious motion, she shook the covers from her face and looked into the darkness toward the window. It must have cleared after the moon set, for she saw the squire patcher distinctly against a background of stars. Then, without warning, came that shocking, unutterable sound. Ha! <sighs> the dull, putrid pop of cleft skin and escaping poison in the dark. God! Sally's story, the dopsine stench, and this gnawing, clawing silence. It was too much. The bones of mutinous snapped, and the black night waxed reverberant with Audrey's screams of stark, unbridled frenzy. Consciousness did not pass away with the shock. How merciful, if only it had! Amidst the echoes of a shrieking, Audrey still saw the star-sprinkled squire of window ahead and heard the doom-boarding ticking of that frightful clock. Did she hear another sound? Was that squire window still a perfect squire? She was in no condition to weigh the evidence of her senses or distinguish between fact and hallucination. No, that window was not a perfect squire. Something had encroached on the lower edge. Nor was the ticking of the clock the only sound in the room. There was, beyond dispute, a heavy breathing neither her own nor poor Wolf's. Wolf slept very silently, and his wakeful wheezing was unmistakable. Then Audrey saw against the stars the black, demoniac silhouette of something anthropoid, and the underland bulk of a gigantic head and shoulders fumbling slowly toward her. Yeah, yeah, go away, go away, go away, snake devil, go away, Yig. I didn't want to kill them. I was feared he'd be scared of them. Don't, Yig, don't. I didn't go for to hurt your children. Don't come near me. Don't change me into no spotted snake. But the half formless head and shoulders only lurched onward toward the bed very silently. Everything snapped at once inside Audrey's head and in a second she had turned from a cowering child to a raging mad woman. She knew where the axe was, hung against the wall on those pegs near the lantern. It was within easy reach, and she could find it in the dark. Before she was conscious of anything further, it was in her hands, and she was creeping toward the foot of the bed. 
toward the monstrous head and shoulders that every moment groped their way nearer. Had there been any light, the look on her face would not have been pleasant to see. Take that, you, and that, and that, and that. She was laughing shrilly now, and her cackles mounted higher as she saw that the starlight beyond the window was yielding to the dim, prophetic pallor of coming dawn. Dr. McNeil wiped the perspiration from his forehead and put on his glasses again. I waited for him to resume, and as he kept silent, I spoke softly. She lived? She was found? Was it ever explained? The doctor cleared his throat. Yes, she lived in a way, and it was explained. I told you there was no bewitchment, while a cruel, pitiful, material horror. It was Sally Compton who had made the discovery. She had ridden over to the Davis cabin the next afternoon to talk over the party with Audrey and had seen no smoke from the chimney. That was queer. It had turned very warm again, yet Audrey was usually cooking something at that hour. The mules were making hungry-sounding noises in the barn and there was no sign of old wolf sunning himself in the accustomed spot by the door. Altogether, Sally did not like the look of the place. She was very timid and hesitant as she dismounted and knocked. She got no answer, but waited some time before trying the crude door of split locks. The lock, it appeared, was unfastened, and she slowly pushed her way in. Then, perceiving what was there, she reeled back, gasped, and clung to the jam to preserve her balance. A terrible odour had welled out as she opened the door, but that was not what had stunned her. It was what she had seen. For within that shadowy cabin, monstrous things had happened, and three shocking objects remained on the floor to awe and baffle the beholder. Near the burned-out fireplace was the great dog, purple decay on the skin left bare by mange and old age, and the whole carcass burst by the puffing effect of rattlesnake poison. It must have been bitten by a veritable legion of the reptiles. To the right of the door was the axe-hacked remnant of what had been a man, clad in a nightshirt and with the shattered bulk of a lantern clenched in one hand. He was totally free from any sign of snake bite. Near him lay the ensanguined axe, carelessly discarded, and wriggling flat on the floor was a loathsome, vacant eyed thing that had been a woman, but was now only a mute, mad caricature. All that this thing could do was to hiss and hiss and hiss. Both the doctor and I were brushing cold drops from her foreheads by this time. He poured something from a flask on his desk took a nip and handed another glass to me. I could only suggest tremulously and stupidly. So Walker had only fainted that first time? The screams roused him and Axe did the rest? Yes. Dr. McNeil's voice was low. But he met his death from snakes just the same. It was his fear working in two ways. It made him faint and it made him fill his wife with the wild stories that caused her to strike out when she thought she saw the snake devil. I thought for a moment. And Audrey, wasn't it queer how the curse of Yig seemed to work itself out on her? I suppose the impression of hissing snakes had been fairly ground into her. Yes, there was lucid spells at first, but they got to be fewer and fewer. A hair came white at the roots as it grew, and later began to fall out. The skin grew blotchy, and when she died, I interrupted with a start. Then, what was that? The thing downstairs. McNeil spoke gravely. That is what was born to her three quarters of a year afterward. There were three more of them. Two were even worse. But this one is the only one that lived. The End of The Curse of Yig Death Cell Visions by number 6606, Jack Boyle, from the American Magazine, September 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Death Cell Visions by Jack Boyle, number 6606. The town is red-hot, said K.Y. Lewis, and getting hotter, 
added Jimmy the joke. There's a five thousand dollar reward for the arrest of one or all of us, gloomily from Cushion's kid. Boston Blackie, their chief, took his pill of opium in a single draw and blew out the smoke reflectively. In the argot of thieves, a red hot town is one in which outraged public sentiment has forced the apathetic police department to make a real effort to stop a crime wave. So the town's burning up, eh? said Blackie. And there's a reward out for us, and that sack of diamonds buried down below. Well, what did you expect? Did you think the Chamber of Commerce was going to tender us a vote of thanks for cracking a safe in the busiest block of the main stem? Did you expect the mayor to invite us to a banquet? Of course the town's hot, and it's going to be hotter, as the joke said. From the tone the papers take, it looks as if it is up to the police chief to catch us or resign. That's just it, occurred Jimmy. They're currying this town for us with a fine-toothed comb. If they happen to spot this house, we all know what it means. We'll be lucky if even one of the four of us fights his way out alive. And you know, Blackie, that Pinkerton watchman got a good square look at you as you left the store. It's an even money that he's identified your mug in the Bertillon Gallery. Don't you think it's time to play checkers and move first? A week before, a sensational diamond robbery in the heart of the city, following a long series of similar crimes, had aroused the entire town. Businessmen's associations met and passed resolutions. The newspaper printed double-column editorials bemoaning the inefficiency of the police department, and the harried chief of detectives put his entire force on the case, telling the man, with a curse, to go out and arrest the safe blowers or prepare to lose their wings which in police parlance is to go back to patrolling a beat meanwhile the four men responsible for the furor lay under cover in a furnished cottage they had rented in the suburbs in action under fire is the final test of courage and although any one of blackie's mob would have unhesitatingly fought against any kind of odds until he dropped. The strain of endlessly doing nothing was telling on overstrung nerves. It's hard for the deer to lie quiet in the thicket and listen to the hunters tramping the woods round about, but the wise old buck does it and remains a deer instead of becoming venison, said Blackie slowly. It's that way with us. Of course we're in danger here, but if we start to travel, hundreds will see us every day, where not one gets a glimpse of us now. If they have identified my picture, which is possible, the alarm has been set out all over the country. On any railroad train or street corner, we are liable to be tapped on the shoulder and turned to look down a gun barrel. I figure that there are nearly forty chances of a pinch if we travel now to one while we lie quiet here i wouldn't mind swapping lead with a couple of coppers at that boasted cushions he was rather afraid that his former remark had been taken as a reflection on his nerve a quick wit beats a quick gun nine times out of ten son returned blackie in quiet censure remember that and you're less likely to have a rope start you on your jolt underground if I ever do have to go that route, it will satisfy my curiosity anyway, the boy bragged. I've always wondered what it was like to do time in the death cell. I've often dreamed that I was in one waiting to be topped, hanged. Maybe sometime I'll know. Blackie seized the pipe and passed it backward around the circle before another pill was smoked. It is the opium smoker's charm against ill luck of foolish boasting if you're really so curious to know what it means to a man to be caged in a steel tank counting the days and hours of life that he has left i'll tell you it may keep you from burning powder too soon sometime said the gray-haired cracksman after a silence he hesitated before continuing it isn't a thing i ever talk about 
I've tried for years to forget it and haven't succeeded. But I'll tell you the story tonight. It may do us all good, the way we're fixed. I did three months in a death cell once and had all but eaten my last meal when a reprieve came. All of Blackie's companions stared in astonishment. As closely as they had been associated with him for years, not one of them had ever heard of this new chapter in his eventful career. I was sentenced to death in the electric chair years ago, continued the speaker. I wasn't guilty, but that's not essential now. The coppers made out a good circumstantial case against me, and the jury brought in a death verdict. As I lie here now, I can feel again what I felt that day when they took me up to the old prison that I never expected to leave alive. Hurry up with a couple of pills, Jimmy. It gives me a habit whenever recalling that day and the others that followed. They are like a brand on the brain, something that can never be effaced. It was early summer. The sun was bright and warm and beautiful. There were birds and flowers everywhere outside the car windows. Inside, handcuffed to the seat, I leaned toward the window and saw children playing, men at work in the fields, farmers on laden truck wagons, city folks in automobiles. Everywhere there was life, and I was going to death. Everything my eyes saw was for the last time. I would never again look upon these simple everyday sights that now, since they were lost to me, for the first time seemed so deeply worthwhile. I remembered the executions I had read of in the papers. They had never impressed me very much. And now the thought came to me as a shock that my execution would mean as little to the outside world. They would read that I had died stoically or cravenly with a curse or a prayer on my lips and forget me in the box score of the ball game. At the prison, all the preliminaries over, I was led across a beautifully flowered garden to the death house. I walked slowly beside the captain who had me in charge. I took a last look at the flowers and the sunshine, and then another, and still another. That's right, said the old captain. Take your time and get a good look around. It's your last chance, son. I shuddered and was ashamed of myself. Was I, who had always prided myself on my nerve, weakening already, with the day still weeks ahead of me? The heavy door of the death house opened, and we entered, and it closed behind us, blotting out the sunlight. I had said my last goodbye to life. I was glad it was over, for the strain was getting on my nerves. After being stripped and given new clothes, I was led down a corridor with cells on either side. Faces that seemed curiously yellow in the glare of the electric lights peered out at me from behind the curtains as we passed down the tier. There were fourteen men there before me, all waiting, as I was, for one inevitable end. They put me in a cell with another condemned man. I threw my coat on the iron bunk and turned to look at him. His face was yellow like the others I had seen, and haggard. His eyes were bright and glowing, as if there were a flame behind. "'When do you go away? What's your day?' he asked. "'August 31st, I said. "'My day, too,' he cried out. "'We go away together. "'But maybe you've appealed, and we'll get a stay.' The thought seemed to hurt him. "'I don't have any money and couldn't appeal.' I answered. Oh, then we'll go away together. My appeal was denied last week. He seemed relieved. As soon as we had told our names, he commenced to tell me the news and gossip of our little world. For two men in the death cells, the whole world lies within the four walls that blot out forever that other world on the outside. A wife murderer was the next due to go away. He had refused to see the priest, and threw in the chaplain's face a Bible that had been sent to him. Another man, whose time also was nearly up, babbled secrets in his sleep, 
and was thought to be insane. It is hard for a man in here to know whether or not he is sane, said my companion, looking at me intently. Strange things happen in this place, things neither of us would ever believe on the outside. I'm glad they put you in with me. Either you will see what I see, or you won't. Either way, it will help me. What do you see? I don't understand, I replied, puzzled. The suspicion that he was crazy grew in my mind. You'll know soon enough, he answered, and dropped the subject. The long, monotonous days dragged wearily by. We were glad each time night came, and yet begrudged the loss of day. Each night left one day less of life for us. We read magazines, played checkers, tried novels, sang with the other condemned men, but no mental diversion ever removed the specter of the chair that waited at the end of the road we were traveling so swiftly. I remember one night I was reading an absorbingly interesting book. It was Père Garot by Balzac. I read on and on, my eyes following the printed words on the page. My cellmate spoke to me, and I came out of my dream, realizing that for many pages I had not sensed one word I read. While my eyes traveled the lines of the book, my mind had been on the chair. I was wondering whether the cold, damp cap that was to be clamped over the shaven spot on my head would send a shiver through me that would be mistaken for cowardice. I threw down my book in disgust. Pal, I said to my cellmate, what's the use of lying to ourselves? Neither of us mentioned the chair aloud, but both of us are thinking about it every minute we are awake and dreaming of it when we're asleep. What do you say if we quit pretending and talk about what's on our minds? It may help us pass the time. You're on, he cried eagerly. I've wanted to suggest it, but didn't know how you would take it. After that, we spent hours debating every imaginable phase of our approaching end. We recalled every printed account of an execution we had read. We argued the relative ease of death by hanging, by bullet, by electricity. We even made a sort of game of it in this way. I would say, what will happen eleven million five hundred and twenty thousand times yet before we go? You see, boys, I still remember even the figures after all these years. It was my cellmate's task to guess what I referred to. In this case, the answer was our heartbeats. Each of us vied with the other in inventing and computing these conundrums. Always we selected something in which the answer was some gigantic number, running into billions oftentimes. It seemed to push the chair further back into the future to have such an uncountable number of units of each kind between it and us. We used reams of paper figuring out how far an express train traveling sixty miles an hour would carry us in the days of life we had left. We estimated how far an ocean greyhound could take us in a round-the-world trip. We learned how fast the earth travels, and worked out with painstaking accuracy the exact distance it would carry us through space before the day. We read a magazine article on a comet, which was said to be traveling toward us at dizzying speed and learned how many round trips to the moon we had time still to make if we could travel with it. We made a table showing how many heartbeats and how many breaths were left us at the end of each of our rapidly dwindling number of days. And all this helped us to pass the time and keep down the ever-increasing mental tension. The wife murderer's day came. The night before, he refused to sleep, preferring the long torture of consciousness rather than to lose one of his precious minutes in insensibility. All night long we sang for him from cell to cell, hymns, ragtime, popular airs, everything. I recited The Girl with the Blue Velvet Band and Frankie and Johnny, but the old, old songs many of us had learned in childhood pleased best. 
Finally dawn came, and the curtains were dropped before our cells, and at last they led the doomed human creature out through the door, from behind which no one ever returns. The chair was within twenty feet of one of the walls of our cell, and although we listened, dry-lipped and trembling, after the death party passed out, no sound came to relieve the strain of the frightful silence. It was on the day that the second man was electrocuted after my arrival that my cell partner broke down. After the last chorus of goodbyes had been shouted, as the death party passed down the tier, the door closed behind them. That terrible, unbreakable silence that seemed the very embodiment of death itself was upon us. We could have heard a pin drop at the furthest end of the cell house. Each of us was picturing that hidden scene so close behind us in the execution room, and each of us saw himself in the chair. At last somebody coughed. The sound was like a blow. My partner cried out hysterically and tore at the wall with his fingernails. I picked him up in my arms and laid him on his cot where he lay sobbing like a child. Blackie, he cried, I can't, I can't face going to the chair knowing what lies beyond it for me. It's hard, all right, partner, I said. But what can't be helped must be born, and none of us knows what comes after the chair. Maybe it's peaceful sleep. Anyway, you and I will find out together. We'll share whatever lies over there. No, 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 we won't. That's just it, he sobbed, his voice rising in fear. You haven't been hounded by his face like I have. You haven't even seen him, and he's been here many times since you came. His face will be waiting for me after the chair. That is what frightens me. I don't believe in God. I've tried, but I can't. But I do believe in what I can see, and every night the eyes tell me, plainer than words, that I shall have to face him when the chair had done its work. Crazy as a bat, I said to myself and tried to quiet him. But he babbled on and on about the face that had come and stared at him at night with menacing, unmoving eyes. It was the face of his partner whom he killed, he said. My bunk lay with his head toward the corner where the face appeared, he told me. He asked me to move it and watch with him for this thing that terrified him so frightfully. Of course, I knew the man was insane, but I humored him. Blackie smoked a pill and motioned for an extra one before he spoke again. The others twisted uneasily on the pallet. Remember what I said in commencing? The smoker went on in low tones. I myself saw what I am going to tell. It was strange there in the death cell where mystery hangs like a fog all about. Told here before the four of us, in this daylight room, it seems unbelievable, and yet it is true. I know, for I saw it. Well, that night we lay awake, talking, and I kept trying to cheer up my cell partner, for he was terribly shaken, and I knew that there would be a frightful scene when the day came if he didn't regain his nerve. The lights in the cell went out, but those in the corridor shone through the barred door almost as brightly. The far wall of the cell was in shadow. Anywhere else there was light enough to read by. I don't know what time it was. Not late, anyway. There had been a silence between us for many minutes. Suddenly my comrade reached out and caught my hand in his, like a frightened child seeking protection from something. His fingernails sank into my flesh until they brought the blood. Look, look, he whispered from behind teeth that clinked like castanets. See, he's coming. I looked where he pointed with shaking forefinger. At first I saw nothing. Then, so gradually that the transition was scarcely perceptible, 
the dark stone wall before us seemed to grow luminescent near the center it was like nothing i had ever seen it was as if the light came through the wall from behind faint but unmistakable i stared slowly a change began near the center of the frame of light two spots more luminous than the rest appeared they looked like eyes my god they were eyes the outlines of the head grew visible then the face filled in around them icy perspiration ran in streams from my forehead i wanted to but could not turn my eyes away at last a whole face was there a human face with stern menacing eyes that looked straight at my companion cowering beside me the threat in the eyes pierced like a knife there was not the slightest movement not a flicker of an eyelash in the terrible steadiness of the gaze there was unutterable hatred and irresistible power and then as i stared it might have been minutes it may have been hours later i don't know the outlines of the head blurred and faded the light that shone through the wall dimmed and i found myself murmuring a prayer of thankfulness as i stared at the stone wall which was once again its familiar self my companion turned toward me a face blue-white with emotion after many trials he managed to articulate you saw you saw it blackie now tell me was i right i nodded i couldn't speak did you ever see the picture of the man i killed i shook my head then write write he cried write now a description of that face as if it were a man you had met i did as he wished without understanding what he intended to do as i wrote blood splashed down on the paper i looked at my hand it was gashed to the bone by my partner's fingernails i hadn't known it till then when i finished he rushed to the box in which he kept his letters and papers flinging them on the floor in his haste he finally found a clipping from a newspaper there was a photograph in the center of the page and he handed it to me it was a picture of the face i had seen on the wall every feature was there absolutely unchanged and unmistakable except the eyes in the picture these were more kindly i have told you what they were like as they stared at us from the wall my partner read aloud the description of the face i had written with the picture before me i could not have improved it i had described accurately the face of a man i had never seen except in that damnable vision you know now blacky why i'm afraid to go away it isn't the chair that terrifies me it's what comes after my partner said he was calmer now than i you read the message in his eyes i was too stunned and paralyzed with surprise and fear to talk or even think that i boston blackie should have seen such an impossible miraculous sight in a place where human trickery was obviously out of the question staggered my reason the barriers of unbelief were swept away by the certainty that i had seen proofs of the one unsolved mystery i was like a little child beginning all over again to build up new beliefs on the ruins of those convictions which until then had been certainties to me there was not an hour of sleep for either of us men in the cell that night of horror the following day my partner's wife came to visit him it was next to her last visit our time had dwindled away now to something less than twenty days a heavy wire screen kept her back from the cell door but though she could not touch him they could talk freely she was a wonderful woman of the same type as three-fingered Mac's wife of whom i told you once she was a firm believer in a life somewhere beyond the grave where there was no such thing as sorrow and crime and where those who had loved in this world met again in peace and happiness 
Like a mother talking to a little child, this woman, with tears streaming down her face, sought to force the comfort of her faith on the unbelieving mind of the doomed man she loved. Each strained against the intervening steel that kept them from even so little as a handclasp. If there were ministers who could plead as that woman did, maybe there would be fewer men like us. But there never will be. A woman where her love is involved is inspired. She is more than human. She begged him in the name of their love to have faith that the chair meant only a reunion for them, a reunion where there would be no barred doors, no suffering, no sin, no death. We'll meet each other there, my husband, she said. If only... Mary, he interrupted, if I thought the chair would bring us together again any time, anywhere, I would long for the day to come. But I can't believe it. I can't believe you will be given to me ever again. That will be my punishment. Someone is waiting for me there, though. Then he told her for the first time about the face of the murdered man as it appeared to him. His wife's face brightened as he explained. The light of some new and wonderful resolve shone in her eyes. She pressed her face to the wire netting and whispered to him like a mother. Dear, dear boy, she said, you have solved everything for us. Thank God you told me in time. You believe in that face you can see. You shall have my faith, too. When the time comes, you shall go knowing that it is to join one who loves you, not hates. The guard came to say that her visit time was up. Come closer so I can see your face once more, my dear, dear one, she said. I want to see you smile again, as you used to in the little house we both loved so. Don't fret or worry. I will save you from all your fears. God has shown me the way. Goodbye, my love, for a little while. A very little while. Bravely, she kissed her hand, stretched it out toward him, and was hurried away by the assistant guard. That night, the face appeared on the wall again, exactly as before. The following night, it came again, and so the night after we came to watch for it, with a fearful fascination. The hateful eyes stared out at us, as menacingly as ever. My partner, who had been cheered temporarily by his brave little woman's confidence, fell into a terrible state of fear and hopelessness. It was awful for me to contemplate what I feared would happen on the last morning. On the tenth day before we were due to go away, the warden personally brought a letter to my cellmate. It was very unusual. His manner, too, was strangely constrained. Read this letter, he said. It's from y your... your your wife i've got some news for you i'm sorry my partner held it up before his eyes but his nervous hands let it slip to the floor he motioned to me to read it to him as i lie down here now i can see every word of the letter as clearly as i did that morning it was only a few lines my darling when you read this, I shall have solved the problem for both of us. I shall have taken the one certain way to prove to you that my faith in the future, somewhere together, is surely true. Don't sorrow for me. I am happier as I write this than I have been since trouble came to us. Before you face the last ordeal, you will know, as I know, that it ends our separation forever. I have prayed that this knowledge may come to you, and it will. I shall be waiting for you. Don't fear to come to your Mary. The man looked at the warden with terrible fear in his face. She's... she's... he couldn't speak the word. Yes, my boy, she's dead, the official answered. Happened sometime last night. An overdose of morphine, they say. Her husband dropped on his bunk in a swoon, 
that looked like death to me i hoped it was it would have been easier and quicker they sent the doctor up and finally brought him back to consciousness it's a strange thing that they will do anything at all to stave off death until they can kill you in their own way the rest of the day was one that i still have to force out of my memory i don't intend to put those hours of agony into words it seemed almost as much a catastrophe to me as it did to her husband that the brave little woman who had cheered us only a few short days ago should now be gone forever hours passed and night came and neither of us knew it the warden sent a flask of whiskey but it laid untouched on the floor it must have been very late when we caught both together the first glimmer of light on the dark stone wall we clung together like scared children i'm not ashamed to tell it slowly it grew in the way that was now familiar to us the cold eyes appeared the head the whole face once again we stared at the vision of the murdered man and then as we looked came a transition the unchanging eyes seemed to soften the hatred died out the contour of the face altered the lines of the head melted into curvy waves of hair and before our eyes on that wall we saw the face of the dead woman my partner's wife he fell on his knees stretching out his arms to her her eyes kind and loving and happy looked straight into his giving as the others had done a strange message that was plainer than spoken words the kneeling man's eyes fixed with a sudden great hope mary mary my wife he called i understand i believe i believe i'll come to you glad and unafraid the vision faded and was gone he leapt to his feet blackie he cried seizing my hands and clasping my shoulder in the ecstasy of his newfound hope and belief she's waiting for me it's true all true we're going to be together again i wish i could go to the chair tomorrow no now this minute i can't wait mary has saved me no man has ever gone to the chair as that fellow did instead of fearing and begrudging the flying hours he checked them off eagerly impatiently like a boy waiting for a long expected holiday perfect peace and trust were in his heart he was the one happy man i ever knew or heard in the death cell and when the day finally came they told me he marched down the corridor and through the little door with a happy smile on his face and perfect love and trust in his eyes that boys is what a woman's love did for that man cushions was very white the others more solemn than usual as blackie finished thank you blackie for catching my arm when i started to draw my gun on the pakerton that night the boy said reverently all i've told you tonight flashed through my mind in the second in which i decided to risk talk instead of lead answered the gray-haired opium smoker it has saved me several times in similar moments of peril that's why i told you the story i felt i ought to the heavy opium smoke all but hid the far walls of the room but the men smoked on the pipe passed round and round the circle many times did any priest or scientist ever try to explain what you saw blackie asked jimmy at last as though there was no break in the conversation no one ever had the chance i never told anyone but you three was the answer i read once though that some professor laid an occurrence somewhat similar to what he called hypnotic thought suggestion between two overstrained minds that's rubbish though i know what i saw 
How did you beat the chair? asked Jimmy, voicing the question each had been eager to ask. The man who really killed the Jew came through with the truth, answered Blackie. He wasn't such a rat after all. He was safe in Lima, Peru, and he wrote a letter confessing his guilt and telling that the gun he used was hidden in a hollow oak just outside the house where the Jew was killed. Its disappearance was one of the mysteries of the case. He gave its number and told where he bought it in a pawn shop. There was a lot of other corroborative detail in the letter, and the district attorney, after an investigation, was convinced that I was innocent. He laid the letter before the governor who commuted my life imprisonment. I can still feel the sunshine on my face as it felt on that morning when I left the death cell for the open prison yard. Six months later the governor was convinced I was innocent, and he gave me a pardon. I left the prison determined to live straight. I was young then, but here I am gray-haired and still a thief. How did you come to turn back? asked Cushions eagerly. Blackie sighed. That's another and longer story, son. Sometime, maybe I'll tell you. Boys, we've all had enough hop. Smother the lamp, Jimmy. The end of Death Cell Visions by number 6606, Jack Boyle. Death Makes a Mistake by William P. McGivern. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Death Makes a Mistake by William P. McGivern. Read by Quartertone. When Reggie Van Fiddler sauntered into the cool, somber depths of the Midland Club's lobby, he was feeling in an exceptionally amiable mood. There was a song in his heart and a bland, dreamy, vague smile on his long, narrow face. This state of blissful tranquility could be attributed to the fact that Reggie's tan and white shoes were taking him directly toward the club bar, where he planned to while away the day sipping various long, cool drinks. And Reggie was always happy when the immediate future held the prospects of a drink. He nodded brightly to a uniformed attendant. Glorious morning, isn't he? he said. It was a glorious morning, the attendant corrected politely. Reggie looked blankly at a clock on the wall, and a puzzled frown spread over his equine features. Well, well, he muttered, shaking his head. How'd that happen? He sauntered on toward the bar, nibbling at a hangnail. The morning had slipped away from him somehow. Here it was two o'clock in the afternoon already. It was quite a blow. He remembered, then, that he had slept until twelve-thirty, and he brightened considerably. That explained it. Whistling merrily, he strode on into the dim, cool bar with its heavy brown fixtures and solid atmosphere of masculinity. The bartender set up his usual drink, and with knowledge born of long experience, immediately began the preparation of a second. Reggie sipped his drink and relaxed. For several moments, he stood at the bar, lazily contented, his brain slowed to about one revolution per minute. Finally, he happened to glance toward the end of the bar, and he noticed a small, dark, narrow-eyed man watching him closely. Reggie smiled uncertainly and returned to his drink. The dark man at the end of the bar was the only other customer, and Reggie knew that he was not a member of the club, for he had never seen him before in his life. Reggie finished his drink, and when the bartender set another before him, he glanced again toward the end of the bar. The little dark man was still there, regarding him, it seemed, with a steady, fixed stare. Reggie coughed nervously and gulped his drink. There was something in the dark little man's beady-eyed gaze that disturbed him. He had another quick drink and peeked from the corner of his eye at the little dark man. There was something sinister about the chap, he felt sure. Reggie was the owner of an extremely lurid imagination, and now, warmed by the glow of alcohol, he began to envision all sorts of wild possibilities. After his fourth drink, he was certain that the man was an Axis agent. 
Just why an Axis agent would be staring at him, he had no idea, but he felt sure the man was a Nazi. Reggie finished his drink and set the glass on the bar. Then he casually sauntered toward the door. A few paces from the room's only exit, he paused, and under the pretense of inspecting a faded spot print on the wall, he sneaked a quick glance at the dark little man. The dark little man was still staring at him with narrowed, shaded eyes. Reggie yawned ostentatiously and inched closer to the door. He was going to make a break for it, but it would have to be fast and clever. His heart was pounding with more gusto than usual, and there were bright spots of excitement in his pale cheeks. This new role of dodging the Gestapo appealed enormously to his comic strip's sense of melodrama. Headlines popped before his mind's eye. Reggie Van Fiddler makes escape. From what he was going to escape, he wasn't quite sure, but he felt that the details would be in the body of the news story. Headlines didn't tell everything, did they? Within a foot of the door, he turned casually and took one last look at the little man who was staring so intently at him. Then, with a sudden slithering motion, he slipped through the door. He collided heavily with a small figure. I'm sorry, he stammered. I'm in a bit of a hurry. He turned and started away, but he had barely taken three strides when he jerked to a stop. An expression of dazed amazement stole over his face and his sleepy eyes opened wide. Wheeling suddenly, he stared back at the small figure he had collided with. The man was still standing in the corridor that led from the bar, regarding Reggie with a fixed, thoughtful expression. And he was the same dark little man Reggie had left inside the bar room seconds before. Reggie gulped audibly. His Adam's apple bobbed in his throat like a mouse in a sock. How had the dark little man gotten out of the bar ahead of him? Reggie didn't know, and he had no inclination to wait and ask questions. With one last incredulous look over his shoulder, he wheeled and loped across the lobby, down the marble steps, through the club's revolving doors, and into the street. He walked swiftly, mopping his forehead with his handkerchief. The experience had been an unnerving one. When he reached the end of the block, he hailed a cab and gave the driver the address of another bar. As the cab rolled across the loop, Reggie settled back and gnawed nervously at his fingernails. Thoughtful meditation and analysis were not his strongest suits. In fact, any thinking at all was an annoying chore to him, but he felt now that he had better bend his brain to the problem of the dark little man whom he'd seen at the club. The chap was obviously interested in him, but why? There was no reasonable answer to that question, and there was no explanation to the way the little fellow had popped up outside the bar when Reggie had seen him a split second before inside the bar. Reggie was still stewing over these matters when the cab came to a stop before a swanky glitter joint which catered to afternoon revelers and jitterbugs of both sexes. Inside the smoky, dimly lighted den of din and discord, Reggie forgot his troubles long enough to order a drink, his fifth of the afternoon. He was conscious of a vague buzzing between his ears, and there was a pleasant mellow glow in the region of his solar plexus. Had it not been for his disturbing experience at the Midland Club, he would have been feeling very, very fine. When his drink arrived, he sipped it appreciatively and glanced about the crowded bar, looking for a familiar face. In one corner of the room, he saw a tall young man in tweeds lounging against the wall with a drink in his hand. With a glad cry, Reggie scrambled from his bar stool and lurched across the crowded floor, weaving his way with drunken dexterity through the jitterbugging maniacs. Hi, he cried when he reached the tweed-clad young man's side. How've you been, Ricky? Have a drink? Been fine, the young man answered. Got a drink. Name isn't Ricky. Not Ricky? Reggie shook his head, frowning. Could have sworn you were good old Ricky Davis, chap I knew at school. Well, how are things? Good, the young man answered. Have a drink? Got one, Reggie said. Got to go now. It's been nice seeing you again, Ricky. He started to weave his way back to the bar. Suddenly, he stopped, his eyes focusing in fascination on the figure of a man at the bar, a man who had appropriated the seat which Reggie had vacated. The man was small and dark. His eyes were narrow and inscrutable. He was the same person Reggie had seen at the club. 
The breath left Reggie's lungs in a rush. Obviously, the man had followed him here. As he stood, transfixed, in the middle of the floor, the man turned and looked straight at him, a peculiar thoughtful expression on his dark face. After studying Reggie for a long interval, he turned slowly back to the bar. Reggie swallowed what was left of his drink in one gulp, but the liquor had no effect on him. After the shock he'd received, it would take liquid dynamite to bolster him up. He reeled back to the tall young man who was leaning against the wall. Ricky! he cried hoarsely. I'm being followed! Axis agents are after me! Name isn't Ricky, the tall young man said. Why? Why what? Reggie said blankly. He seemed to have fumbled the conversational ball. He wished the young man would speak with more clarity and add a few articles and pronouns to his sentences. Why are they following you? the young man said peevishly. Nothing better to do? That's just it, Reggie said. I don't know why I'm being followed, but everywhere I go this little man sticks to me like a postage stamp. Where is he now? Reggie pointed dramatically at the dark little man. At the bar. He took the stool I left. He's right between that fat old man and that young girl with the red hair. The tweed-clad young man stared in the direction of Reggie's pointing finger. Then he frowned and glanced down at Reggie. Any pink elephants yet? I'm not drunk, Reggie said indignantly. That man has been following me like a conga partner all afternoon. The tall young man patted Reggie patiently on the shoulder. Sleep and rest will make a new man of you, he said. Go home. Go to bed. You've got hallucinations. Hallucinations? Reggie cried over the din of the orchestra. What do you mean? Don't you see the man I mean? Right between the fat old man and the girl with the red hair? The tweedish young man shook his head. The stool between the fat old man and the red-haired girl is completely unoccupied, he said in the patient voice of a man instructing a very young child. Reggie shook his head bewilderedly. There was a sudden, cold hollow in the pit of his stomach. He opened and closed his mouth several times without producing a sound. Are you serious? He finally managed to gasp. Certainly, the young man answered. There's no one on the bar stool you left. You're just seeing things. Take my advice and go home. You've had too much giggle water. Reggie set his drink down hastily. For a long, deliberate moment, he studied the back of the dark little man at the bar. Then he shook his head dazedly. Maybe this was all some wild product of his imagination. Maybe he was having hallucinations. He shook his head again, and then he shook hands with the young man in the tweed suit. I'm going home, Ricky, he said firmly. Say hello to the gang for me. Name isn't Ricky, the young man said, sipping from his drink. But I'll tell the boys you were asking. Good, Reggie said. He left the crowded bar by the back entrance. The warm sunshine was pleasant and reassuring. People hurried past him, traffic surged in the streets, and everything was quite normal. He breathed a deep sigh and hailed a cab. He gave the driver the address of his apartment and then settled back against the soft leather cushions. Sleep was all he needed. That was all. When he reached his apartment on the near north side, he had succeeded in convincing himself that his peculiar experiences of the afternoon were only products of his fevered imagination. As he led himself into his apartment, he had firmly resolved to strictly ration his reading of comic strips and spy magazines. They were pretty strong meat if they weren't handled with discretion. The pleasantly furnished living room of his apartment was shrouded in late afternoon semi-darkness, and when he closed and locked the door behind him, he switched on the lights. The first thing he saw when he walked into the room was the little dark man whom he'd seen at the club and at the bar a few minutes previously. The dark little man was sitting in a straight chair, his hands resting on his knees. There was a faint smile on his face as he studied Reggie with calm, inscrutable eyes. Reggie staggered back a few steps, clapping one hand hysterically to his forehead. He couldn't believe his eyes. He had left this man at a bar in the loop, but here he was now, sitting calmly and unconcernedly in the living room of his apartment. How did you get in here? he gasped. The dark little man stood up and smiled. Is that important? 
he asked softly. I am here, and that is all that matters. Reggie swallowed loudly. There was something disturbing about the calm ambiguity of the man's statement. He rubbed his damp palms together nervously. Can I get you a drink? he blurted. The dark little man shook his head slowly. Reggie looked at him uneasily, noticing him in detail for the first time. He was small, hardly more than five feet two, and he was slenderly built. His hair was jet black, and it combed straight back from a high, delicate forehead. He wore severely tailored black clothes that fit his small frame without a wrinkle. But his eyes dominated his entire personality, for they were a cold, chilling black, lusterless and unwinking, as unrevealing as twin diamonds. Reggie shivered slightly and looked wistfully toward the door of the apartment. He coughed nervously. <clears throat> Sorry to seem rude, he said, laughing weakly, but I've got to be toddling off now. It's been nice uh, running into you. There are magazines on the table, liquor in the icebox, so just make yourself at home. He backed cautiously toward the door, smiling nervously. Don't wait up for me, he said. I've... Wait, the dark little man said quietly. I must talk with you. Some other time, Reggie said, feeling behind him for the doorknob. Awfully rushed just now. Sorry, but... Wait, the little man said again, but this time his voice cracked like a whip. Didn't you hear me? I must talk with you. Reggie jumped at the cracking tone of the man's voice. His hand jerked away from the doorknob as if it were red hot. Oh, you want to talk to me? He said foolishly. I didn't understand you. My name, the little man said, is... He paused and smiled cryptically. Demise. Glad to know you, Reggie said. My name is... I know your name, Mr. Demise said. I know everything about you, Reginald Van Fiddler. I know things about you that you don't know yourself. Do you now, Reggie said, becoming interested in spite of himself. For instance? I know that you are about to take a long trip, Mr. Demise said. That's not news, Reggie said. My draft board just classified me 1A. I'll be taking a long trip very shortly. That is not the trip I am referring to, Mr. Demise said. You are going on a trip with me. Reggie blinked. He couldn't think of anyone with whom he would rather not take a trip than this dark, sinister little man who called himself Mr. Demise. What did Demise mean, anyway? It's nice of you and all that, he said, but I don't think I'll be able to make it. My draft board might not like it. They will understand, Mr. Demise said. I don't know about that, Reggie said. He was beginning really to worry. There was something damnably inevitable about Mr. Demise's calm statements. They're pretty ticklish about such things. I think we'd better forget the whole idea. That is impossible, Mr. Demise said. Reggie rubbed his moist palms on his trouser legs. Who are you? he asked hesitantly. Have you been following me around all day just to sell me on the idea of a trip? Are you from Cook's Tours? Mr. Demai smiled and shook his head. I am not interested in selling you the idea of a trip. I am simply telling you that you are going on a trip. I have already made all the arrangements. There is nothing that can possibly change them. Where am I going? Reggie asked. His voice was a whisper. With me... Mr. Demise said. That's no answer, Reggie said, clutching at straws. Who are you? Where are you going? Mr. Demise smiled again, very faintly. He walked slowly to the mantelpiece and plucked a rose from a vase. His hand gently closed over the flower as he turned to face Reggie. Perhaps this will answer your questions, he said softly. He opened his hand and dropped the flower to the floor at Reggie's feet. Reggie's eyes widened in sheer amazement, for the soft, glowing beauty of the flower was faded forever. It lay on the floor, a blackened, dead reminder of its former glory. It's dead, he said incredulously. It withered at the touch of your hand. Mr. Demise nodded slowly, and there was a wistful sadness in his face. All living things die at my touch, he said. 
for I am death. Death? Reggie echoed. For an instant, he stared blankly at Mr. Demise. Death, he repeated. Why, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. He actually felt a sensation of relief in the realization that he'd been entertaining some loony instead of an Axis agent as he'd feared. You're off your trolley, he said to Mr. Demise. You'd better get moving before your keeper finds you. Death, what a gag. I assure you it is not a gag, Mr. Demise said slowly. Your time is near at hand, and I have been sent to take you to the land of darkness. Think again, chum, Reggie said emphatically. I'm not going to Harlem with you or anyone else, and that's final. It is useless to protest, Mr. Demise said. Your destiny is sealed. You must come with me. You are plain balmy, Reggie said. I've never heard a sillier yarn in my life. So you're death, are you? Mr. Demise nodded. I am one of his agents. Changing your story a little, aren't you? Reggie said triumphantly. Well, since when has death been announced by personal messengers? A man steps in front of a car, he's killed. That's all there is to it. There aren't little black men standing on the curb pushing him into the street, are there? And they don't come around a couple of hours in advance tipping him off, do they? No. When a mortal passes over, Mr. Demise said, there is always an agent of death present superintending the details. But he is not always visible to his charge. Reggie poured himself a drink and lit a cigarette. Well, thanks just the same, he said. But I don't want any special effects when I pass over. If there's a messenger of death around, I don't want to see him. Just let him stay invisible. That's the way I want it. Mr. Demise looked slightly pained. There was an embarrassed look on his normally expressionless features. Usually, the agent of death is invisible, he said. In fact, his orders are to remain invisible under all circumstances. Okay, then, Reggie said. You're breaking orders. Be a nice, obedient chum now and fade away. Mr. Demise shrugged and stepped backwards, and suddenly he was gone. He had disappeared into thin air, soundlessly, instantaneously. Why, what? Reggie said blandly. He started to sip his drink, when suddenly the full realization of what had happened burst on him. The drink fell from his nerveless fingers with a crash. He stared frantically about the room. Mr. Demise was gone. It was incredible. It was unbelievable. But it was a fact. He poured himself another drink and drained it in one breathless gulp. He felt his reason tottering as his gaze swung desperately about the room. Mr. Demise, he cried, come back. Where are you? I am here before you, Mr. Demise's voice sounded in the air. Are you convinced now? Reggie mopped his forehead weakly. Yes, he gasped. I'm convinced. Mr. Demise reappeared as suddenly as he had vanished. He smiled faintly at Reggie. He was apparently completely unruffled by his transformation. Reggie poured himself another drink with trembling fingers. D don't do that anymore, he pleaded. As you wish, Mr. Demise said agreeably. I am sorry if I shocked you. I can see now that it was a mistake to let you see me in the first place. I understand now why it is strictly forbidden. Reggie drained his drink. I wish you hadn't decided to break regulations, he said moodily. I've never been so upset in all my life. Why didn't you remain invisible if you're supposed to? You aren't going to creep into people's hearts if you pop up and announce yourself as an agent of death and start making speeches about whisking them off to the land of darkness. People just don't like that sort of thing. By all means, stay invisible in the future. Mr. Demise shuffled awkwardly, and for the first time, his poise seemed to desert him. You're absolutely right, he said gloomily. But I was curious. That's a fine excuse, Reggie said scathingly. I should think they'd get a man of tact and diplomacy for your job, not some nosy person whose curiosity runs away with him. You see... 
Mr. Demise explained miserably. You happen to be my first assignment. I've had no experience at all in this work, and I was curious to see what kind of person I was going to take back with me. And I wanted to get a first-hand reaction from you. Reggie mixed himself another drink. He was beginning to feel belligerent. So, he cried, they sent an amateur down to get me, did they? I suppose I don't rate an experienced escort, so they sent you. I'm surprised they didn't just tell the office boy to do the job. Your levity is poor taste, Mr. Demise observed frigidly. I can assure you that I am perfectly qualified to act as your guide to the other world. I have studied hard to perfect myself for my work, and I was considered one of the outstanding pupils in the class which just graduated. You do not have to relieve your spite by making slighting references to my professional ability. Bah, Reggie said. If you have any professional ability, it hasn't been noticeable so far. You're just out of some college, aren't you? You talk like a college boy. You don't make sense. Mr. Demise looked hurt. I'm sorry you're taking this attitude, he said. I had hoped we could be friends. Friends? Reggie shrieked. Am I expected to be friendly with some ghoul who comes prowling around, threatening to whisk me off to eternity? What more do they expect of me? To pay my own way, too, I suppose. Your passage will be taken care of at the other end, Mr. Demise said. Since you have taken such an ungracious stand, we will not dally further. Now, wait a minute, Reggie said. He felt his throat getting dry. The prospects of death were not pleasant. He didn't want to die right now. He had things to do. There was that badminton match next week with Snuffy Smith. Can't we put this thing off a while? He asked hopefully. There's no sense in rushing things, I always say. Why don't you go off and get yourself a lot of experience, and then come back for me? That is impossible, Mr. Demise said flatly. He drew from his inside coat pocket a slim black book, which he opened to the first page. You are first on my list, and I must carry out my orders to the letter. All the information as to person, place, and method is contained in this book, and it would be impossible to change it. Place and method, eh? Reggie said weakly. He ran a finger around the inside of his collar. You mean you've got the dope there on how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen? Certainly, Mr. Demise replied. We don't use a hit-or-miss method. Everything is worked out to a science. You, for instance, are... Mr. Demise paused and shook his head. No, he continued, I can't tell you. That is also against instructions. You haven't paid much attention to instructions so far, Reggie said sulkily. Can't you give me a hint as to how I'm going to get it? Mr. Demise shook his head firmly. That would be an unthinkable breach of conduct, he said, shaking his head severely and frowning. Absolutely unthinkable. All right. Reggie said resignedly. There was no point, he realized, in arguing with this inhuman icicle. But let's have a drink before we get down to, uh, uh, business. I am not allowed to drink while on duty, Mr. Demise said primly. For gosh sakes, Reggie said disgustedly. You weren't thinking about your precious orders and regulations when you followed me around scaring the hell out of me. Oh no, that was all right. But when I ask you to do a little something outside the letter of your instructions, it's no soap. If there's anything fair in that, I can't see it. Mr. Demise shuffled uncomfortably. It was indiscreet of me to allow you to see me, he said thoughtfully. Perhaps your objection is justifiable. It might square things a bit if I would take a drink with you. Not that I would expect to enjoy this stuff, but it seems the fair thing to do. Fine, Reggie said. He mixed two drinks in somber silence. Because he realized that it was probably the last time he would ever perform that pleasant chore, he put his heart and soul into the task, and when he finally handed Mr. Demise his drink, it was a veritable masterpiece. Mr. Demise drank the drink, 
It was a double martini with a splash of Cointreau in one long appreciative gulp. He set the glass down and sighed contentedly. Another? Reggie suggested, hopefully. No, Mr. Demise said. One is plenty. As a matter of fact, he said, that's the first drink I've ever had. Alcohol is one of our finest helpers, but we aren't supposed to touch it. Personally, I think its intoxicating effect is greatly overrated. Reggie leaned forward, and there was a peculiar gleam in his eyes. So that was your first drink, eh? he asked. And you don't feel anything? Not a thing, said Mr. Demise. Of course, I notice a certain glow, but that's all. Just a certain glow, eh? Reggie said. That's all, Mr. Demise said. He sat down suddenly. And my tongue is a little thick. Well, that's only natural, Reggie said. He mixed another drink, and there was a cryptic smile on his lips. Alcohol is a peculiar thing. One drink will addle a person's wits, and the second will act as an antidote. Strange, isn't it? Mr. Demise rocked slightly in the chair. His coal-black eyes were a bit glazed. It's very strange, he conceded. Possibly you'd like to try the antidote? Reggie said casually. Might not be a bad idea, said Mr. Demise. Reggie handed him the second drink and watched contentedly as Mr. Demise drank it down. Mr. Demise set down the glass. You was right, he said, slumping against the back of the chair. Absolutely right. Second drink is an antidote. Just what I needed. Absolutely, Reggie agreed solemnly. Mr. Demise closed his eyes, but he opened them almost immediately. He struggled up to a sitting position. I have something to do, he muttered. His hand groped into the inside of his coat, returned with a slim black book. Very important, he mumbled. First assignment. Can't have any slip-ups. Reggie moistened his lips nervously. He eyed the little black book carefully. That might be the way. How about another drink, old boy? He said heartily. He mixed one quickly, handed it to Mr. Demise. Mr. Demise took it in his left hand, and Reggie deftly plucked the black book from his right hand. Mr. Demise appeared not to notice the exchange. He drank the drink methodically. Reggie tossed the book under a coffee table. Mr. Demise climbed unsteadily to his feet. Reggie took him by the arm. What say we go out and have a few antidotes, he suggested. Mr. Demise nodded stupidly. He mumbled something unintelligible and allowed Reggie to lead him to the door. Reggie's brain was working at full speed. If he could just ditch Mr. Demise and get back to the book, everything might be saved. His idea was sheer brilliance. Their first destination was a bar. Reggie found a cab, shoved Mr. Demise inside, and ordered the driver to one of the dozens of friendly bars with which she was familiar. At the first stop, Mr. Demise had two more drinks. When he had drained the second, Reggie hauled him to his feet and started for another pallet palace. His object was to keep Mr. Demise so bewildered and drunk that he would forget his job. For a while he succeeded. Mr. Demise followed him helplessly from bar to bar and sat tottering on high stools, happily pouring fiery intoxicants into his already overburdened stomach. But finally he reached a state of saturation where the liquor produced a steadily diminishing effect. Reggie watched him worriedly and ordered more and more drinks. But it was no use. In spite of the enormous quantities of liquor he had consumed, Mr. Demise was slowly sobering up. His face was losing its blank expression, and an intelligent gleam was creeping back into his eyes. He began to fumble uncertainly through his pockets, a worried expression settling over his features. Reggie slapped him on the back resoundingly. Have a drink, he shouted into his ear. Mr. Demise shook his head stubbornly. Got a job to do, he muttered. 
He went slowly through his pockets, and an expression of horror replaced the worried look on his face. Where's my book? he gasped. I've lost my book. This is terrible. I've got to find it. What book? Reggie asked innocently. The book with all the names and places and dates and methods, Mr. Demise moaned. I've lost it. Reggie shrugged philosophically. Too bad, he said. But things are never as black as they seem. Maybe it'll turn up somewhere. The first thing to do is just sit tight until someone finds it and reports it. I can't wait, wailed Mr. Demise. These things have to happen on schedule. There'd be an awful rumpus in the complainant department if I started sending people up there haphazardly. And I don't even remember whom I've got on the list. You're the only one I'm sure of. Reggie choked on his drink. Yes, Mr. Demise went on obliviously. You're the first. I'm sure of that much. And I'd better send you along right away. I'll do that much correctly, at least. Now, just a minute, Reggie said. How are you sure you've got me right? I looked at that book, and I don't think I'm the man you want at all. You looked at the book, cried Mr. Demise with sudden suspicion. So that's where it went. That's why you got me drunk. You stole my book, hoping to evade your destiny, didn't you? Nothing of the sort, Reggie said, forcing a note of outraged indignation into his voice. Yes, you did, Mr. Demise said. I'm not going to wait a second longer in your case. Mr. Fiddler, prepare yourself for a long trip and don't plan on coming back. Reggie realized that the jig was up. Mr. Demise had a grim business-like note in his voice and there was no hope of prolonging things further. Drastic action was needed, not discussion. With a leap like a startled gazelle, Reggie left his stool and bounded for the door. Before Mr. Demise could turn around, he was in the street, shouting frantically for a cab. A cab pulled to the curb, and Reggie leaped into its dark interior. Over his shoulder, he saw Mr. Demise stagger from the bar, a wrathful expression stamped on his dark features. The cab started away with a roar. Reggie shouted his address at the driver and squirmed about to peek out the rear window. He saw Mr. Demise clambering into another cab. Hurry! he shouted to the driver. Life or death, eh? the cabbie said conversationally. Reggie winced. You said it! The cab caromed around corners, hit the outer drive, and hurled along like a frightened cottontail until it reached the near north side where it swung west and sped through the labyrinthine streets that led to Reggie's apartment. From the rear window, Reggie could see Mr. Demise's cab speeding after them, steadily closing the gap. His palms were moist, and the effects of the liquor had completely faded, leaving him horribly sober. There was nothing funny about this predicament. His cab jolted to a stop, and Reggie threw a bill at the driver and leaped out and raced into the foyer of his building. By a miraculous stroke of luck, the elevator was not in use. He slammed the door and jabbed the button, and the car started upward with a jerk. He breathed a long, shuddering sigh of relief. Maybe there would yet be time. The elevator stopped at his floor. Just as he opened the door and stepped out, the elevator suddenly dropped back down the shaft. One of his legs dangled down the shaft. With a startled squawk, he pulled himself onto the floor landing. Mr. Demise obviously meant business. If he'd been in that elevator, everything would be all over now. As it was, he still had a chance. He let himself into his apartment, switched on the light, and dove underneath the coffee table. The Black Book of Doom was still there. Frantically, Reggie opened it to the first page, found his own name. He jerked a pencil from his pocket. He was still scribbling furiously when the door of the apartment banged open and Mr. Demise strode into the room, his face black as a thundercloud. Reggie dropped the pencil and hid the book from view with his body. So, Mr. Demise cried, you would try to escape? He raised both hands commandingly in the air. 
Before he could move again, Reggie wheeled about. Just a minute, he shrieked. He held out the slim black book to Mr. Demise. I was sure a mistake had been made. Here, look for yourself. I want no more of your tricks, Mr. Demise warned ominously. This is no trick, Reggie said. You should be grateful to me for catching the air in time. Mr. Demise took the book from Reggie and examined it carefully. The frown gradually faded from his face as his eyes lingered on the page. He shuffled his feet awkwardly and cleared his throat. Uh, it seems, he said in a small, chastened voice, that a mistake has been made. Reggie's heart pounded with hope. It certainly has, he said. This entire affair should be reported to someone. That's what happens when you put inexperienced men on the job. You wind up with a bungled mess. I don't know how it happened, Mr. Demise said miserably. All I can say is I'm sorry. Fine thing, Reggie said stuffily. Mess up your job like this and then say you're sorry. I'd advise, Demise, that you lay off the liquor when you're supposed to be working. I will in the future, Mr. Demise said humbly. See that you do, Reggie said sternly. Now I'd say you'd better get to work on that first assignment. Yes, I will, Mr. Demise said. With drooping shoulders, he moved slowly to the door. With his hand on the knob, he turned again to Reggie. I hate to be a pest, he said, but I'm afraid I don't know how to go about this job. Maybe you could help me. Where can I find this fellow? Reggie chuckled and began to mix himself a drink. I'd advise you to try Brechtus Garden, he said. Just ask anyone you meet. They'll tell you where you can find Adolf Hitler. Thank you, Mr. Demise said gratefully. I won't slip up on this one. See that you don't, Reggie said. End of Death Makes a Mistake by William P. McGivern Dr. Trafulgus by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Dr. Trafulgus by Jules Verne. 1. Swish! It is the wind let loose. Swash! It is the rain falling in torrents. This shrieking squall bends down the trees of the Volsinian coast and hurries on, flinging itself against the sides of the mountains of Crima. Along the whole length of the littoral are high rocks, gnawed by the billows of the vast sea of Megalocrida. Swish! Swash! Down by the harbor nestles the little town of Lucktrop, perhaps a hundred houses, with green palings which defend them indifferently from the wild wind. Four or five hilly streets, ravines rather than streets, paved with pebbles and strewn with ashes thrown from the active cones in the background. The volcano is not far distant. It is called the Voglor. During the day it sends forth sulfurous vapors. At night, from time to time, great outpourings of flame. Like a lighthouse carrying a hundred and fifty kurtzes, the Voglor indicates the port of Lucktrop to the coasters, Felsens, Verlicks, and Balanzes, whose keels furrow the waters of Megalocrita. On the other side of the town are ruins dating from the Crimarian era. Then a suburb, Arab in appearance, much like a kasbah, with white walls, domed roofs, and sun-scorched terraces, which are all nothing but accumulations of square stones thrown together at random. Veritable dice are these, whose numbers will never be effaced by the rust of time. Among others we notice the 6-4, a name given to a curious erection, having six openings on one side and four on the other. A belfry overlooks the town, the square belfry of St. Philfelina with bells hung in the thickness of the walls, which sometimes a hurricane will set in motion. That is a bad sign. The people tremble when they hear it. Such is Lucktrop. Then come the scattered habitations in the country, set amid heath and broom as in Brittany. But this is not Brittany. Is it in France? I do not know. Is it in Europe? I cannot tell. At all events, do not look for Lucktrop on any map. 2. Rat-tat! 
A discreet knock is struck upon the narrow door of 6-4 at the left corner of the Rue Massaglier. This is one of the most comfortable houses in Luctrop, if such a word is known there, one of the richest, if gaining some millions of fretzers by hook or by crook constitutes riches. The rat-tat is answered by a savage bark in which is much of a lupin howl, as if a wolf should bark. Then a window is opened above the door of 6-4, and an ill-tempered voice says, Deuce take people who come bothering here! A young girl, shivering in the rain, wrapped in a thin cloak, asks if Dr. Trafalgus is at home. He is or he is not, according to circumstances. I want him to come to my father who is dying. Where is he dying? At Valcarnian, four Kurtzes from here. And his name? Vort Cartiff. Vort Cartiff, the herring salter? Yes, and if Dr. Trafalgus... Dr. Trafalgus is not at home! And the window is closed with a slam, while the swishes of the wind and the swashes of the rain mingle in a deafening uproar. Three. A hard man, this Dr. Trafalgus, with little compassion, and attending no one unless paid cash in advance. His old Hersoff, a mongrel of bulldog and spaniel, would have had more feeling than he. The house called 6-4 admitted no poor, and opened only to the rich. Further, it had a regular tariff, so much for a typhoid fever, so much for a fit, so much for a pericarditis, and for other complaints which doctors invent by the dozen. Now, Vort Cartiff, the herring salter, was a poor man, and of low degree. Why should Dr. Trafalgus have taken any trouble, and on such a night? Is it nothing that I should have had to get up? He murmured as he went back to bed. That alone is worth ten fretzers. Hardly twenty minutes had passed when the iron hammer was again struck on the door of 6-4. Much against his inclination, the doctor left his bed and leaned out of his window. Who is there? he cried. I am the wife of Vort Cartiff. The herring salter of Valcarnian? Yes, and if he refuse to come, he will die. All right, you will be a widow. Here are twenty fretzers. Twenty fretzers for going to Valcarnian. Four curtses from here. Thank you. Be off with you. And the windows closed again. Twenty fretzers. A grand fee. Risk a cold or lumbago for twenty fretzers especially when tomorrow one has to go to Kiltrino to visit the rich Edzingov, laid up with gout, which is valued at fifty fretzers the visit. With this agreeable prospect before him, Dr. Trafalgus slept more soundly than before. Swish, swash, and then rat tat rat tat rat tat To the noises of the squaw were now added three blows upon the knocker, struck by a more decided hand. The doctor slept. He woke but in a fearful humor. When he opened the window, the storm came in like a charge of shot. "'I am come about the herring salter. "'That wretched herring salter again! "'I am his mother. "'May his mother, his wife, and his daughter perish with him. "'He has had an attack. "'Let him defend himself.' "'Some money has been paid us,' continued the old woman. "'An installment on the house sold to the commandeur Dutrup of the Rue Massaglier.' If you do not come, my granddaughter will no longer have a father, my daughter-in-law a husband, myself a son. It was piteous and terrible to hear the old woman's voice, to know that the wind was freezing the blood in her veins, that the rain was soaking her very bones beneath her thin flesh. A fit! Why, that would be two hundred fritzers, replied the heartless Trifulgus. We have only a hundred and twenty. Good night, and the window was again closed. But after due reflection, it appeared that a hundred and twenty fretzers for an hour and a half on the road, plus half an hour of visit, made a fretzer a minute. A small profit, but still not to be despised. Instead of going to bed again, the doctor slipped into his coat of valveter, went down in his waiting boots, stowed himself away in his great coat of lurtain with his sureure on his head and his mufflers on his hands. He left his lamp lighted close to his pharmacopoeia, open at page 197, then, pulling the door of 64, he paused on the threshold. The old woman was there, leaning on her stick, bowed down by her eighty years of misery. The hundred and twenty fretzers. Here is the money, and may God multiply it for you a hundredfold. God, whoever saw the color of his money? The doctor whistled for Herzoff, gave him a small lantern to carry, and took the road towards the sea. The old woman followed. Five. What swishy, swashy weather! 
the bells of St. Philfelina, are all swinging by reason of the gale. A bad sign, but Dr. Trafalgus is not superstitious. He believes in nothing, not even in his own science, except for what it brings him in. What weather, and also what a road. Pebbles and ashes. The pebbles slippery with seaweed, the ashes crackling with iron refuse. No other light than that of Herzog's lantern, vague and uncertain. At time, jets of flame from Voglor uprear themselves, and in the midst of them appear great comical silhouettes. In truth, no one knows what is in the depths of those unfathomable craters. Perhaps spirits of the other world, which volatilize themselves as they come forth. The doctor and the old woman follow the curves of the little bays of the littoral. The sea is white with a livid whiteness, a morning white. It sparkles as it throws off the crests of the surf, which seem like outpourings of glowworms. These two persons go on thus as far as the turn in the road between sandhills, where the brooms and the reeds clash together with a shock like that of bayonets. The dog had drawn near to his master and seemed to say to him, Come, come, a hundred and twenty fretzers for the strong box. That is the way to make a fortune. Another rood added to the vineyard. Another dish added to our supper. Another meat pie for the faithful Herzog. Let us look after the rich invalids and look after them, according to their purses. At that spot the old woman pauses. With her trembling finger she points out among the shadows of a reddish light. There is the house of Vort Cartiff, the herring salter. There, said the doctor. Yes, said the old woman. Hurrah, cries the dog Hersoff. A sudden explosion from the Voglor shaken to its very base. A sheaf of lurid flame springs up to the zenith, forcing its way through the clouds. Dr. Trafalgus is hurled to the ground. He swears roundly, picks himself up, and looks about him. The old woman is no longer there. Has she disappeared through some fissure of the earth, or has she flown away on the wings of the mist? As for the dog, he is there still, standing on his hind legs, his jaws apart, his lantern extinguished. "'Nevertheless, we will go on,' mutters Dr. Trafalgus. The honest man has been paid his hundred and twenty fretzers, and he must earn them. Six. Only a luminous speck at the distance of half a kurtz. It is the lamp of the dying, perhaps of the dead. Of course, it is the herring salter's house. The old woman pointed to it with her finger. No mistake is possible. Through the whistling swishes and the dashing swashes, through the uproar of the tempest, Dr. Trafalgus tramps on with hurried steps. As he advances, the house becomes more distinct, being isolated in the midst of the landscape. It is very remarkable how much it resembles that of Dr. Trafalgus, the 6-4 of Lucktrop. The same arrangement of windows, the same little arched door. Dr. Trafalgus hastens on as fast as the gale allows him. The door is ajar. He has but to push it. He pushes it, he enters, and the wind roughly closes it behind him. The dog, Herzog, left outside, howls with intervals of silence. Strange. One would have said that Dr. Trafalgus had come back to his own house. And yet, he has not wandered. He has not even taken a turning. He is at Valcarnian, not at Lucktrop. And yet, here is the same low vaulted passage, the same wooden staircase with high barristers, worn away by the constant rubbing of hands. He ascends, he reaches the landing. Beneath the door a faint light filters through, as in 6-4. Is it a delusion? In the dimness he recognizes his room, the yellow sofa. On the right, the old chest of pearwood. On the left, the brass-bound strong box in which he intended to deposit his hundred and twenty fretzers. There, in his armchair with the leather cushions, there is his table with its twisted legs and on it, close to the expiring lamp, his pharmacopoeia, open at page 197. What is the matter with me? He murmurs. What is the matter with him? Fear. His pupils are dilated. His body is contracted, shriveled. An icy perspiration freezes his skin. Every hair stands on end. But hasten, for want of oil the lamp expires. And also the dying man. Yes, there is the bed. His own bed, with posts and canopy, as wide as it is long, shut in by heavy curtains. Is it possible that this is the pallet of a wretched herring salter? With a quaking hand, Dr. Trafalgus seizes the curtains. He opens them. 
he looks in. The dying man, his head uncovered, is motionless, as if at his last breath. The doctor leans over him. Ah, what a cry! To which outside responds an unearthly howl from the dog. The dying man is not the herring salter, Vort Cartiff. It is Dr. Trafalgus. It is he whom congestion has attacked. He himself. Cerebral apoplexy, with sudden accumulation of serosity in the cavities of the brain, with paralysis of the body on the side opposite that of the seat of the lesion. Yes, it is he who was sent for, and for whom a hundred and twenty fretzers have been paid. He who, from the hardness of heart, refuses to attend the herring salter. He who is dying. Dr. Trafalgus is like a madman. He knows himself lost. At each moment the symptoms increase. Not only all the functions of the organs slacken, but the lungs and the heart cease to act. And yet he has not quite lost consciousness. What can be done? Bleed. If he hesitates, Dr. Trafalgus is dead. In those days they still bled, and then, as now, medical men cured all those apoplectic patients who were not going to die. Dr. Trafalgus seizes his case, takes out his lancet, opens a vein in the arm of his double. The blood does not flow. He rubs his chest violently. His own breathing grows slower. He warms his feet with hot bricks. His own grow cold. Then his double lifts himself, falls back, and draws one last breath. Dr. Trafalgus, notwithstanding all that his science has taught him to do, dies beneath his own hands. 7. In the morning a corpse was found in the house 6-4, that of Dr. Trafalgus. They put him in a coffin and carried him with much pomp to the cemetery of Lucktrop, whither he had sent so many others in a professional manner. As to old Herzoff, it is said that to this day he haunts the country with his lantern alight and howling like a lost dog. I do not know if that be true, but strange things happen in Volsinia, especially in the neighborhood of Lucktrop. And again, I warn you not to hunt for that town on the map. The best geographers have not yet agreed as to its latitude, nor even as to its longitude. End of Dr. Trafalgus by Jules Verne From the Tomb by Guy de Maupassant Translated by E.C. Wagener This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org From the Tomb by Guy de Maupassant the guests filed slowly into the hotel's great dining hall and took their places. The waiters began to serve them leisurely, to give the tardy ones time to arrive and to save themselves the bother of bringing back the courses. And the old bathers, the yearly habitués with whom the season was far advanced, kept a close watch on the door each time it opened, hoping for the coming of new faces. New faces, the single distraction of all pleasure resorts. We go to dinner chiefly to canvass the daily arrivals, to wonder who they are, what they do, and what they think. A restless desire seems to have taken possession of us, a longing for pleasant adventures, for friendly acquaintances, perhaps for possible lovers. In this elbow-to-elbow -elbow life, our unknown neighbors become of paramount importance. Curiosity is piqued, sympathy on the alert, and the social instinct doubly active. We have hatreds for a week, friendships for a month, and view all men with the special eyes of watering place intimacy. Sometimes during an hour's shut after dinner, under the trees of the park where repels a healing spring, we discover men of superior intellect and surprising merit, and a month later have fully forgotten these new friends so charming at first sight. There too, more especially than elsewhere, serious and lasting ties are formed. We see each other every day. We learn to know each other very soon, and in the affection that springs up so rapidly between us, there is mingled much of the sweet abandon of old and tried intimates. And later on, how tender are the memories cherished of the first hours of this friendship, of the first communion in which the soul came to light, of the first glances that questioned and responded to the secret thoughts and interrogatories the lips have not dared yet to utter. 
of the first cordial confidence and delicious sensation of opening one's heart to someone who has seemed to lay bare to you his own. The very dullness of the hours as it were, the monotony of days all alike, but renders more complete the rapid budding and blooming of friendship's flower. That evening then, as on every evening, we awaited the appearance of unfamiliar faces. There came only two, but very peculiar ones, those of a man and a woman, father and daughter. They seemed to have stepped from the pages of some weird legend, and yet there was an attraction about them, albeit an unpleasant one, that made me set them down at once as the victims of some fatality. The father was tall, spare, a little bent, with hair blanched white, too white for his still young countenance, and in his manner and about his person, the sedate austerity of carriage that bespeaks the Puritan. The daughter was possibly some twenty-four or twenty-five years of age. She was very slight and emaciated, her exceedingly pale countenance bearing a languid, spiritless expression, one of those people whom we sometimes encounter, apparently too weak for the cares and tasks of life, too feeble to move or do the things that we must do every day. Nevertheless, the girl was pretty, with the ethereal beauty of an apparition. It was she, undoubtedly, who came for the benefit of the waters. They chanced to be placed at table immediately opposite to me, and I was not long in noticing that the father, too, had a strange affection. Something wrong about the nerves, it seemed. Whenever he was going to reach for anything, his hand with a jerky twitch described a sort of fluttering zigzag before he was able to grasp what he was after. Soon the motion disturbed me so much. I kept my head turned in order not to see it, but not before I had also observed that the young girl kept her glove on her left hand while she ate. Dinner ended. I went out as usual for a turn in the grounds belonging to the establishment. A sort of park, I might say, stretching clear to the little station of Auvergne Chatel Guyon, nestling in a gorge at the foot of the high mountain from which flowed the sparkling bubbling springs, hot from the furnace of an ancient volcano. Beyond us there, the domes, small extinct craters of which Chatel Guyon is the starting point, raised their serrated heads above the long chain, while beyond the domes came two distinct regions, one of them needle-like peaks, the other of bold precipitous mountains. It was very warm that evening, and I contented myself with pacing to and fro under the rustling trees, gazing at the mountains and listening to the strains of the band pouring from the casino, situated on a knoll that overlooked the grounds. Presently I perceived the father and daughter coming toward me with slow steps. I bowed to them, in that pleasant continental fashion with which one always salutes his hotel companions. The gentleman halted at once. Pardon me, sir, said he, but may I ask if you can direct us to a short walk, easy and pretty, if possible? Certainly, I answered, and offered to lead them myself to the valley through which the swift river flows, a deep narrow cleft between two great declivities, rocky and wooded. They accepted, and as we walked, we naturally discussed the virtue of the mineral waters. They had, as I had surmised, come there on his daughter's account. She has a strange malady, said he, the seat of which her physicians cannot determine. She suffers from the most inexplicable nervous symptoms. Sometimes they declare her ill of a heart disease, sometimes of a liver complaint, again of a spinal trouble. At present they attribute it to the stomach, that great motor and regulator of the body, this protean disease of a thousand forms, a thousand modes of attack. It is why we are here. I myself think it is her nerves. In any case it is sad. This reminded me of his own jerking hand. It may be hereditary, said I. Your own nerves are a little disturbed, are they not? Mine, he answered tranquilly. Not at all. I have always possessed the calmest nerves. Then suddenly, as if bethinking himself, for this, touching his hand, is not nerves, but the result of a shock, a terrible shock that I suffered once. Fancy it, sir, this child of mine has been buried alive. I could find nothing to say. I was dumb with surprise. Yes, he continued. Buried alive, but hear their story. It is not long. For some time past, Juliet had seemed affected with a disordered action of the heart. We were finally certain that the trouble was organic and feared the worst. One day it came. She was brought in lifeless dead. She had fallen dead while walking in the garden. 
Physicians came in haste, but nothing could be done. She was gone. For two days and nights, I watched beside her myself, and with my own hands placed her in her coffin, which I followed to the cemetery and so placed in the family vault. This was in the country, in the province of Lorraine. It had been my wish too that she should be buried in her jewels, bracelets, necklace and rings, all presents that I had given her, and in her first ball dress. You can imagine, sir, the state of my heart in returning home. She was all that I had left. My wife had been dead for many years. I returned, in truth half mad, shut myself alone in my room and fell into my chair dazed, unable to move, merely a miserable breathing wreck. Soon my old valet Prosper, who had helped him place Juliet in her coffin and lay her away for her last sleep, came in noiselessly to see if he could not induce me to eat. I shook my head, answering nothing. He persisted. Monsieur is wrong. This will make him ill. Will Monsieur allow me then to put him to bed? No, no, I answered. Let me alone. He yielded and withdrew. How many hours passed, I don't know. What a night, what a night. It was very cold. My fire of logs had long since burned out in a great fireplace. And the wind. A wintry blast, charged with an icy frost, howled and screamed about the house and strained at my windows with a curiously sinister sound. Long hours, I say, rolled by. I sat still where I had fallen, prostrated, overwhelmed, my eyes wide open, but my body strengthless, dead, my soul drowned in despair. Suddenly the great bell gave a loud peal. I gave such a leap that my chair cracked under me. The slow solemn sound rang through the empty house. I looked at the clock. It was two in the morning. Who could be coming at such an hour? Twice again the bell pulled sharply. The servants would never answer, perhaps never hear it. I took up a candle and made my way to the door. I was about to demand, who is there? But ashamed of the weakness, nerved myself and drew back the bolts. My heart throbbed, my pulse beat. I threw back the panel brusquely and there, in the darkness, saw a shape like a phantom dressed in white. I recoiled, speechless with anguish, stammering, Who? Who are you? A voice answered, It is I, father. It was my child, Juliet. Truly I thought myself mad. I shuddered, shrinking backward before the specter as it advanced, gesticulating with my hand toward of the apparition. It is that gesture which has never left me. Again the phantom spoke. Father, father, see. I'm not dead. Someone came to rob me of my jewels. They cut off my finger and the flowing blood revived me. And I saw then that she was covered with blood. I fell to my knees panting, sobbing, laughing all in one. As soon as I regained my senses, but still so bewildered, I scarcely comprehended the happiness that had come to me. I took her in my arms, carried her to a room and rang frantically for Prosper, to rekindle the fire, bring a warm drink for her and go for the doctor. He came running entered, gazed a moment at my daughter in the chair, gave a gasp of fright and horror and fell back dead. It was he who had opened the vault, who had wounded and dropped my child and then abandoned her, for he could not efface all trace of his deed, and he had not even taken the trouble to return the coffin to its niche, sure besides of not being suspected by me who trusted him so fully. We are truly very unfortunate people, monsieur. He was silent. Meanwhile the night had come on enveloping in the gloom the still and solitary little valley. A sort of mysterious dread seemed to fall upon me in presence of these strange beings. This corpse came to life and this father with his painful gestures. Let us return, said I. The night has grown chill. And still in silence, we retraced our steps back to the hotel. I shortly afterward returned to the city and lost all further knowledge of the two peculiar visitors to my favorite summer resort. End of From the Tomb Ghost of Buckstown Inn by Arnold M. Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Ghost of Buckstown Inn by Arnold M. Anderson Several travel-worn drummers sat in the lobby exchanging yarns. It was Rodney Green's turn, and he looked wise and began his tale. 
I don't claim by any means that the belief in ghosts is a general thing in Arkansas, but I do say that I had an experience out there a few years ago. It was late in the fall, and I happened to be in the village of Buckstown, which desecrates a very limited portion of the estate. The town is about as small and dirty a place as ever I saw, and the Buckstown Inn is not much above the general character of the place. The region is inhabited by natives who still cling to all sorts of foolish superstitions. The inn in the antebellum days was kept by one who was said to be the meanest and most corrupt of mortals. The old demon was as miserly as he was mean, and all his narrow life he hoarded his filthy lucre with fiendish greed. Report had it also that he had even murdered his patrons in their beds for their money. What the facts actually were I don't know, but even to this day the old inn is held in suspicion. A lingering effect of former horrors still clouds its memory. The present proprietor, Bank Watson, his real name is Bunker, I believe, is an altogether different sort of chap. A southern type, in fact. One of those shiftless, heatless, happy-go-lucky mortals who love strong whiskey and who chews an enormous quid of black tobacco and smokes a corncob pipe at the same time. When the former keeper shuffled off, his property fell to a distant relative, the present keeper, who, with his family, immediately moved in from a neighboring hamlet and took possession. It was well known that the old proprietor had accumulated considerable wealth during his sojourn among the living, but all efforts to discover any treasure upon the premises had failed, and now the idea of ever finding it was practically given up. As far as Bunk was concerned, the matter troubled him little. He had a hard-working wife who ran things the best she could under the circumstances, and saw that his meals were forthcoming at their respective intervals. What more could he wish? Why should he care if there was a treasure buried upon his place? Indeed, it would have been a sore puzzle for him to know what to do with a fortune, unless perhaps his wife came to his aid. Among the stories that hovered in the history of the Buckstown Inn was one which involved a ghost. In the room where the former keeper had died, peculiar noises were heard at unearthly hours. Sighing, moaning, and in fact all the other indications which point to the existence of ghosts were said to be present. On account of this, the chamber had long since been abandoned. I listened with keen interest to the wonderful tales about the haunted room, and then suddenly resolved to investigate, to sleep in that chamber that very night and see for myself all that was to be seen. I told Bank of my purpose. He shook his head, shrugged his shoulders. But instead of warning me and offering a flood of protest as I expected, he merely took his pipe from his mouth, let fly a quart or so of yellowish juice from between a pair of brown stained lips, and opening one corner of his white mouth, lazily called out, Jane! His wife appeared, and he intimated that I should settle the matter with the old woman. The prospect of a fee persuaded the wife, and off she went to arrange for my bed in that ill-fated room. At nine o'clock that evening, I bid the family good night, took my candle, ascended the rickety stairs, and entered the chamber of horrors. The atmosphere was heavy, and had a peculiar odor that was not at all pleasing. However, I latched the door and was soon in bed. Having propped myself up with pillows, I was prepared to await the coming of the ghost. Overhead, the dusty rafters, which once had experienced the sensation of being whitewashed, but which were now a dirty yellowish color, were hung with a fantastic array of cobwebs. The flickering light of the candle reflected upon the walls and against the ceiling a pyramid of grotesque shapes, and with this effect being continually disturbed by the swaying cobwebs, the whole caused the room to appear rather ghostly after all, and especially so to an imaginative mind. I waited and waited, for hours it seemed, but still no ghost. Perhaps it was afraid of my candlelight, so I blew it out. No sooner had I done this and settled back in bed again, than a white hand appeared through the door. Then a whole figure, at last the ghost had come, a white hand sheeted ghost. It had come right through the door, although it was locked, and now it advanced towards the bed. Raising its long white arm, it pointed a bony finger at me and then commanded, Come with me. Thereupon it turned to the door. While instantly I jumped out of bed to follow, some unseen power compelled me to obey. The door flew open, and the ghost led me down the stairs, through long holes into the cellar, through mysterious underground corridors, upstairs again, in and out rooms which I never dreamed were to be found in that old rambling inn. Finally, through a small door in the rear we left the house. I was in my sleeping garments, but no matter I had to follow.
the white form with a slow and measured tread and as silent as death led the way into the orchard. There, under a tree at the farther end, it pointed to the ground, and in the same ghostly tones before used, said, Here you will find a great treasure buried. The ghost then disappeared and I saw it no more. I stood dazed and trembling. Upon recovering my wits I started to dig, but the chill of the night air and the scantiness of my night robes made such labor impracticable. So I decided to leave some mark to identify the place and come around again at daybreak. I reached up and broke off a limb. Overcome with my night's exertions, I slept the next morning, until a loud rapping on my door and a croaking voice warned me that it was noon. I had intended to leave Buckstown in that day, but prompted by curiosity and anxious to investigate, I unpacked my grip sack for a comfortable day. You must understand that this was my first experience with a ghost, and I feared I might never see another. At breakfast, my landlady waited on me in silence, though once I detected her eyes following me with a peculiar expression. She wanted to ask me how I enjoyed the night, but I would not gratify her by volunteering a word. My host was more outspoken. Reckon you didn't get much sleep, said he with a queer smile. Did you hear anything? I asked. Well, I did. Yes, he said with a drawl. But you didn't disturb me any. I knew you'd have trouble when you went in that room to sleep. That afternoon I slipped out to the tree, but to my amazement I found that the twig I had broken from the branches was gone. Finally I found under the lower trunk of an apple tree an open place from which a small branch had evidently been rested. But on looking further, I discovered that every apple tree in the orchard had been similarly disfigured. More mysterious than ever, I said, but tonight shall decide. That night I pleaded weariness, which no one seemed inclined to question, and sought my couch earlier. Going to try it again? asked my host. Yes, and I'll stay all winter, but what I'll get even with that ghost, I said. That night I kept the candle burning until midnight, when I blew it out. Instantly the room was flooded with a soft light, and at the foot of the bed stood my ghost, the identical ghost of last night. Again the bony finger beckoned and the sepulchral voice whispered, Follow me. I sprang from the bed, but the figure darted ahead of me. It flew through the doorway and down the stairs, and I after it. At the foot of the staircase, an unseen hand reached forward and caught my foot, and I fell sprawling headlong. But in a second I was on my feet and pursuing the ghost. It had gained on me a few yards, but I was quicker. And just as we reached the outside door, I nearly touched its ropes. They sent a chill through my frame, and I nearly gave up the pursuit. As it passed through the doorway, it turned and gave me one look, and I caught the same malignant light in its eyes that I remembered from the night before. In the open orchard, I felt sure I could catch it, but my ghost had no intention of allowing me any such opportunity. To my disgust, it darted backward and into the house, slamming the door in my face. In my frenzy of fear and chagrin, I threw myself against the oaken door with such force that its rusty old hinges yielded, and I landed in the big front room of the inn, just in time to see the white scares of the ghost flit up the stairs. Upstairs I flew after it, and into an old chamber. There, huddled in a corner, I saw it. In the minute's delay, it had secured a light candle, and as I entered, it advanced to daunt me with bony armor praised to a great height. Quote, I cried, throwing my arms around the figure, and I had made the acquaintance of a real live ghost. The white robes fell, and I so revealed my hostess of Buckstown Inn. Next morning, when I threatened to call the police, she confessed to me that she masqueraded as a ghost to draw visitors to the out-of-the-way old place, and that she found its tale of being haunted highly profitable to her. End of Ghost of Buckstown Inn Goodbye, Dead Man, by Tom W. Harris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Madup had killed a man, so it was logical he should be punished. It was Danny who came up with the idea of leaving him with the prophecy. Goodbye, Dead Man, by Tom W. Harris.
It was Orly Matup's killing of the old lab technician that really made us hate him. Matup was a guard at the reactor installation at Bayless, Kentucky, where my friend Danny Hearn and I were part of the staff when the outsiders took everything over. In what godforsaken mountain hole they had found Matup, and how they got him to sell out to them, I don't know. He was an authentic human, though. You can tell an outsider. Matup and Danny and I were playing high-low jack the night Uncle Pete was killed, sitting on the wide walk, where Matup had a view of the part of the station he was responsible for. High-low jack is a backcountry card game. Danny had learned it in northern Pennsylvania, where he came from, and Matup loved the game. And they had taught it to me because the game is better three-handed. The evening session had been Danny's idea. I think he figured it might give him a line on Matup. On the night in question, Matup was on a week's losing streak and was in a foul humor. He was superstitious, and he had called for a new deck twice that evening, and walked around his seat four different times. His bidding was getting wilder. You'd better cool down, Danny told him. Thing to do is ride out the bad luck, not fight it. Orley picked his nose and looked at his cards. Bid four, he growled. Four is the highest possible bid. Tim played his cards well, and he had good ones. He had sewed up three of his points when we heard somebody moving around down at the reactor floor. It was old Uncle Pete Barker, one of the technicians. What do you want down there? bawled Matup. Just left my cap by the control room, said Uncle Pete, and thought I'd go and get it. You keep the hell away from there, grunted Matup. Uncle Pete stopped and stood gazing up at us. We went on playing. It was the last card of the hand and would either win the game for Matup or lose it for him. Orley slapped his card down. It was a critical card, the jack. Danny took it with a queen, and Matup had lost the game. I felt like clearing out. Matup's face was purple, and his eyes looked like wolves' eyes. He glared at Danny, making a noise in his throat, and then I saw his gaze leave Danny and go to something down by the reactor. It was Uncle Pete, shuffling toward the control room. Matup didn't say a word. He stood up and unholstered the thing the outsiders had given him and pointed it at Uncle Pete. There was a ringing in our ears, and Uncle Pete began to twist. Something inside him twisted him, twisting inside his arms, his legs, head, trunk, even his fingers. It was only for a few seconds. Then the ringing stopped, and Uncle Pete sunk to the ground, and there was silence and the smell. Madame made us leave the body there until we had played two more hands. Danny won one. He was a man with good nerves. When we went back to our room, he said, That did it. I'm going to get that guy. I hate his big guts, I said, buttoning my pajama shirt. But how are you going to get him? I'll get him, said Danny. Meanwhile, we'll keep playing cards. Things went on almost normally at the Bayless reactor. It was a privately owned pool-type reactor, and we were sent samples of all sorts of materials for irradiation from all over the country. Danny was one of the irradiation men. I generally handled controlling. The outsiders had filled the place with telescreens and guards, and all the mail was opened. But there was no real interference with the work. I began to worry a little about Danny. Almost every afternoon he spent an hour alone in our room, with the door closed. Madup kept getting worse. An animal with power. He used to go hunting with that damnable outsider weapon 
although the meat killed with it wasn't fit to eat and he used it on birds until there wasn't one left anywhere near the plant he never killed a bluebird though he said it was bad luck sometimes he drank moonshine corn liquor usually alone because the outsiders wouldn't touch it but sometimes he made some of us drink with him watching sharply to see that we didn't poison him and craftily picking his nose when he was drunk he was abusive one night we were in our room dead for sleep after a long game and danny said let me show you something he shuffled the cards i cut and he dealt me an ace king queen jack ten and deuce of spades he shuffled again and dealt me the same in hearts watch as closely as you can he grinned see if you can catch me i couldn't i've been practicing he said i'm gonna get mad up what good will it do to beat him in cards you'll only make him sore i was relieved to learn what danny had been doing alone in our room but this card sharp angle didn't make much sense to me who says i'm going to beat him at cards smiled danny by the way did you hear the rumor they're going to break up the staff outsider policy send us to oak ridge aragon shipping port send new people down here that doesn't leave you much time i said time enough said danny the next night madup began a fantastic streak of luck it seemed he couldn't lose and he was as unpleasant a winner as he was a loser you boys don't know what card playing is he gloat think you're pretty smart with all that science stuff but you can't win a plain old card game you know why you can't beat me boys because you're too smart i guess said danny well yeah and something else i dip my hands in spunk water up on the mountain where you can never find it and besides that i spit on every card in the deck and wiped it off can't lose now for saving my life maybe you're right said danny and went on dealing a few days later the rumor of moving was confirmed i was being sent to oak ridge danny to aragon madup kept winning and suggested that we raise the stakes by the day we were to leave we owed him every cent we had i paid up soberly i wouldn't give madup any satisfaction by complaining it looked as though Danny wasn't going to get mad up after all. But Danny surprised me. Look, Buster, he wheeled. If I pay you seventy-five bucks, I won't have a cent left. How about me paying half now and the rest later? No good, said mad up. You got it. Pay me. If you can't pay cash, give me your watch. I know you got one. Look, Buster quit calling me buster what am i going to live on until i get paid again what do i care it went on like that until the buses for the airport were nearly ready to leave and both men seemed angry enough to kill each other let's go i begged danny pay him and leave all right then danny snapped and pulled out his wallet he counted out all his bills into Madup's hands. You're a buck short, said Madup. Why not forget the buck, said Danny. You could spare it. You're a buck short, repeated Madup, scowling. Danny dashed his wallet to the ground. You're even taking my change. He got his jacket from the back of the chair. It was a hot day. And emptied the change from the side pocket. There were two quarters and a half dollar, and he paid them over. I've got eleven cents left, he said. Hell, take that too. I don't give a damn. Madup grinned. Sure, I'll take it, if you weren't lying when you said I could have it. It'll break me, said Danny. I know it, said Madup. Gonna break your promise? The bus driver was honking. 
the hell with you said danny to madup and gave him a dime and a penny he looked madup in the eye with a strange expression now i give you that and you didn't win it you took it of your own free will i offered it and you took it right right said madup sucker we scrambled on the bus and as it pulled away danny yelled hey buster look madup looked and danny stuck his right arm out the window pointing at madup with his right forefinger and his little finger stuck out straight and parallel the thumb tucked under a strange disturbed look came over orley he turned his back as the bus roared out of the drive at the airport danny popped into a phone booth and got orley on the line nobody seemed to care either outsiders or guards and he let me listen spend your money yet dead man purred danny what you mean dead man gruffed orley's voice you crazy or something you know that eleven cents extra you took gloated danny it's gonna kill you buster for killing uncle pete and for everything else you've done i know i've been talking nice to uncle pete you're a dead duck orley met up dead that's i don't believe it it's baloney i'm going to spend the eleven cents and get rid of it you do exactly that buster i locked the curse on it and i made the sign on you and you have to keep that eleven cents for the rest of your life if you spend it or if you lose it and you will lose it that's the end of you i'll come out there and pound the hell out of you yelled madup too late buster our planes are leaving goodbye dead man and we had to run for our planes danny's pitch sounded pretty weak to me even though orley was superstitious but i didn't get to tell danny that until five years later i think i got him said danny you don't know the whole thing the hotel clerk had been listening you mean orley met up the guard he got sick and said he had a hex on him and took off one day and a lot later they found him up on the mountain he was dead any money on him asked danny just some change they buried it with him they heard the hex was located into the money congratulations i told danny i didn't think it'd work you scared him to death not quite said danny i scared him into hanging on to the money that money would have killed anybody that carried it much longer than the few minutes i handled it i'd been keeping the stuff in the reactor beam tubes it was radioactive as hell the end of goodbye dead man by tom w harris The Headless Spokesman by Irvin Mattock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. A Short and Terrible Tale of Murder. The Headless Spokesman by Irvin Mattock. For the sixth time, Slater looked at the clock on the shelf. He took the axe from his knees and tiptoed across the rough floor of the cabin to a door of the adjoining room. Listening intently, he heard the deep breathing of a drunken man sleeping within. Twenty minutes had passed now since his son Drayton and old settler Hurd had tottered across the big mess room of the hut and each gone, dead drunk, to his own room to sleep off the hooch they had guzzled. The three men had celebrated the lordly hall of pan gold they had washed from the river that winter. In little sacks the dust and pebbles of the precious metal were stacked under the boards of the mess-room floor. Slater had put up to his son the proposition of removing old Hurt, but the son had refused to kill, had even winced at being the accomplice to such an affair so old man slater gathered the three of them that night in a drinking bout he sipped tea from a bottle 
Slater had watched his son Drayton, who was unaware of his father's murderous plan, drink the hooch with settler hurt from the big jug until the two men were beyond their senses and had reeled to their separate bunk chambers. And now, the axe in his hands, Slater stood before old Hurt's door, listening. Why should Hurt have one-third of the gold, when Slater and his own boy could have each one half of it? What if Drayton was afraid to kill Hurt? A shot, a gun accidentally discharged, a razor-lipped axe falling from a bracket, and old Slater had chosen the axe. Twenty minutes was an ample time for a boozed man to be fast asleep. Slater was now inside Hurt's room, closing the door behind him as cautiously and soundlessly as he had opened it. The room was inky black with the darkness, but a bit of good fortune was with Slater. Through a tear in the window shade of heavy paper, a single strip of moonlight shone, and this fell straight across the sleeping bunk. The sleeper's face was turned from Slater, and the moon lay approximately on the sun-brown nape of the drunken man's neck, just below the unkempt fringe of hair on his head. Slater raised the keen axe to his shoulder and slipped toward the snoring man on the rough wooden bunk, to within a full swing of the weapon. Like a huge chalk mark, the moon drew its white death line across the sleeping man's neck and the next second a purplish froth bubbled in that line of light. Slater yanked the heavy axe from its dent in the bunk board. With another swing of the chopper, he left a blood-weltering slot between the head and the body. Then he stepped back to watch the gore from the torso mix with the oozing from the head arteries. A coagulating mass boiled and sputtered about the ribbon of moonlight, where Slater had struck and beheaded a man. Then Slater turned to re-enter the big mess room. He wanted to pull up the floorboards and estimate very carefully the gold, which now belonged half to himself and half to his son. Someone knocked outside on the door to the cabin. Slater viewed the decapitated body on the bunk, then stepped back to the mess room. He saw the bottle partially filled with brown liquid next to a fat-bellied jug on the table. He started to take these away when the knock on the door was repeated. Who's out there? Me, Slater. I just came up from the forks to borrow some of your flour. Slater opened the door and admitted Yank de Parrot, another prospector in the region who camped three miles downstream. De Parrot walked straight to the table with the jug and bottle and with a smile of greeting on his weathered face, he tipped the bottle to his lips and sucked one big mouthful from the neck, then turned and spouted the liquor from his teeth. Damn it! What a swill! Pew! Slater saw that De Parrot had taken a swig of the stale tea. That's tea, neighbor. Whiskey's in the jug. Tea? Yeah, I drink it sometimes. And do you bottle it? When I make too much at a time, yes. Slater fidgeted a bit, trying hard to conceal his agitation. In the dim light from the single oil lamp on a bracket near the fireplace, the men looked silently at each other, only as men can look at each other in company where gold is scratched from the earth and hidden again in rude huts where other men cannot find it. A door was banged shut in the cabin, and Slater stole a guarded glance in the direction of his son's bunk room. Then Duparrot laughed. I know you've got a fortune hidden here somewhere, but I'm not after it. Flour is what I want, and I'll test the jug, too. Duparrot put the nose of the jug to his lips, turned back his head, and let a few gulps of the hooch gurgle into his throat. That's more like it, the parrot exclaimed as he put down the whiskey, satisfied. Slater shifted uneasily. He tried with his nostrils to smell if there was a trace of gore in the cabin. Now, Slater, you let me have some flour, and I'll clean for home. My stuff's coming up from the post in three days, and I'll fetch it back to you then. 
and say, by the way, I dropped my axe into the slough this morning, and I'm out of wood. I see you're supplied for a time. Can you give me your chopper a few days? Slater went to the covered box in the mess room and dipped some flour with his hands into an empty cartridge box. He was trying to think of a way to get the axe cleaned in Hertz's room before handing it to De Parrot. Why, here was an opportunity. The devil spawned a scheme in the prospector's brain. De Parrot, here in Hertz's cabin, just after the murder, his wheel tracks in the mud, the axe red with Hertz's blood, found in De Parrot's wagon. They weren't so technical up here in the pan country. Everybody knew that Du Parrot was poor, and that there was gold aplenty in Hertz's cabin. The axe and the murder and Du Parrot's wagon tracks. It would look mighty funny. A smile crept through Slater's countenance, but died before it reached his eyes. Sure thing, Du Parrot. You can have my axe as soon as I tie up this box. By George, there's no string in the house. I strung it all up on a nail out in the stable. Take the lamp out and get me a couple of pieces for this box. I'll put the axe in your wagon while you're gone. De Parrot took the oil lamp from its bracket and went to the stable for the length of string. Slater made sure De Parrot was far enough toward the stable not to catch sight of the smear on the axe blade when he should run out with it to the wagon and put it under the seat. In the darkness, Slater ran to Hurt's door. As he opened it, he looked instantly toward the bunk where he had left the murdered man bleeding. Settler Hurt's body was gone from the bunk. In the full glare of the moon, now that the paper shade had been torn away from the window, Slater saw a pool of black, glistening matter stain the bunk boards at about the spot where a man's head would have been severed with the axe. But the bunk was unoccupied. Slater backed through the door, away from Hertz's room. As he reached the center of the mess room, Hertz's voice came deeply with a grave tremor from the shadowy doorway of the sleeping chamber. Milton Slater! Du Parrot, returning now from the stable, the chimney lamp flickering in the wind, called to Slater as he neared the door of the cabin. There ain't no string out there, Slater. Milton Slater, Settler Hurd's deep-toned voice boomed again in the darkness. Du Parrot came in and put the lamp on the table. He saw Slater in the middle of the room, pale and trembling. Then Du Parrot looked toward the doorway from which Settler Hurt had just called. In that oblong of darkness, the light from the smoking lamp chimney dimly lighting the gruesome thing, stood a headless body. It dangled heavily and awkwardly, as if weary from being propped up on its limp, rubbery legs. The top of the neck, a raw stump, budding up from the bloody-shirted shoulders, was a horrible mass. A giant mushroom, it seemed, with a pastry coagulation of its lifeblood swollen and fringed about the headless stump. Just beyond the door, the awful thing swayed unsteadily, and then from its invisible throat came Settler Hurt's stentorian voice. Milton Slater, I have returned from the dead. I have come back from hell, from my bunk where you slew me. I have risen to accuse you of murder. Du Parrot saw Slater fall to his knees, saw his face turn stony, and his body shiver with a terror that transformed the brawny prospector to an abject, shriveling coward. Milton Slater! Hurt's words came as if from the pit of a grave. I come to throw the proof of your crime at your feet, here, in the presence of one who will see that you are punished. Milton Slater, stand up. Slater was groveling now, clutching at the floor as one saving himself from drowning. Milton Slater, the headless body shouted, stand up. 
This is your hour of judgment. Terrorized, Duperret helped Slater. Slowly the man raised himself from the floor, but shut his eyes, put his arms before them, and stood shuddering against the far wall of the messroom, straight across from the specter that confronted him. Look at me, the headless corpse commanded. Slater kept his eyes covered. Milton Slater, you coward! Look at me now! The man took his arms from his face, but held his eyes shut. Look at me! the headless specter screamed. Slowly, Slater opened his eyes and gazed at the awful thing. Then he picked at his face with ungoverned hands. Put down your hands, Slater, the decapitated corpse shouted. I can see you without my head. Put down your hands. Slater put his weaving arms down at his side. Duperret beheld the sinister tableau. Then the voice of Settler Hurt boomed forth again with a finality of conviction. Milton Slater, now you shall be punished. Stand still and look. A moment of silence hung in the dimly lit cabin door. Then an axe swung out from Hertz's room. Through the air it flew, and clattered to the floor at Slater's feet. That's the axe you killed me with, Slater. Let Duperret use it, but ask him first if he wants an axe that you swung clear through my neck. Through this neck you see now. Ask him, Slater. Duperret saw the brown stain on the axe wedge. Another minute of silence ensued. Then Slater put up a whimper. Suddenly, a spherical thing, a lopsided ball with a matting of hair, was shot out over the headless body. From the doorway of Hurt's chamber it came, flying straight at Slater. The thing hit with a thud on the wall just above Slater's head. Then it came down, bounced on Slater's shoulder, and bumped to the floor. As the unwieldy shape hit the hard floorboards, it split open like a melon. Duperret cried out, Slater, for Christ's sake, that's Drayton's head on the floor. That's your son's head, Slater. Slater shrieked and covered his eyes. When Duperret again looked toward the doorway, the headless corpse was on the floor. Settler Hurt, gigantic, black with rage, his knotted arms bare and menacing, stood in the messroom beside the body. Slater was on the floor whining, clutching the hair of his son's shattered head. Then Settler Hurt let loose his words. Duperret, he wanted the gold for his son and himself. He got us drunk tonight, drank some fake booze, tea or coffee, himself. I and his son were so full of hooch, we got our own room doors mixed. Drayton went into my room, and I into his. I woke up and saw my mistake. Going through the door between our chambers, in my own room, I found Drayton's body on my bunk, his head severed. I tore down the paper shade to make sure I wasn't shaky from the hooch, and there I found Slater's axe. Then I knew Slater meant to kill me, and killed his son. It sobered me, that did. After I heard you were here, I did the rest with Drayton's body in the doorway. And now, Slater! Hurt curled his lips for a final imprecation upon the murderer, but the sight before him stifled speech. Old Slater, brushing his son's head, was singing a soft lullaby with a breaking tune that betrayed departing reason. Fondling the horrid shape, he planted a kiss on his son's ghastly lips. Settler Hurt groped for the whiskey jug, 
and gulped as he watched the man on the floor. Leave some for me, Du Parrot whispered, as he put his hands on the upturned jug. The end of The Headless Spokesman by Irvin Mattick Horror, a true tale by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Horror, a true tale by Anonymous. I was but 19 years of age when the incident occurred which has thrown a shadow over my life and, ah, me, how many and many a weary year has dragged by since then. Young, happy and beloved I was in those long-departed days. They said that I was beautiful. The mirror now reflects a haggard old woman with ashen lips and face of deadly pallor. But do not fancy that you are listening to a mere puling lament. It is not the flight of years that has brought me to be this wreck of my former self. Had it been so, I could have borne the loss cheerfully, patiently, as the common lot of all. But it was no natural progress of decay which has robbed me of bloom, of youth, of the hopes and joys that belong to youth, snapped the link that bound my heart to another's and doomed me to a lone old age. I try to be patient. But my cross has been heavy, and my heart is empty and weary, and I long for the death that comes so slowly to those who pray to die. I will try and relate, exactly as it happened, the event which blighted my life. Though it occurred many years ago, there is no fear that I should have forgotten any of the minutest circumstances. They were stamped on my brain too clearly and burningly like the brand of a red-hot iron. I see them written in the wrinkles of my brow, in the dead whiteness of my hair, which was a glossy brown once, and has known no gradual change from dark to gray, from gray to white, as with those happy ones who were the companions of my girlhood, and whose honored age is soothed by the love of children and grandchildren. But I must not envy them. I only mean to say that the difficulty of my task has no connection with want of memory. I remember, but too well. But as I take my pen, my hand trembles, my head swims. The old rushing faintness and horror comes over me again, and the well-remembered fear is upon me. Yet I will go on. This, briefly, is my story. I was a great heiress, I believe, though I cared little for the fact, but so it was. My father had great possessions and no son to inherit after him. His three daughters, of whom I was the youngest, were to share the broad acres among them. I have said, and truly, that I cared little for the circumstances, and indeed I was so rich then in health and youth and love that I felt myself quite indifferent to all else. The possession of all the treasures of earth could never have made up for what I had then, and lost, as I am about to relate. Of course, we girls knew that we were heiresses, but I do not think that Lucy and Minnie were any the prouder or the happier on that account. I know I was not. Reginald did not court me for my money. Of that, I felt assured. He proved it, heaven be praised, when he shrank from my side after the change. Yes, in all my lonely age, I can still be thankful that he did not keep his word, as some would have done did not clasp at the altar a hand he had learned to loathe and shudder at, because it was full of gold, much gold. At least he spared me that. And I know that I was loved, and the knowledge has kept me from going mad through many a weary day and restless night when my hot eyeballs had not a tear to shed, and even to weep was a luxury denied me. Our house was an old Tudor mansion. My father was very particular in keeping the smallest peculiarities of his home unaltered. Thus the many peaks and gables, the numerous turrets, and the mullioned windows with their quaint lozenge panes set in lead remained very nearly as they had been three centuries back. Over and above the quaint melancholy of our dwelling, with the deep woods of its park and the sullen waters of the mere, our neighborhood was thinly peopled and primitive and the people around us were ignorant and tenacious of ancient ideas and traditions. 
Thus, it was a superstitious atmosphere that we children were reared in, and we heard from our infancy countless tales of horror, some mere fables doubtless, others legends of dark deeds of the olden time, exaggerated by credulity and the love of the marvelous. Our mother had died when we were young, and our other parent being, though a kind father, much absorbed in affairs of various kinds, as an active magistrate and landlord, there was no one to check the unwholesome stream of tradition with which our plastic minds were inundated in the company of nurses and servants. As years went on, however, the old ghostly tales partially lost their effects and our undisciplined minds were turned more toward balls, dress, and partners, and other matters airy and trivial, more welcome to our riper age. It was at a country assembly that Reginald and I first met, met and loved. Yes, I am sure that he loved me with all his heart. It was not as deep a heart as some, I have thought in my grief and anger, but I never doubted its truth and honesty. Reginald's father and mine approved of our growing attachment, and as for myself, I knew I was so happy then that I look back on those fleeting moments as on some delicious dream. I now come to the change. I have lingered on my childish reminiscences, my bright and happy youth, and now I must tell the rest, the blight and the sorrow. It was Christmas, always a joyful and a hospitable time in the country, especially in such an old hall as our home, where quaint customs and frolics were much clung to, as part and parcel of the very dwelling itself. The hall was full of guests, so full indeed that there was great difficulty in providing sleeping accommodations for all. Several narrow and dark chambers in the turrets, mere pigeonholes as we irreverently called what had been thought good enough for the stately gentlemen of Elizabeth's reign, were now allotted to bachelor visitors, after having been empty for a century. All the spare rooms in the body and wings of the hall were occupied, of course, and the servants who had been brought down were lodged at the farm and at the keepers, so great was the demand for space. At last, the unexpected arrival of an elderly relative, who had been asked months before but scarcely expected, caused great commotion. My aunts went about wringing their hands distractedly. Lady Spelhurst was a personage of some consequence. She was a distant cousin and had been for years on cool terms with us all on account of some fancied affront or slight when she had paid her last visit about the time of my christening. She was 70 years old. She was infirm, rich, and testy. Moreover, she was my godmother, though I had forgotten the fact. But it seems that though I had formed no expectations of a legacy in my favor, my aunts had done so for me. Aunt Margaret was especially eloquent on the subject. There isn't room left, she said, and was ever anything so unfortunate. We cannot put Lady Speldhurst into our turrets, and yet where is she to sleep? And Rose's godmother, too. Poor dear child, how dreadful. After all these years of estrangement, and with a hundred thousand funds, and no comfortable warm room at her own unlimited disposal. And Christmas of all times in the year. What was to be done? My aunts could not resign their own chambers to Lady Speldhurst because they had already given them up to some of the married guests. My father was the most hospitable of men, but he was rheumatic, gouty, and methodical. His sisters-in-law dared not propose to shift his quarters, and indeed he would have far sooner dined on prison fare than have been translated to a strange bed. The matter ended in my giving up my room. I had a strange reluctance to making the offer, which surprised myself. Was it a boding of evil to come? I cannot say. We are strangely and wonderfully made. It may have been. At any rate, I do not think it was any selfish unwillingness to make an old and infirm lady comfortable by a trifling sacrifice. I was perfectly healthy and strong. The weather was not cold for the time of the year. It was a dark, moist yule, not a snowy one, though snow brooded overhead in the darkling clouds. I did make the offer, which became me, I said, with a laugh, as the youngest. My sisters laughed, too, and made jest of my evident wish to propitiate my godmother. She is a fairy godmother, Rosa, said Minnie, and you know she was affronted at your christening and went away muttering vengeance. Here she is coming back to see you. I hope she brings golden gifts with her. I thought little of Lady Speldhurst and her possible golden gifts. I cared nothing for the wonderful fortune in the funds that my aunts whispered and nodded about so mysteriously. But since then, I have wondered whether, had I then showed myself peevish or obstinate, had I refused to give up my room for the expected kinswoman, it would not have altered the whole of my life? But then Lucy or Minnie would have offered in my stead and been sacrificed. What do I say? Better that the blow should have fallen as it did than on those dear ones.
The chamber to which I removed was a dim little triangular room in the western wing and was only to be reached by traversing the picture gallery or by mounting a little flight of stone stairs which led directly upward from the low-browed arch of a door that opened into the garden. There was one more room on the same landing place, and this was a mere receptacle for broken furniture, shattered toys, and all the lumber that will accumulate in a country house. The room I was to inhabit for a few nights was a tapestry-hung apartment with faded green curtains of some costly stuff contrasting oddly with a new carpet and the bright, fresh hangings of the bed which had been hurriedly erected. The furniture was half old, half new, and on the dressing table stood a very quaint oval mirror in a frame of black wood, unpolished ebony, I think. I can remember the very pattern of the carpet, the number of chairs, the situation of the bed, the figures on the tapestry. Nay, I can recall not only the color of the dress I wore on that faded evening, but the arrangement of every scrap of lace and ribbon, of every flower, every jewel, with a memory but too perfect. Scarcely had my maid finished spreading out my various articles of attire for the evening, when there was to be a great dinner party, when the rumble of a carriage announced that Lady Spelters had arrived. The short winter's day drew to a close, and a large number of guests were gathered together in the ample drawing room around the blaze of the wood fire after dinner. My father, I recollect, was not with us at first. There were some squires of the old, hard-riding, hard-drinking stamp still lingering over their port in the dining room, and the host, of course, could not leave them. But the ladies and all the younger gentlemen, both those who slept under our roof and those who would have a dozen miles of fog and mire to encounter on their road home, were all together. Need I say that Reginald was there? He sat near me, my accepted lover, my plighted future husband. We were to be married in the spring. My sisters were not far off. They, too, had found eyes that sparkled and softened in meeting theirs, had found hearts that beat responsive to their own, and in their cases no rude frost nipped the blossom ere it became the fruit. There was no canker in their flowerets of young hope, no cloud in their sky. Innocent and loving, they were beloved by men worthy of their esteem. The room, a large and lofty one with an arched roof, had somewhat of a somber character from being wainscoted and sealed with polished black oak of a great age. There were mirrors, and there were pictures on the wall, and handsome furniture, and marble chimney pieces, and a gay tournay carpet, but these merely appeared as bright spots in the dark background of the Elizabethan woodwork. Many lights were burning, but the blackness of the walls and roof seemed absolutely to swallow up their rays like the mouth of a cavern. A hundred candles could not have given the apartment the cheerful lightness of a modern drawing room, but the gloomy richness of the panels matched well with the ruddy gleam from the enormous wood fire in which, crackling and glowing, now lay the mighty Yule log. Quite a blood-red luster poured forth from the fire and quivered on the walls and the groined roof. We had gathered round the vast antique hearth in a wide circle. The quivering light of the fire and candles fell upon us all, but not equally, for some were in shadow. I remember still how tall and manly and handsome Reginald looked that night, taller by the head than any there, and full of high spirits and gaiety. I, too, was in the highest spirits, never had my bosom felt lighter, and I believe it was my mirth that gradually gained the rest, for I recollect what a blithe, joyous company we seemed, all save one. Lady Speldhurst, dressed in gray silk and wearing a quaint headdress, sat in her armchair facing the fire, very silent, with her hands and her sharp chin propped on a sort of ivory-handled crutch that she walked with, for she was lame, peering at me with half-shut eyes. She was a little, spare old woman with very keen, delicate features of the French type. Her gray silk dress, her spotless lace, old-fashioned jewels, and prim neatness of array were well suited to the intelligence of her face, with its thin lips and eyes of a piercing black, undimmed by age. Those eyes made me uncomfortable in spite of my gaiety as they followed my every movement with curious scrutiny. Still, I was very merry and gay. My sisters even wondered at my ever-ready mirth, which was almost wild in its excess. I have heard since then of the Scottish belief that those doomed to some great calamity become fey and are never so disposed for merriment and laughter as just before the blow falls. If ever mortal was fey, then I was so on that evening. Still, though I strove to shake it off, the pertinacious observation of old lady Speldhurst's eyes did make an impression on me of a vaguely disagreeable nature. Others, too, noticed her scrutiny of me, but set it down as a mere eccentricity of a person always reputed whimsical, to say the least of it. 
However, this disagreeable sensation lasted but a few moments. After a short pause, my aunt took her part in the conversation, and we found ourselves listening to a weird legend, which the old lady told exceedingly well. One tale led to another. Everyone was called on in turn to contribute to the public entertainment, and story after story always related the demonology and witchcraft succeeded. It was Christmas, the season for such tales, and the old room with its dusky walls and pictures and vaulted roof drinking up the light so greedily seemed just fitted to give effect to such legendary lore. The huge logs crackled and burned with glowing warmth. The blood-red glare of the Yule log flashed on the faces of the listeners and narrator, on the portraits, and the holly wreathed about their frames, and the upright old dame in her antiquated dress and trinkets, like one of the originals of the pictures, stepped from the canvas to join our circle. It threw a shimmering luster from an ominously ruddy hue upon the oaken panels. No wonder that the ghost and goblin stories had a new zest. No wonder that the blood of the more timid grew chill and curdled, that their flesh crept, that their hearts beat irregularly, and the girls peeped fearfully over their shoulders and huddled close together like frightened sheep and half fancied they beheld some impish and malignant face gibbering at them from the darkling corners of the old room. By degrees my high spirits died out, and I felt the childish tremors, long latent, long forgotten, coming over me. I followed each story with painful interest. I did not ask myself if I believed the dismal tales. I listened, and fear grew upon me, the blind, irrational fear of our nursery days. I am sure most of the other ladies present, young or middle-aged, were affected by the circumstances under which these traditions were heard, no less than by the wild and fantastic character of them. But with them the impression would die out next morning, when the bright sun should shine on the frosted boughs, and the rime on the grass, and the scarlet berries, and green spikelets of the holly, and with me... But, ah, what was to happen ere another day dawn? Before we had made an end to this talk, my father and the other squires came in, and we ceased our ghost stories, ashamed to speak of such matters before these newcomers, hard-headed, unimaginative men who had no sympathy with idle legends. There was now a stir and bustle. Servants were handing around tea and coffee and other refreshments. There was a little music and singing. I sang a duet with Reginald, who had a fine voice and good musical skill. I remember that my singing was much praised, and indeed I was surprised at the power and pathos of my own voice, doubtless due to my excited nerves and mind. Then I heard someone say to another that I was by far the cleverest of the squire's daughters, as well as the prettiest. It did not make me vain. I had no rivalry with Lucy and Minnie. But Reginald whispered some soft, fond words in my ear a little before he mounted his horse to set off homeward, which did make me happy and proud. And to think that the next time we met... But I forgave him long ago. Poor Reginald. And now shawls and cloaks were in request, and carriages rolled up to the porch, and the guests gradually departed. At last no one was left but those visitors staying in the house. Then my father, who had been called out to speak with the bailiff of the estate, came back with a look of annoyance on his face. A strange story I have been told, said he. There has been my bailiff to inform me of the loss of four of our choices ewes out of that little flock of South Downs I set such store by, and which arrived in the north but two months since, and the poor creatures have been destroyed in so strange a manner, for their carcasses are horribly mangled. Most of us uttered some expression of pity or surprise, and some suggested that a vicious dog was probably the culprit. It would seem so, said my father. It certainly seems the work of a dog, and yet all the men agree that no dog of such habits exists near us, where, indeed, dogs are scarce, excepting the shepherd's collies and the sporting dogs secured in yards. Yet the sheep are gnawed and bitten, for they show the marks of teeth. Something has done this and has torn their bodies wolfishly, but apparently it has been only to suck the blood, for little or no flesh is gone. How strange, cried several voices. Then some of the gentlemen remembered to have heard of cases when dogs addicted to sheep killing had destroyed whole flocks, as if in sheer wantonness, scarcely deigning to taste a morsel of each slain weather. My father shook his head. I have heard of such cases too, he said. But in this instance I am tempted to think the malice of some unknown enemy has been at work. The teeth of a dog have been busy, no doubt, but the poor sheep have been mutilated in a fantastic manner. As strange as horrible, their hearts in especial have been torn out and left at some paces off half gnawed. Also, the men persist that they found the print of a naked human foot in the soft mud of the ditch, and near it, this. 
and he held up what seemed a broken link of a rusted iron chain. Many were the ejaculations of wonder and alarm, and many enshrewed the conjectures, but none seemed exactly to suit the bearings of the case. And when my father went on to say that two lambs of the same valuable breed had perished in the same singular manner three days previously, and that they also were found mangled and gore-stained, the amazement reached a higher pitch. Old Lady Speldhurst listened with calm, intelligent attention, but joined in none of our exclamations. At length she said to my father, "'Try and recollect.' Have you no enemy among your neighbors? My father started and knit his brow. None that I know of, he replied. And indeed, he was a popular man and a kind landlord. The more lucky you, said the old dame with one of her grim smiles. It was now late, and we retired to rest before long. One by one, the guests dropped off. I was the member of the family selected to escort old lady Speldhurst to her room, the room I had vacated in her favor. I did not much like the office. I felt a remarkable repugnance to my godmother, but my worthy aunts insisted so much that I should ingratiate myself with one who had so much to leave that I could not but comply. The visitor hobbled up the broad oaken stairs actively enough, propped on my arm in her ivory crutch. The room never had looked more genial and pretty with its brisk fire, modern furniture, and the gay French paper on the walls. A nice room, my dear, and I ought to be much obliged to you for it, since my maid tells me it is yours, said her ladyship. But I am pretty sure you repent your generosity to me after all those ghost stories, and tremble to think of a strange bed and chamber, eh? I made some commonplace reply. The old lady arched her eyebrows. Where have they put you, child? she asked. In some cock loft of the turrets, eh? Or in a lumber room, a regular ghost trap? I can hear your heart beating with fear this very moment. You are not fit to be alone. I tried to call up my pride and laugh off the accusation against my courage, all the more, perhaps, because I felt its truth. Do you want anything more that I can get you, Lady Speldhurst? I asked, trying to feign a yawn of sleepiness. The old dame's keen eyes were upon me. I rather like you, my dear, she said. And I liked your mamma well enough before she treated me so shamefully about the christening dinner. Now, I know you're frightened and fearful, and if an owl should but flap your window tonight, it might drive you into fits. There is a nice little sofa bed in this dressing closet. Call your maid to arrange it for you, and you can sleep there snugly under the old witch's protection. And then no goblin dare harm you. Nobody will be a bit the wiser or quiz you for being afraid. How little I knew what hung in the balance of my refusal or acceptance of that trivial proffer had the veil of the future been lifted for one instant, but that veil is impenetrable to our gaze. I left her door. As I crossed the landing, a bright gleam came from another room whose door was left ajar. It, the light, fell like a bar of golden sheen across my path. As I approached, the door opened and my sister Lucy, who had been watching for me, came out. She was already in a white cashmere wrapper over which her loosened hair hung darkly and heavily like tangles of silk. Rosa, love, she whispered. Minnie and I can't bear the idea of you sleeping out there all alone in that solitary room. The very room, too, Nurse Sherrod used to talk about. So, as you know, Minnie has given up her room and come to sleep in mine. Still, we should so wish you to stop with us tonight at any rate, and I could make up a bed on the sofa for myself or you and... I stopped Lucy's mouth with a kiss. I declined her offer. I would not listen to it. In fact, my pride was up in arms, and I felt I would rather pass the night in the churchyard itself than accept a proposal dictated, I felt sure, by the notion that my nerves were shaken up by the ghostly lore we had been raking up, that I was a weak, superstitious creature, unable to pass a night in a strange chamber. So I would not listen to Lucy, but kissed her, bade her good night, and went on my way laughing to show my light heart. Yet, as I looked back in the dark corridor and saw the the friendly door still ajar, the yellow bar of light still crossing from wall to wall, the sweet, kind face still peering after me from amidst its clustering curls. I felt a thrill of sympathy, a wish to return, a yearning after human love and companionship. False shame was strongest and conquered. I waved a gay adieu. I turned the corner and, peeping over my shoulder, I saw the door close. The bar of yellow light was there no longer in the darkness of the passage. I thought at that instant that I heard a heavy sigh. I looked sharply around. No one was there. 
No door was open, yet I fancied, and fancied with a wonderful vividness, that I did hear an actual sigh breathed not far off, and plainly distinguishable from the groan of the sycamore branches as the wind tossed them to and fro in the outer blackness. If ever a mortal's good angel had caused to sigh for sorrow, not sin, mine had caused to mourn that night. But the imagination plays us strange tricks, and my nervous system was not overcomposed or very fitted for judicial analysis. I had to go through the picture gallery. I had never entered this apartment by candlelight before, and I was struck by the gloomy array of tall portraits, gazing moodily from the canvas on the lozenge-paned or painted windows, which rattled to the blast as it swept howling by. Many of the faces looked stern and very different from their daylight expression. In others, a furtive, flickering smile seemed to mock me as my candle illumined them, and in all the eyes, as usual with artistic portraits, seemed to follow my motions with a scrutiny and an interest the more marked for the apathetic immovability of the other features. I felt ill at ease under this stony gaze, though conscious how absurd were my apprehensions, and I called up a smile and an air of mirth, more as if acting apart under the eyes of human beings than of their mere shadows on the wall." I even laughed as I confronted them. No echo had my short-lived laughter but from the hollow armor and arching roof, and I continued on my way in silence. By a sudden and not uncommon revulsion of feeling, I shook off my aimless terrors, blushed at my weakness, and sought my chamber only too glad that I had been the only witness of my late tremors. As I entered the chamber, I thought I heard something stir in the neglected lumber room, which was the only neighboring apartment. But I was determined to have no more panics, and resolutely shut my eyes to this slight and transient noise, which had nothing unnatural in it, for surely, between rats and wind, an old manor house on a stormy night needs no sprites to disturb it. So I entered my room and rang for my maid. As I did so, I looked around me, and a most unaccountable repugnance to my temporary abode came over me in spite of my efforts. It was no more to be shaken off than a chill is to be shaken off when we enter some damp cave and rely upon it. The feeling of dislike and apprehension with which we regard at first sight certain places and people was not implanted in us without some unwholesome purpose. I grant it is irrational, mere animal instinct, but is not instinct God's gift, and is it for us to despise it? It is by instinct that children know their friends from their enemies, that they distinguish with such unerring accuracy between those who like them and those who only flatter and hate them. Dogs do the same. They will fawn on one person, they slink snarling from another. Show me a man whom children and dogs shrink from, and I will show you a false bad man. Lies on his lips and murder at his heart. No, let none despise the heaven-sent gift of innate antipathy, which makes the horse quail when the lion crouches in the thicket, which makes the cattle scent the shambles from afar, and low in terror and disgust as their nostrils snuff the blood-polluted air. I felt this antipathy strongly as I looked around me in my new sleeping room, and yet I could find no reasonable pretext for my dislike. A very good room it was, after all, now that the green damask curtains were drawn, the fire burning bright and clear, candles burning on the mantelpiece, and the various familiar articles of toilet arranged as usual. The bed, too, looked peaceful and inviting, a pretty little white bed, not at all the gaunt funereal sort of couch which haunted apartments generally contain. My maid entered and assisted me to lay aside the dress and ornaments I had worn and arranged my hair as usual, prattling the while in Abigail fashion. I seldom cared to converse with servants, but on that night a sort of dread of being left alone, a longing to keep some human being near me possessed me, and I encouraged the girl to gossip so that her duties took half an hour longer to get through than usual. At last, however, she had done all that could be done, and all my questions were answered, and my orders for the morrow reiterated and vowed obedience to, and the clock on the turret struck one. Then Mary, yawning a little, asking if I wanted anything more, and I was obliged to answer no, for very shame's sake, and she went. The shutting of the door, gently as it was closed, affected me unpleasantly. I took a dislike to the curtains, the tapestry, the dingy pictures, everything. I hated the room. I felt a temptation to put on a cloak, run half-dressed to my sister's chambers, and say I had changed my mind and come for shelter. But they must be asleep, I thought, and I could not be so unkind as to wake them. I said my prayers with unusual earnestness and a heavy heart. I extinguished the candles and was just about to lay my head on my pillow when the idea seized me that I could fasten the door. 
The candles were extinguished, but the firelight was amply sufficient to guide me. I gained the door. There was a lock, but it was rusty or hampered. My utmost strength could not turn the key. The bolt was broken and worthless. Balked of my intention, I consoled myself by remembering that I had never had need of fastenings yet and returned to my bed. I lay awake for a good while, watching the red glow of the burning coals in the grate. I was quiet now and more composed. Even the light gossip of the maid, full of petty human cares and joys, had done me good, diverted my thoughts from brooding. I was on the point of dropping asleep when I was twice disturbed, once by an owl hooting in the ivy outside, no unaccustomed sound, but harsh and melancholy, once by a long and mournful howling set up by the mastiff chained in the yard beyond the wing I occupied. A long-drawn, lugubrious howling was this latter, and much such a note as the vulgar declared to herald a death in the family. This was a fancy I had never shared, but yet I could not help feeling that the dog's mournful moans were sad and expressive of terror, not at all like his fierce, honest bark of anger, but rather as if something evil and unwanted were abroad. But soon I fell asleep. How long I slept I never knew. I awoke at once with that abrupt start which we all know well and which carries us in a second from utter unconsciousness to the full use of our faculties. The fire was still burning, but was very low, and half the room or more was in deep shadow. I knew, I felt, that some person or thing was in the room, although nothing unusual was to be seen by the feeble light. Yet it was a strange sense of danger that had aroused me from slumber. I experienced, while yet asleep, the chill and shock of sudden alarm, and I knew, even in the act of throwing off sleep like a mantle, why I awoke, and that some intruder was present. Yet, though I listened intently, no sound was audible, except the faint murmur of the fire, the dropping of a cinder from the bars, the loud, irregular beating of my own heart. Notwithstanding this silence, by some intuition I knew that I had not been deceived by a dream, and felt certain that I was not alone. I waited. My heart beat on, quicker, more sudden grew its pulsations, as a bird in a cage might flutter in presence of the hawk, and then I heard a sound, faint, but quite distinct, the clank of iron, the rattling of a chain. I ventured to lift my head from the pillow. Dim and uncertain as the light was, I saw the curtains of my bed shake and caught a glimpse of something beyond, a darker spot in the darkness. This confirmation of my fears did not surprise me so much as it shocked me. I strove to cry aloud, but could not utter a word. The chain rattled again, and this time the noise was louder and clearer. But though I strained my eyes, they could not penetrate the obscurity that shrouded the other end of the chamber whence came the sullen clanking. In a moment, several distinct trains of thought, like many colored strands of thread twining into one, became palpable to my mental vision. Was it a robber? Could it be a supernatural visitant? Or was I the victim of a cruel trick such as I had heard of and which some thoughtless persons loved to practice on the timid, reckless of its dangerous results? And then a new idea with some ray of comfort in it suggested itself. There was a fine young dog of the Newfoundland breed, a favorite of my father's, which was usually chained by night in an outhouse. Neptune might have broken loose, found his way to my room, and finding the door imperfectly closed, have pushed it open and entered. I breathed more freely as this harmless interpretation of the noise forced itself upon me. It was, it must be, the dog, and I was distressing myself uselessly. I resolved to call to him. I strove to utter his name. Neptune, Neptune, but a secret apprehension restrained me, and I was mute. Then the chain clanked nearer and nearer to the bed, and presently I saw a dusky, shapeless mass appear between the curtains on the opposite side to where I was lying. How I longed to hear the whine of the poor animal that I hoped might be the cause of my alarm. But no, I heard no sound save the rustle of the curtains and the clash of the iron chains. Just then, the dying flame of the fire leaped up, and with one sweeping hurried glance I saw that the door was shut and... Horror! It is not the dog. It is the semblance of a human form that now throws itself heavily on the bed, outside the clothes, and lies there, huge and swart in the red gleam that treacherously died away after showing so much to a fright, and sinks into dull darkness. There was now no light left, though the red cinders yet glowed with a ruddy gleam like the eyes of wild beasts. The chain rattled no more. I tried to speak, to scream wildly for help, 
My mouth was parched, my tongue refused to obey. I could not utter a cry, and indeed, who could have heard me, alone as I was in that solitary chamber, with no living neighbor, and the picture gallery between me and any aid that even the loudest, most piercing shriek could summon? And the storm that howled without would have drowned my voice, even if help had been at hand. To call aloud, to demand who was there, alas, how useless, how perilous! If the intruder were a robber, my outcries would but goad him to fury. But what robber would act thus? As for a trick, that seemed impossible. And yet, what lay by my side, now wholly unseen? I strove to pray aloud as there rushed on my memory a flood of weird legends, the dreaded yet fascinating lore of my childhood. I had heard and read of the spirits of the wicked men forced to revisit the scenes of their earthly crimes, of demons that lurked in certain accursed spots, of the ghoul and vampire of the East, stealing amidst the graves they rifled for their ghostly banquets. And then I shuddered as I gazed on the blank darkness where I knew it lay. It stirred, it moaned hoarsely, and again I heard the chain clank close beside me, so close that it must almost have touched me. I drew myself from it, shrinking away in loathing and terror of the evil thing, what I knew not, but felt that something malignant was near. And yet, in the extremity of my fear, I dared not speak. I was strangely cautious to be silent, even in moving farther off, for I had a wild hope that it, the phantom, the creature, whichever it was, had not discovered my presence in the room. And then I remembered all the events of the night, Lady Speldhurst's ill-almond vaticinations, her half-warnings, her singular look as we parted, my sister's persuasions, my terror in the gallery, the remark that... This was the room Nurse Sherrod used to talk of. And then memory, stimulated by fear, recalled the long-forgotten past, the ill repute of this disused chamber, the sins it had witnessed, the blood spilled, the poison administered by unnatural hate within its walls, and the tradition which called it haunted. The green room. I remembered now how fearfully the servants avoided it, how it was mentioned rarely and in whispers when we were children, and how we regarded it as a mysterious region, unfit for mortal habitation. Was it, the dark form with the chain, a creature of this world, or a specter? And again, more dreadful still, could it be that the corpses of wicked men were forced to rise and haunt in the body the places where they had wrought their evil deeds? And was such as these my grisly neighbor? The chain faintly rattled. My hair bristled. My eyeballs seemed starting from their sockets. The damps of a great anguish were on my brow. My heart labored as if I were crushed beneath some vast weight. Sometimes it appeared to stop its frenzied beatings, and sometimes its pulsations were fierce and hurried. My breath came short and with extreme difficulty, and I shivered as if with cold, yet I feared to stir. It moved. It moaned. Its fetters clanked dismally. The couch creaked and shook. This was no phantom then, no air-drawn specter. But its very solidity, its palpable presence, were a thousand times more terrible. I felt that I was in the very grasp of what could not only affright but harm, of something whose contact sickened the soul with deathly fear. I made a desperate resolve. I glided from the bed. I seized a warm wrapper, threw it around me, and tried to grope with extended hands my way to the door. My heart beat high at the hope of escape, but I had scarcely taken one step before the moaning was renewed. It changed into a threatening growl that would have suited a wolf's throat, and a hand clutched at my sleeve. I stood motionless. The muttering growl sank to a moan again. The chain sounded no more, but still... The hand held its grip of my garment, and I feared to move. It knew of my presence then. My brain reeled, the blood boiled in my ears, and my knees lost all strength, while my heart panted like that of a deer in the wolf's jaws. I sank back, and the benumbing influence of excessive terror reduced me to a state of stupor. When my full consciousness returned, I was sitting on the edge of the bed, shivering with cold and barefooted. All was silent but I felt that my sleeve was still clutched by my unearthly visitant. The silence lasted a long time. Then followed a chuckling laugh that froze my very marrow and the gnashing of teeth as in demoniac frenzy and then a wailing moan, and this was succeeded by silence. 
Hours may have passed. Nay, though the tumult of my heart prevented my hearing a clock strike must have passed, but they seem ages to me. And how were they passed? Hideous visions passed before the aching eyes that I dared not close, but which gazed ever into the dumb darkness where it lay, my dread companion through the watches of the night. I pictured it in every abhorrent form from which an excited fancy could summon up, now as a skeleton with hollow eye holes and grinning fleshless jaws, now as a vampire with livid face and bloated form and dripping mouth wet with blood. Would it never be light? And yet, when day should dawn, I should be forced to see it face to face. I had heard that Spectre and Fiend were compelled to fade as morning brightened. But this creature was too real, too foul a thing of the earth to vanish at cockcrow. No, I should see it, the horror, face to face. And then the cold prevailed, and my teeth chattered, and shiverings ran through me, and yet there was the damp of agony on my bursting brow. Some instinct made me snatch at a shawl or cloak that lay on a chair within reach and wrap it around me. The moan was renewed, and the chain just stirred. Then I sank into apathy like an Indian at the stake in the intervals of torture. Hours fled by, and I remained like a statue of ice, rigid and mute. I even slept, for I remember that I started to find the cold gray light of an early winter's day was on my face, and stealing round the room from between the heavy curtains of the window. Shuddering, but urged by the impulse that rivets the gaze of the bird upon the snake, I turned to see the horror of the night. Yes, it was no fevered dream, no hallucination of sickness, no airy phantom unable to face the dawn. In the sickly light I saw it lying on the bed, with its grim head on the pillow. A man? Or a corpse arisen from its unhallowed grave and awaiting the demon that animated it? There it lay, a gaunt, gigantic form, wasted to a skeleton, half-clad, foul with dust and clotted gore, its huge limbs flung upon the couch as if at random, its shaggy hair streaming over the pillows like a lion's mane. His face was toward me. Oh, the wild hideousness of that face, even in sleep. In features it was human, even through its horrid mask of mud and half-dried bloody gouts, but the expression was brutish and savagely fierce. The white teeth were visible between the parted lips in a malignant grin. The tangled hair and beard were mixed in leonine confusion, and there were scars disfiguring the brow. Round the creature's waist was a ring of iron, to which was attached a heavy but broken chain, the chain I had heard clanking. With a second glance I noted that part of the chain was wrapped in straw to prevent its galling the wearer. The creature, I cannot call it a man, had the marks of fetters on its wrists, the bony arm that protruded through one tattered sleeve was scarred and bruised, the feet were bare and lacerated by pebbles and briars, and one of them was wounded and wrapped in a morsel of rag. And the lean hands, one of which held my sleeve, were armed with talons like an eagle's. In an instant the horrid truth flashed upon me. I was in the grasp of a madman. Better the phantom that scares the sight than the wild beast that rends and tears the quivering flesh, the pitiless human brute that has no heart to be softened, no reason at whose bar to plead, no compassion, not of man, save the form and the cunning. I gasped in terror. Ah! The mystery of those ensanguined fingers, those gory wolfish jaws, that face all besmeared with blackening blood is revealed. The slain sheep, so mangled and rent, the fantastic butchery, the print of the naked foot, all, all were explained, and the chain, the broken link of which was found near the slaughtered animals, it came from his broken chain. The chain he had snapped, doubtless, in his escape from the asylum where his raging frenzy had been fettered and bound, in vain, in vain. Ah, me, how had this grisly Samson broken manacles and prison bars, how had he eluded guardian and keeper in a hostile world, and come hither on his wild way, hunted like a beast of prey, and snatching his hideous banquet like a beast of prey, too. Yes, through the tatters of his mean and ragged garb, I could see the marks of the seventies, cruel and foolish, with which men in that time tried to tame the might of madness. The scourge, its marks were there, and the scars of the hard iron fetters, and many a cicatric and welt that told a dismal tale of hard usage. But now he was loose, free to play the brute, the baited, tortured brute that they had made him, now without the cage, and ready to gloat over the victims his strength should overpower. Horror! 
Horror! I was the prey, the victim already in the tiger's clutch, and a deadly sickness came over me. And the iron entered my soul, and I longed to scream, and was dumb. I died a thousand deaths as that morning wore on. I dared not faint. But words cannot paint what I suffered as I waited, waited till the moment when he should open his eyes and be aware of my presence, for I was assured he knew it not. He had entered the chamber as a lair, when weary and gorged with his horrid orgy, and he had flung himself down to sleep without a suspicion that he was not alone. Even his grasping of my sleeve was doubtless an act done betwixt sleeping and waking, like his unconscious moans and laughter in some fitful dream." Hours went on. Then I trembled as I thought that soon the house would be astir, that my maid would come to call me as usual and awake that ghastly sleeper, and might he not have time to tear me as he tore the sheet before any aid could arrive? At last what I dreaded came to pass. A light footstep on the landing. There is a tap at the door. A pause succeeds, and then the tapping is renewed, and this time more loudly. Then the madman stretched his limbs and uttered his moaning cry, and his eyes slowly opened, very slowly opened, and met mine. The girl waited a while, ere she knocked for the third time. I trembled lest she should open the door unbidden, see that grim thing, and bring about the worst. I saw the wondering surprise in his haggard, bloodshot eyes. I saw him stare at me half vacantly, then with a crafty yet wondering look, and then I saw the devil of murder begin to peep forth from those hideous eyes and the lips to part as in a sneer, and the wolfish teeth to bare themselves. But I was not what I had been. Fear gave me a new and a desperate composure, a courage foreign to my nature. I had heard of the best method of managing the insane. I could but try. I did try. Calmly, wondering at my own feigned calm, I fronted the glare of those terrible eyes. Steady and undaunted was my gaze, motionless my attitude. I marveled at myself, but in that agony of sickening terror I was outwardly firm. They sink, they quail, abash those dreadful eyes before the gaze of a helpless girl. And the shame that is never absent from insanity bears down the pride of strength, the bloody cravings of the wild beast. The lunatic moaned and drooped his shaggy head between his gaunt, squalid hands. I lost not an instant. I rose and with one spring reached the door, tore it open, and with a shriek rushed through, caught the wondering girl by the arm and crying to her to run for her life, rushed like the wind along the gallery, down the corridor, down the stairs. Mary's screams filled the house as she fled beside me. I heard a long-drawn raging cry, the roar of a wild animal mocked of its prey, and I knew what was behind me. I never turned my head. I flew rather than ran. I was in the hall already. There was a rush of many feet, an outcry of many voices, a sound of scuffling feet and brutal yells and oaths and heavy blows. And I fell to the ground crying, Save me! and lay in a swoon. I awoke from a delirious trance. Kind faces were around my bed. Loving looks were bent on me by all, by my dear father and dear sisters, but I scarcely saw them before I swooned again. When I recovered from that long illness, through which I had been nursed so tenderly, the pitying looks I met made me tremble. I asked for a looking-glass. It was long denied me, but my importunity prevailed at last, a mirror was brought. My youth was gone at one fell swoop. The glass showed me a livid and haggard face, blanched and bloodless as of one who sees a specter, and in the ashen lips and wrinkled brow and dim eyes I could trace nothing of my old self. The hair, too, jetty and rich before, was now as white as snow, and in one night the ravages of half a century had passed over my face. Nor have my nerves ever recovered their tone after that dire shock. Can you wonder that my life was blighted? that my lover shrank from me, so sad a wreck was I. I am old now, old and alone. My sisters would have had me to live with them, but I chose not to sadden their genial homes with my phantom face and dead eyes. Reginald married another. He has been dead many years. I never ceased to pray for him, though he left me when I was bereft of all. The sad weird is nearly over now. I am old and near the end and wishful for it. I have not been bitter or hard, but I cannot bear to see many people, and am best alone. 
I try to do what good I can with the worthless wealth Lady Speldhurst left me, for at my wish my portion was shared between my sisters. What need had I of inheritance? I, the shattered wreck made by that one night of horror. End of Horror, A True Tale The Lost Race by Robert E. Howard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Cecil, May 2023. Cora Rook glanced about him and hastened his pace. He was no coward, but he did not like this place. Tall trees rose all about, their sullen branches shutting out the sunlight. The dim trail led in and out among them, sometimes skirting the edge of a ravine where a core rook could graze down at the treetops beneath. Occasionally, through a rift in the forest, he could see a way to the forbidding hills that hinted of the ranges much farther to the west that were the mountains of Cornwall. In those mountains, the bandit chief, Baruch the Cruel, was supposed to lurk to descend upon such victims as might pass that way. Korobuk shifted his grip on his spear and quickened his step. His haste was due not only to the menace of the outlaws, but also to the fact that he wished once more to be in his native land. He had been on a secret mission to the wild Cornish tribesmen, and though he had been more or less successful, he was impatient to be out of their inhospitable country. It had been a long, wearisome trip, and he still had nearly the whole of Britain to traverse. He threw a glance of aversion about him. He longed for the pleasant woodlands, the scampering deer and chirping birds to which he was used. He longed for the tall white cliff where the blue sea lapped merrily. The forest through which he was passing seemed uninhabited. There were no birds, no animals, nor had he seen a sign of a human habitation. His comrades still lingered in the savage court of the Cornish king, enjoying his crude hospitality in no hurry to be away. But Colerbrook was not content, so he had left them to follow at their leisure and had set out alone. Rather a fine figure of a man, Colerbrook, some six feet in height, strongly though leanly built, he was with gray eyes, a pure Briton, but not pure Celt, his long yellow hair revealing in him all his race a trace of Belgae. He was clad in skillfully dressed deerskin, for the Celts had not yet perfected the coarse cloth which they had made the most of the race preferred the hides of deer. He was armed with a long bow of yew wood, made with no skill but with efficient weapon, a long bronze broadsword with a buckskin sheath, a long bronze dagger, and a small round shield rimmed with a band of bronze and covered with tough buffalo hide. A crude bronze helmet was on his head. Faint devices were painted on woad in his arms and cheeks. His beardless face was of the highest type of Britain, clear, straightforward, the shrewd, practical determination of the Nordic mingling with the reckless courage and dreamy artistry of the Celt. So Korruk strode the forest path warily, ready to flee or fight, but preferring to do neither just then. The trail led away from the ravine, disappearing around a great tree, and from the other side of the tree, Korruk heard sounds of conflict, gliding warily forward and wondering whether he should see some of the elves and dwarves that were reputed to haunt these woodlands, he peered around the great tree. A few feet from him he saw a strange tableau. Backed against another tree stood a large wolf at bay, blood trickling from gashes about his shoulders, while before him, crouching for a spring, the warrior saw a great panther. Korruk wondered at the cause of the battle. Not often the lords of the forest met in warfare, and he was puzzled by the gnarls of the great cat. Savage, bloodlusting, yet they held a strange note of fear, and a beast seemed hesitant to spring in. Just why Korruk chose to take the part of the wolf, he himself could not have said. Doubtless it was just the reckless chivalry of the Celt in him, an admiration for the dauntless attitude of the wolf against his far more powerful foe. Be that as it may, Korruk, characteristically forgetting his bow and taking the more reckless course, drew his sword and leaped in front of the panther but he had no chance to use it. The panther, whose nerve appeared to be already somewhat shaken, uttered a startled screech and disappeared among the trees so quickly that Korruk wondered if he had really seen a panther. 
He turned to the wolf, wondering if it would leap upon him. It was watching him, half crouching. Slowly, it stepped away from the tree and, still watching him, backed away a few yards, then turned and made off with a strange, shambling gait. As the warrior watched it vanish into the forest, an uncanny feeling came over him. He had seen many wolves. He had hunted them and had been hunted by them, but he had never seen such a wolf before. He hesitated and walked warily after the wolf, following the tracks that were plainly defined in the soft loam. He did not hasten, being merely content to follow the tracks. After a short distance, he stopped short, the hairs on his neck seeming to bristle. Only the tracks of the hind feet showed. The wolf was walking erect. He glanced about him. There was no sound. The forest was silent. He felt an impulse to turn and put as much territory behind him and the mystery as possible. But his Celtic curiosity would not allow him. He followed the trail, and it ceased altogether. Beneath a great tree, the tracks vanished. Korruk felt the cold sweat on his forehead. What kind of place was this forest? Was he being led astray and eluded by some inhuman supernatural monster of the woodlands who sought to ensnare him? And Korruk backed away, his sword lifted, his courage not allowing him to run, but greatly desiring to do so. And so he came again to the tree where he had first seen the wolf. The trail had followed, led away from it and in another direction, and Korruk took it up, almost running in his haste to get out of the vicinity of the wolf, who walked on two legs and then vanished in the air. The trail wound about more tediously than ever, appearing and disappearing within a few dozen feet. But it was well for Korruk that it did, for thus he heard the voices of the men coming up the path before he saw them. He took to a tall tree that branched over the trail, lying close to the great bowl along a wide-flung branch. Three men were coming down the forest path. One was a big, burly fellow, vastly over six feet in height, with a long red beard and a great mop of red hair. In contrast, his eyes were a beady black. He was dressed in deerskins and armed with a great sword. One of the two others was a lanky, villainous-looking scoundrel with only one eye and the other was a small, wizened man who squinted hideously with both beady eyes. Korruk knew them. By descriptions, the Cornishman had made between curses, and it was in his excitement to get a better view of the most villainous murderer in Britain that he slipped from the tree branch and plunged to the ground directly between them. He was up on the instant, his sword out. He could expect no mercy, for he knew that the red-haired man was Baruch, the cruel, the scourge of Cornwall, the bandit chief bellowed a foul curse and whipped out his greatsword. He avoided the Britons' furious thrust by a swift backward leap, and then the battle was on. Baruch brushed the warrior from the front, striving to beat him down by sheer weight, while the lanky one-eyed villain slipped around, trying to get behind him. The smaller man had retreated to the edge of the forest. The fine art of the fence was unknown to those early swordsmen. It was hack, slash, stab, the full weight of the arm behind each blow. The terrific blows crashed on his shield, beat Korruk to the ground, and the lanky one-eyed villain rushed in to finish him. Korruk spun about without rising, cut the bandit's legs from under him and stabbed him as he fell, then threw himself to one side and to his feet in time to avoid Baruch's sword, again driving his shield up to catch the bandit's sword in midair. He deflected it and whirled his own with all his power. Baruch's head flew from his shoulders. Then Korruk, turning, saw the wizened bandit scurry into the forest. He scurried after him, but the fellow had disappeared among the trees. Knowing the uselessness of attempting to pursue him, Korruk turned and raced down the trail. He did not know if there were more bandits in that direction, but he did know that if he expected to get out of the forest at all, he would have to do it swiftly. Without doubt, the villain who had escaped would have all the other bandits out, and soon they would be beating the woodlands for him. After running for some distance down the path and seeing no sign of any enemy, he stopped and climbed into the utmost branches of a tall tree that towered above its fellows. On all sides, he seemed surrounded by a leafy ocean. To the west, he could see the hills he had avoided. To the north, far in the distance, other hills rose. To the south, the forest ran an unbroken sea. But to the east, far away, he could barely see the line that marked the thinning out of the forest into the fertile plains. Miles and miles away, he knew not how many but meant more pleasant travel, villages of men, people of his own race. He was surprised that he was able to see that far, but the tree in which he stood was a giant of its kind. Before he started to descend, he glanced about nearer at hand. 
He could trace the faintly marked lines of the trail lie now following, running away into the east, and could make out other trails leading into it, or away from it. Then a glint caught his eye. He fixed his gaze on a glade some distance down the trail, and saw presently a party of men enter and vanish. Here and there on every trail he caught glances of the glint of accoutrements, the waving of foliage, so the squinting villain had already roused the bandits. They were all around him. He was virtually surrounded. A faintly heard burst of savage yells from back up the trail startled him, so they had already thrown a cordon around the place of his flight and had found him gone. He had not fled swiftly. He would have been caught. He was outside the cordon, but the bandits were all about him. Swiftly he slipped from the tree and glided into the forest. Then began the most exciting hunt Korok had ever engaged in, for he was the hunted and men were the hunters. Gliding, slipping from bush to bush and from tree to tree, now running swiftly, now crouching in a covert. Korok fled ever eastward, not daring to turn back, lest he be driven further back into the forest. At times he was forced to turn his course. In fact, he very seldom fled in a straight course, yet always he managed to work further eastward. Sometimes he crouched in bushes or lie among some leafy branch and saw bandits pass so close to him that they could have touched him. Once or twice they sighted him and he fled, bounding over logs and bushes, darting in and out among the trees, and always he eluded them. It was one of those headlong flights that he noticed he had entered a small defile of small bills, of which he had been aware, unaware, and looking back over his shoulder, he saw that his pursuers had halted within full sight. Without pausing to ruminate on so strange a thing, he darted about a great boulder, felt a vine or something catch his foot, and was thrown headlong. Simultaneously, something struck the youth's head, knocking him senseless. When Korok recovered his senses, he found that he was bound hand and foot. He was being borne along over rough ground. He looked about him, Men carried him on their shoulders, but such men he had never seen before. Scarce above four feet stood the tallest, and they were small of build and very dark of complexion. Their eyes were black, and most of them stooped forward as if from a lifetime spent in crouching and hiding. Peering furtively on all sides, they were armed with small bows, arrows and spears, daggers, all pointed, not with crudely worked bronze, but with flint and obsidian. Of the finest workmanship, they were dressed in fine hides of rabbits and other small animals, and a kind of coarse cloth. And many were tattooed from head to foot in ochre and woad. There were perhaps twenty in all. What sort of men were they? Korok had never seen the like. They were going down a ravine, on both sides which steep cliffs rose. Presently they seemed to come to a blank wall, where the ravine appeared to come to an abrupt stop. Here, at a word from one who seemed to be in command, they set the Briton down, and seizing hold of a large boulder, drew it to one side. A small cavern was exposed, seeming to vanish away into the earth. Then the strange men picked up the Briton and moved forward. Kovarbuk's hair bristled at the thought of being born into that forbidding-looking cave. What manner of men were they? In all Britain and Alba, in Cornwall or Ireland, Kovarbuk had never seen such men, small dwarfish men, who dealt in the earth. Cold sweat broke out on the youth's forehead. Surely they were the malevolent dwarves of whom the Cornish people had spoken, who dwelled in their caverns by day, and by night sallied forth to steal and burn dwellings, even slaying if the opportunity arose. You will hear of them even today if you journey to Cornwall. The men or elves at such war bore him into the cavern, others entering and drawing the boulder back into place. For a moment all was darkness, and then torches began to glow, a way off, and at a shout they moved on. Other men of the caves came forward with the torches. Korok looked about him. The torches shed a vague glow over the scene. Sometimes one, sometimes another wall of the cave showed for an instant, and the Briton was vaguely aware that they were covered with paintings, crudely done, yet with a certain skill of his own race could not equal. But always the roof remained unseen. Korok knew that the seemingly small cavern had merged into a cave of surprising size. Though the vague light of the torches... The strange people moved, came and went silently like shadows of the dim past. He felt the cords or thongs that bound his feet loosen. He was lifted upright. Walk straight ahead, said a voice, speaking the language of his own race, and he felt a spear point touch the back of his neck. And straight ahead he walked, feeling his sandals scrape on the stone floor of the cave, until they came to a place where the floor tilted upward. The pitch was steep and the stone was so slippery that Korok could not have climbed it alone. But his captors pushed him and pulled him, 
and he saw that long, strong vines were strung from somewhere at the top. Those the men seized, and bracing their feet against the slippery ascent, went up swiftly. Then their feet found level surface again. The cave made a turn, and Korarup blundered out into a firelit scene that made him gasp. The cave debouched into a cavern so vast as to be almost incredible. The highly mighty walls swept up into a great arched roof that vanished into the darkness. A level floor lay between them, and though it flowed a river, an underground river, from under one wall it flowed to silently vanishing under the other. An arched stone, bridge seemingly of natural make, spanned the current. All around the walls of the great cavern, which was roughly circular, there were smaller caves, which before each glowed a fire. Higher up were other caves, regularly arranged tier on tier. Surely human men could not have built such a city. In and out among the caves, on the level floor of the main cavern, people were going about what seemed daily tasks. Men were talking together and mending weapons. Some were fishing from the river. Women were replenishing fires, preparing garments, and altogether it might have been just any other village in Britain to judge from their occupations. But it all struck Korok as extremely unreal. The strange place, the small, silent people going about their tasks, the river flowing silently through it all. Then they came aware of the prisoner and flocked about him. There was none of the shouting, abuse, and indignities such as savages usually heap upon their captives as the small men drew about Korok, silently eyeing him with malevolent, wolfish stares. The warrior shuddered in spite of himself, but his captors pushed through the throng, driving the Briton before them. Close to the bank of the river, they stopped and drew away from around him. Two great fires leaped and flickered in front of him, and there was something between him. He focused his gaze and presently made out the object, a high stone seat like a throne, and in it seated an aged man, with a long white beard, silent, motionless, but with black eyes that gleamed like a wolf's. The ancient was clothed in some sort of a single flowing garment. One claw-like hand rested on the seat near him, skinny, crooked fingers with talons like a hawk's. The other hand was hidden among his garments. The firelight danced and flickered. Now the old man stood up clearly, his hooked beak-like nose and long beard thrown into bold relief. Now he seemed to be received until he was invisible to the gaze of the Briton, except for his glittering eyes. Speak, Briton! The words came suddenly, strong, clear, without a hint of age. Speak what ye would say. Korok, taken aback, stammered and said, Why, why, what manner of people are you? Why have you taken me prisoner? Are you elves? We are pyats, said the stern reply. Pyats! Korok had heard tales of those ancient people from the Gaelic Britons. Some said they were still looking in the hills of Solaria. But I have fought pyats in Caledonia, the Briton protested. They are short but massive and misshapen, not like you at all. They are not true pyats, came the stern retort. Look about you, Briton, with the wave of an arm. You see the remnants of a vanishing race, a race that once ruled Britain from sea to sea. The Britons stared, bewildered. Hearken, Britain, the voice continued. Hearken, barbarian, while I tell you the tale of a lost race. The firelight flickered and danced, throwing vague reflections on high, towering walls and on the rushing, silent current. The ancient's voice echoed through the mighty cavern. Our people came from the south, over the islands, over the inland sea, over the snow-topped mountains where some remained, to stay any enemies who might fall. Down into the fertile plains we came, over all the land we spread. We became wealthy and prosperous. Then two kings arose in the land, and he who conquered drove out the conquered. So many of us made boats and set sail for the far-off cliffs that gleamed white in the sunlight. We found a fair land with fertile plains. We found a race of red-haired barbarians who dwelt in caves, mighty giants of great bodies and small minds. We built our huts of wattle. We tilled the soil. We cleared the forest. We drove the red-haired giants back into the forest. Further, we drove them back until at last they fled to the mountains of the west and the mountains of the north. We were rich. We were prosperous. Then, and his voice thrilled with rage and hate, until it seemed to reverberate through the cavern, then the Celts came from the isles of the west, in their rude coracles they came, in the west they landed, but they were not satisfied with the west. They marched eastward and seized the fertile plains. We fought. They were stronger. They were fierce fighters, and they were armed with weapons of bronze, whereas we had only weapons of flint. 
We were driven out. They enslaved us. They drove us into the forest. Some of us fled into the mountains of the west. Many fled into the mountains of the north. There they mingled with the red-haired giants we drove out so long ago and became a race of monstrous dwarves, losing all the arts of peace and gaining only the ability to fight. But some of us swore that we would never leave the land we had fought for. But the Celts pressed us. There were many, and more came. So we took to caverns, to ravines, to caves. We, who had always dwelt in huts that let in much light, who had always tilled the soil, we learned to dwell like beasts in caves where no sunlight ever entered. Caves we found of which this is the greatest caves we made. You, Britain, the voice came as a shriek and long arm was outstretched in accusation. You and your race, you have made a free, prosperous nation into a race of earth rats. We who never fled, who dwelt in the air and the sunlight close by the sea where traitors came, we must flee like hunted beasts and burrow like moles. But at night, ah, then for our vengeance, then we slip from our hiding places, from our ravines and our caves and torch daggers, Look, Britain, and following the gesture, Cor Rook saw a rounded post of some kind, of very hard wood, set in a niche in the stone floor, close to the bank. The floor about the niche was charred as if by old fires. Cor Rook stared, uncomprehending. Indeed, he understood little of what had passed. These people were even human. He was not at all certain. He had heard so much of them as little people. Tales of their doings, their hatred of the races of mankind, their maliciousness, flocked back to him. Yet he knew that he was gazing on one of the mysteries of the ages. That the tales which the ancient Gauls told of the Piats already warped would become even more warped from age to age to result in tales of elves, dwarves, trolls, and fairies, at first accepted and then rejected entire. By the race of man, just as the Neanderthal monsters resulted in tales of goblins and ogres, but of that Kor Rook knew neither, nor cared, and the ancient was speaking again. There, there, Britain, exulted he, pointing to the post. There you shall pay, a scant payment for the debt your race owes mine, but to the fullest of your extent. The old man's exultation would have been fiendish, except for a certain high purpose in his face. He was sincere. He believed that he was only taking just vengeance, and he seemed like some great patriot for a mighty lost cause. But I am a Briton, stammered Korok. It was not my people that drove your race into exile. They were Gauls from Ireland. I am a Briton, and my race came from Gallia. Only a hundred years ago, we conquered the Gauls and drove them into Erin, Wales, and Caledonia, even as they drove your race. No matter, the ancient chief was on his feet. A Celt is a Celt, Briton or Gaul. It makes no difference. Had it not been Gaul, it would have been Britain. Every Celt who falls into our hands must pay be it warrior or woman, babe or king, seize him and bind him to the post. In an instant, Kor Rook was bound to the post, and he saw with horror the piots piling wood about his feet. When you are sufficiently burned, Britain, said the ancient, this dagger that has drunk the blood of a hundred Britons shall quench its thirst in yours. But never have I harmed a piot, Kor Rook gasped, struggling with his bonds. You pay not for what you did, but for what your race has done, answered the ancient sternly. Well, do I remember the deeds of the Celts when they first landed in Britain? The shrieks of the slaughtered, the screams of ravished girls, and the smokes of burning villages, the plundering. Korok felt his short hairs bristle. Then the Celts landed on Britain. That was over 500 years ago. And his Celtic curiosity would not let him keep still, even at the stake with the pious preparing to light firewood pulled about him. You could not remember that. That was ages ago. The ancient looked at him somberly. And I am age old. In my youth, I was a witch finder. And an old woman witch cursed me as she writhed at the stake. She said I should live until the last child of the Pictish race had passed that I should see the once mighty nation go down into oblivion, and then, and only then, should I follow it. For she put upon me the curse of life everlasting. Then his voice rose until it filled the cavern. But the curse was nothing. Words can do no harm, can do nothing to a man. I live. A hundred generations have I seen come and go, and yet another hundred. What is time? The sun rises and sets, and another day was passed into oblivion. Men watch the sun and set their lives by it. They league themselves on every hand with time. They count the minutes that race them into eternity. 
Man outlived the centuries. Ere he began to reckon time. Time is man-made. Eternity is the work of the gods. In this cavern, there is no such thing as time. There are no stars, no sun. Without its time, within its eternity, we count not time. Nothing marks the speeding of the hours. The youths go forth. They see the sun, the stars. They reckon time, and they pass. I was a young man when I entered this cavern, and I have never left it. As you reckon time, I may have dwelt here a thousand years, or an hour. When not banded by time, the soul, the mind, call it what you will, call and conquer the body. And the wise men of the race in my youth knew more than the outer world will ever learn. When I feel that my body begins to weaken, I take the magic draft that is known only to me of all the world. It does not give immortality. That is the work of the mind alone, but it rebuilds the body. The race of the pious vanish. They fade like snow on the mountain. And when the last is gone, this dagger shall free me from the world. Then in a swift change of tone, light the faggots. Kororuk mind was fairly reeling. He did not in the least understand what he had just heard. He was positive that he was going mad, and what he had saw the next minute assured him of it. Through the throng came a wolf, and he knew what it was the wolf whom he had rescued from the panther close by the ravine in the forest. Strange how long ago and far away that seemed. Yes, it was the same wolf, that same strange shambling gait. Then the thing stood erect and raised its front feet to its head. What nameless horror was that? Then the wolf's head fell back, disclosing the man's face, the face of a pilot, one of the first werewolves. The man stepped out of the wolf's skin and strode forward, calling something. A pilot, just starting to light the wood about the Briton's feet, drew back the torch and hesitated. The wolf picked, stepped forward, and began to speak to the chief, using Celtic, evidently for the prisoner's benefit. Cor Rook was surprised to hear so many speak his language not reflecting upon his comparative simplicity and the abilities of the pious. "'Who is this?' asked the pious who had played wolf. "'A man is to be burned and should not be?' "'How?' exclaimed the old man fiercely, clutching his long beard. "'Who are you to go against a custom of old age antiquity? "'I met a panther,' answered the other, "'and this Briton risked his life to save mine. "'Shall a pious show ingratitude?' And as the ancient hesitated, evidently pulled away by his fanatical lust for revenge, and the other by his equally fierce racial pride, the pilot burst into a wild flight of oration, carried on in his own language. At last the ancient chief nodded. A pilot ever paid his debts, said he with impressive grandeur. Never a pilot forgets. Unbind him. No Celt shall ever say that a pilot showed ingratitude. Kor Rook was released. And as like a man in a daze, he tried to stammer his thanks. The chief waved him aside. A pilot never forgets a foe, ever remembers a friendly deed, he replied. Come, murmured his Pictish friend, tugging at the Celt's arm. He led the way into a cave leading away from the main cavern. As they went, Kororuk looked back to see the ancient chief seated upon his stone throne, his eyes gleaming as he seemed to gaze back through the lost glories of the ages. On each hand, the fires leaped and flickered. A figure of grandeur, the king of a lost race, and on and on Korruk's guide led him, and at last they emerged, and the Briton saw the starlit sky above him. In that way is the village of your tribesmen, said the Piat, pointing, where you will find a welcome until you wish you had taken your journey anew. And he pressed gifts on the Celt, gifts of garments of cloth and finely worked deerskin, beaded belts, a fine horn bow with arrows skillfully tipped with obsidian, gifts of food. His own weapons were returned to him, but an instant, said the Briton, as the pilot turned to go, I followed your tracks in the forest. They vanished. There was a question in his voice. The pilot laughed softly. I leaped into the branch of the tree. Had you looked up, you would have seen me. If ever you wish a friend, you will ever find one in Barua, chief among the Alban pilots. He turned and vanished, and Kororuk strode through the moonlit toward the Celtic village. The End The Lost Race by Robert E. Howard Narrated by J. Cecil May 2023
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia Morales. A Modest Proposal For preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden on their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public. By Dr. Jonathan Swift, 1729. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags, and importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain or sell themselves to the Barbados. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms or on the backs or at the heels of their mothers and frequently of their fathers is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age, who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them as those who demand our charity in the streets. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject and maturely weighed the several schemes of our projectors, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. It is true, a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a solar year with little other nourishment, at most not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps, by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner as, instead of being a charge upon their parents or the parish, or wanting food and raiment for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. There is likewise another great advantage in my scheme, that it will prevent those voluntary abortions and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children. Alas, too frequent among us sacrificing the poor innocent babes, I doubt, more to avoid the expense than the shame which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast. The number of souls in this kingdom, being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about 200,000 couple whose wives are breeders, from which number I subtract 30,000 couple who are able to maintain their own children although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom. But this being granted, there will remain a hundred and seventy thousand breeders. I again subtract fifty thousand for those women who miscarry or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain a hundred and twenty thousand children of poor parents annually born. The question, therefore, is how this number shall be reared and provided for, which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs, is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed. For we can neither employ them in handicraft, 
or agriculture. They neither build houses, I mean in the country, nor cultivate land. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing till they arrive at six years old, except where they are of towardly parts, although I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can, however, be properly looked upon only as probationers. As I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the county of Cavan, who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six, even in a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art. I am assured by our merchants that a boy or a girl before 12 years old is no saleable commodity, and even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds, or three pounds and half a crown at most, on the exchange, which cannot turn to account either to the parents or kingdom. The charge of nutriments and rags having been at least four times that value. I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young healthy child, well nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragust. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration that of the 120,000 children already computed, 20,000 may be reserved for breed, whereof only one-fourth part to be males, which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine, and my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages. Therefore, one male will be sufficient to serve four females, that the remaining hundred thousand may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune through the kingdom always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt, will be very good boiled on the fourth day especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh 12 pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to 28 pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Infant's flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March, and a little before and after, for we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent than at any other season. Therefore, reckoning a year after Lent, the markets will be more glutted than usual, because the number of popish infants is at least three to one in this kingdom, and therefore it will have one other collateral advantage by lessening the number of papists among us. I have already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list I reckon all cottagers, laborers, and four-fifths of the farmers, to be about two shillings per annum, rags included, and I believe no gentleman would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child, which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent, nutritive meat, when he hath only some particular friend or his own family to dine with him. 
Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord and grow popular among his tenants. The mother will have eight shillings neat profit and be fit for work till she produces another child. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass, the skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for ladies and summer boots for fine gentlemen. As to our city of Dublin, shambles may be appointed for this purpose in the most convenient parts of it, and butchers, we may be assured, will not be wanting. Although I rather recommend buying the children alive and dressing them hot from the knife as we do roasting pigs. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country, and whose virtues I highly esteem, was lately pleased in discoursing on this matter to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said that many gentlemen of this kingdom, having of late destroyed their deer, he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplied by the bodies of young lads and maidens, not exceeding fourteen years of age, nor under twelve. So great a number of both sexes in every county being now ready to starve for want of work and service, and these to be disposed of by their parents if alive, or otherwise by their nearest relations. But with due deference to so excellent a friend, and so deserving a patriot, I cannot be altogether in his sentiments. For as to the males, my American acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean, like that of our schoolboys, by continual exercise, and their taste disagreeable, and to fatten them would not answer the charge. Then as to the females, it would, I think, with humble submission, be a loss to the public, because they soon would become breeders themselves. And besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censor such a practice, although indeed very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which I confess hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project, how well soever intended. But in order to justify my friend, he confessed that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Salmanazar, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London above twenty years ago, and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the executioner sold the carcass to persons of quality as a prime dainty, and that in his time the body of a plump girl of fifteen who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state, and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet, at four hundred crowns. Neither indeed can I deny that if the same use were made of several plump young girls in this town, who without one single groat to their fortunes cannot stir abroad without a chair, and appear at a playhouse and assemblies and foreign fineries which they never will pay for, the kingdom would not be the worse. Some persons of a desponding spirit are in great concern about that vast number of poor people who are aged, diseased, or maimed. And I have been desired to employ my thoughts what course may be taken to ease a nation of so grievous an encumbrance. But I am not in the least pain upon that matter, because it is very well known that they are every day dying and rotting by cold and famine and filth and vermin, as fast as can be reasonably expected. And as to the young laborers, they are now in almost as hopeful a condition. They cannot get work and consequently pine away from want of nourishment to a degree 
that if at any time they are accidentally hired to common labor, they have not strength to perform it, and thus the country and themselves are happily delivered from the evils to come. I have too long digressed, and therefore shall return to my subject. I think the advantages by the proposal which I have made are obvious and many, as well as of the highest importance. For first, as I have already observed, it would greatly lessen the number of papists, with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies, and who stay at home on purpose with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender, hoping to take their advantage by the absence of so many good Protestants, who have chosen rather to leave their country than stay at home and pay tithes against their conscience to an episcopal curate. Secondly, the poor tenants will have something valuable of their own, which by law may be made liable to distress and help to pay their landlord's rent, their corn and cattle, being already seized, and money a thing unknown. Thirdly, whereas the maintenance of a hundred thousand children from two years old and upwards cannot be computed at less than ten shillings apiece per annum, the nation's stock will be thereby increased fifty thousand pounds per annum, besides the profit of a new dish, introduced to the tables of all gentlemen of fortune in the kingdom." Who have any refinement and taste, and the money will circulate among ourselves, the goods being entirely of our own growth and manufacture. Fourthly, the constant breeders, besides the gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. Fifthly, this food would likewise bring great custom to taverns, where the vintners will certainly be so prudent as to procure the best receipts for dressing it to perfection, and consequently have their houses frequented by all the fine gentlemen, who justly value themselves upon their knowledge in good eating, and a skillful cook who understands how to oblige his guests will contrive to make it as expensive as they please. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers towards their children when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes, provided in some sort by the public to their annual profit instead of expense. We should soon see an honest emulation among the married women, which of them could bring the fattest child to the market. Men would become as fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy as they are now of their mares in full, their cows and calf, or sows when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them as is too frequent a practice for fear of a miscarriage. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of barreled beef, the propagation of swine's flesh, and improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs, too frequent at our tables, which are no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown, fat yearling child, which roasted whole, will make a considerable figure at a Lord Mayor's feast, or any other public entertainment. But this, and many others, I omit, being studious of brevity. Supposing that 1,000 families in this city would be constant customers for infants' flesh, besides others who might have it at merry meetings, particularly at weddings and christenings. I compute that Dublin would take off annually about 20,000 carcasses, and the rest of the kingdom, where probably they will be sold somewhat cheaper, the remaining 80,000. I can think of no one objection 
that will possibly be raised against this proposal unless it should be urged that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and was indeed one principal design in offering it to the world. I desire the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland, and for no other that ever was, is, or I think ever can be upon earth. Therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture, of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country, wherein we differ even from Laplanders and the inhabitants of Topanemba, of quitting our animosities and factions, nor acting any longer like the Jews, who were murdering one another at the very moment their city was taken, of being a little cautious not to sell our country and consciences for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy towards their tenants. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers, who, if a resolution could now be taken to buy only our native goods, would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us in the price, the measure, and the goodness, nor could ever yet be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing, though often and earnestly invited to it. Therefore, I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients till he hath at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them into practice. But as to myself, having been wearied out for many years with offering vain, idle, visionary thoughts, and at length, utterly despairing of success, I fortunately fell upon this proposal, which, as it is wholly new, so it hath something solid and real, of no expense and little trouble, full in our own power, and whereby we can incur no danger in disobliging England. For this kind of commodity will not bear exportation, and flesh being of too tender a consistence, to admit a long continuance in salt, although perhaps I can name a country which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without it. After all, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion as to reject any offer proposed by wise men, which shall be found equally innocent, cheap, easy, and effectual. But before something of that kind shall be advanced in contradiction to my scheme, and offering a better, I desire the author or authors will be pleased maturely to consider two points. First, as things now stand, how they will be able to find food and raiment for a hundred thousand useless mouths and backs. And secondly, there being a round million of creatures in humane figure throughout this kingdom whose whole subsistence put into a common stock would leave them in debt two million of pounds sterling, adding those who are beggars by profession, to the bulk of farmers, cottagers, and laborers, with their wives and children, who are beggars in effect. I desire those politicians who dislike my overture, and may perhaps be so bold to attempt an answer, that they will first ask the parents of these mortals whether they would not at this day think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at a year old, in the manner I prescribe, and thereby have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes, as they have since gone through by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common sustenance, with neither house nor clothes to cover them from the inclemencies of the weather, 
and the most inevitable prospect of entailing the like or greater miseries upon their breed forever. I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife past childbearing. End of a Modest Proposal The Mortal Immortal by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Carruthers. July 16, 1833. This is a memorable anniversary for me. On it, I complete my 323rd year. The Wandering Jew? Certainly not. More than 18 centuries have passed over his head. In comparison with him, I am a very young immortal. Am I, then, immortal? This question which I have asked myself by day and night for now 303 years, and yet cannot answer it. I detected a grey hair amidst my brown locks this very day, that surely signifies decay, yet it may have remained concealed there for 300 years, for some persons have become entirely white-headed before 20 years of age. I will tell my story and my reader shall judge for me. I will tell my story, and so contrive to pass some few hours of a long eternity become so wearisome to me. Forever, can it be, to live forever. I have heard of enchantments, in which the victims were plunged into a deep sleep to wake, after a hundred years as fresh as ever. I have heard of the seven sleepers. Thus to be immortal would not be so burthensome. But oh, the weight of never-ending time! the tedious passage of the still succeeding hours. How happy was the fabled Nor Jihad, but to my task. All the world has heard of Cornelius Agrippa. His memory is as immortal as his arts have made me. All the world has also heard of his scholar, who, unawares, raised the foul fiend during his master's absence and was destroyed by him. The report, true or false, of this accident was attended with many inconveniences to the renowned philosopher. All his scholars at once deserted him. His servants disappeared. He had no one near him to put coals on his ever-burning fires while he slept, or to attend to the changeful colours of his medicines while he studied. Experiment after experiment failed, because one pair of hands was insufficient to complete them. The dark spirits laughed at him for not being able to retain a single mortal in his surface. I was then very young, very poor, and very much in love. I had been for about a year the pupil of Cornelius, though I was absent when this accident took place. On my return, my friends implored me not to return to the alchemist's abode. I trembled as I listened to the dire tale they told. I required no second warning and when Cornelius came and offered me a purse of gold if I would remain under his roof, I felt as if Satan himself tempted me. My teeth chattered, my hair stood on end, I ran off as fast as my trembling knees would permit. My failing steps were directed whither for two years they had every evening been attracted, a gently bubbling spring of pure living water, beside which lingered a dark-haired girl, whose beaming eyes were fixed on the path I was accustomed each night to tread. I cannot remember the hour when I did not love Bertha. We had been neighbours and playmates from infancy. Her parents, like mine, were of humble life, yet respectable. Our attachment had been a source of pleasure to them. In an evil hour, a malignant fever carried off both her father and mother, and Bertha became an orphan. She would have found a home beneath my paternal roof, but, unfortunately, the old lady of the near castle, rich, childless, and solitary, declared her intention to adopt her. Henceforth, Bertha was clad in silk. 
inhabited a marble palace and was looked on as being highly favoured by fortune. But in her new situation, among her new associates, Bertha remained true to the friend of her humbler days. She often visited the cottage of my father, and when forbidden to go thither, she would stray towards the neighbouring wood and meet me besides its shady fountain. She often declared that she owed no duty to her new protectress, equal in sanctity to that which bound us. Yet still I was too poor to marry, and she grew weary of being tormented on my account. She had a haughty but impatient spirit, and grew angry at the obstacles that prevented our union. We met now after an absence, and she had been sorely beset while I was away. She complained bitterly, and almost reproached me for being poor. I replied hastily, I am honest if I am poor. Were I not, I might soon become rich. This exclamation produced a thousand questions. I feared to shock her by owning the truth, but she drew it from me, and then, casting a look of disdain on me, she said, You pretend to love, and you fear to face the devil for my sake. I protested that I had only dreaded to offend her, while she dwelt on the magnitude of the reward that I should receive. Thus encouraged, shamed by her, led on by love and hope, laughing at my late fears with quick steps and light heart, I returned to accept the offers of the alchemist, and was instantly installed in my office. A year passed away. I became possessed of no insignificant sum of money. Custom had banished my fears. In spite of the most painful vigilance, I had never detected the trace of a cloven foot, nor was the studious silence of our abode ever disturbed by demonic howls. I still continued my stolen interviews with Bertha, and hope dawned on me, hope, but not perfect joy, for Bertha fancied that love and security were enemies, and her pleasure was to divide them in my bosom. Though true of heart, she was somewhat of a coquette in manner, and I was jealous as a Turk. She slighted me in a thousand ways, yet would never acknowledge herself to be in the wrong. She would drive me mad with anger, and then force me to beg her pardon. Sometimes she fancied that I was not sufficiently submissive, and then she had some story of a rival, favoured by her protectress. She was surrounded by silk-clad youths, the rich and gay. What chance had the sad-robed scholar of Cornelius compared with these? On one occasion, the philosopher made such large demands upon my time that I was unable to meet her as I was wont. He was engaged in some mighty work, and I was forced to remain day and night, feeding his furnaces and watching his chemical preparations. Bertha waited for me in vain at the fountain. Her haughty spirit fired at this neglect, and when at last I stole out during the few short minutes allotted to me for slumber, and hoped to be consoled by her, she received me with disdain, dismissed me in scorn, and vowed that any man should possess her hand rather than he who could not be in two places at once for her sake. She would be revenged, and truly she was. In my dingy retreat I heard that she had been hunting, attended by Albert Hoffer. Albert Hoffer was favoured by her protectress, and the three passed in a cavalcade before my smoky window. Methought that they mentioned my name, it was followed by a laugh of derision as her dark eyes glanced contemptuously towards my abode. Jealousy with all its venom and misery entered my breast. Now I shed a torrent of tears. To think that I should never call her mine, and anon I imprecated a thousand curses on her inconstancy. Yet still I must stir the fires of the alchemist, still attend on the changes of his unintelligible medicines. Cornelius had watched for three days and nights, nor closed his eyes. The progress of his Olympics was slower than he expected. In spite of his anxiety, sleep weighed upon his eyelids. Again and again he threw off drowsiness with more than human energy. Again and again it stole away his senses. He eyed his crucibles wistfully. Not ready yet, he murmured. Will another night pass before the work is accomplished? Winsy, you are vigilant, you are faithful, you have slept, my boy, you slept last night. 
Look at that glass vessel. The liquid it contains is of a soft rosé colour. The moment it begins to change its hue, awaken me. Till then I may close my eyes. First it will turn white, and then emit golden flashes. But wait not till then. When the rosé colour fades, rouse me. I scarcely heard the last words, muttered as they were, in sleep. Even then he did not quite yield to nature. Winsy, my boy, he again said, do not touch the vessel. Do not put it to your lips. It is a filter, a filter to cure love. You would not cease to love your Bertha. Beware to drink. And he slept. His venerable head sunk on his breast, and I scarce heard his regular breathing. For a few minutes I watched the vessel. The rosy hue of the liquid remained unchanged. Then my thoughts wandered. They visited the fountain, and dwelt on a thousand charming scenes never to be renewed. Never. Serpents and adders were in my heart, as the word never half-formed itself on my lips. False girl, false and cruel, never more would she smile on me as that evening she smiled on Albert. Worthless, detested woman. I would not remain unrevenged. She would see Albert expire at her feet. She would die beneath my vengeance. She had smiled in disdain and triumph. She knew my wretchedness and her power. Yet what power had she? The power of exciting my hate, my utter scorn, my, oh, all but indifference. Could I attain that? Could I regard her with careless eyes, transferring my rejected love to one fairer and more true? That were indeed a victory. A bright flash darted before my eyes. I had forgotten the medicine of the adept. I gazed on it with wonder. Flashes of admirable beauty, more bright than those which the diamond emits when the sun's rays are on it, glanced from the surface of the liquid. An odour the most fragrant and grateful stole over my sense. The vessel seemed one globe of living radiance, lovely to the eye, and most inviting to the taste. The first thought, instinctively inspired by the grosser sense, was, I will, I must drink. I raised the vessel to my lips. It will cure me of love, of torture. Already I had quaffed half of the most delicious liqueur ever tasted by the palate of a man. When the philosopher stirred, I started, I dropped the glass. The fluid flamed and glanced along the floor, while I felt Cornelius gripe at my throat as he shrieked aloud, Wretch, you have destroyed the labour of my life. The philosopher was totally unaware that I had drunk any portion of his drug. His idea was, and I gave tacit assent to it, that I had raised the vessel from curiosity, and that, frightened at its brightness and the flashes of intense light it gave forth, I had let it fall. I never undeceived him. The fire of the medicine was quenched. The fragrance died away. He grew calm, as a philosopher should under the heaviest trials, and dismissed me to rest. I will not attempt to describe the sleep of glory and bliss which bathed my soul in paradise during the remaining hours of that memorable night. Words would be faint and shallow types of my enjoyment or of the gladness that possessed my bosom when I awoke. I trod air, my thoughts were in heaven. Earth appeared heaven, and my inheritance upon it was to be one trance of delight. This it is to be cured of love, I thought. I will see Bertha this day, and she will find her lover cold and regardless, too happy to be disdainful, yet how utterly indifferent to her. The hours danced away. The philosopher, secure that he had once succeeded, and believing that he might again, began to concoct the same medicine once more. He was shut up with his books and drugs, and I had a holiday. I dressed myself with care. I looked in an old but polished shield, which served me for a mirror. Methought my good looks had wonderfully improved. I hurried beyond the precincts of the town, joy in my soul, the beauty of heaven and earth around me. I turned my steps towards the castle. I could look on its lofty turrets with a lightness of heart, for I was cured of love. 
My Bertha saw me afar off as I came up the avenue. I know not what sudden impulse animated her bosom, but at the sight she sprung with a light fawn-like bound down the marble steps and was hastening towards me. But I had been perceived by another person, the old high-born hag who called herself her protectress and was her tyrant, had seen me also. She hobbled, panting up the terrace, a page as ugly as herself held up her train and fanned her as she hurried along, and stopped my fair girl with a, How now, my bold mistress, whither so fast? Back to your cage, hawks are abroad. Bertha clasped her hands. Her eyes were still bent on my approaching figure. I saw the contest. How I abhorred the old crone who checked the kind impulses of my Bertha's softening heart. Hitherto respect for her rank had caused me to avoid the lady of the castle. Now I disdained such trivial considerations. I was cured of love, and lifted above all human fears. I hastened forwards, and soon reached the terrace. How lovely Bertha looked, her eyes flashing fire, her cheeks glowing with impatience and anger. She was a thousand times more graceful and charming than ever. I no longer loved. Oh no! I adored, worshipped, idolised her. She had that morning been persecuted with more than usual vehemence to consent to an immediate marriage with my rival. She was reproached with the encouragement that she had shown him. She was threatened with being turned out of doors with disgrace and shame. Her proud spirit rose in arms at that threat. But when she remembered the scorn that she had heaped upon me, and how, perhaps, she had thus lost one whom she now regarded as her only friend, she wept with remorse and rage. At that moment I appeared. Oh, Winsy, she exclaimed, take me to your mother's cot. Swiftly let me leave the detested luxuries and wretchedness of this noble dwelling. Take me to poverty and happiness. I clasped her in my arms with transport. The old dame was speechless with fury, and broke forth into invective only when we were far on our road to my natal cottage. My mother received the fair fugitive, escaped from a gilt cage to nature and liberty, with tenderness and joy. My father, who loved her, welcomed her heartily. It was a day of rejoicing which did not need the addition of the celestial portion of the alchemist to steep me in delight. Soon after this eventful day, I became the husband of Bertha. I ceased to be the scholar of Cornelius, but I continued his friend. I always felt grateful to him for having, unawares, procured me that delicious draught of divine elixir, which, instead of curing me of love, sad cure, solitary and joyless remedy for evils which seemed blessings to the memory, had inspired me with courage and resolution, thus winning for me an inestimable treasure in my Bertha. I often called to mind that period of trance-like inebriation with wonder. The drink of Cornelius had not fulfilled the task for which he affirmed that it had been prepared, but its effects were more potent and blissful than words can express. They had faded by degrees, yet they lingered long, and painted life in hues of splendour. Bertha often wondered at my lightness of heart and unaccustomed gaiety, for before I had been rather serious, or even sad, in my disposition. She loved me the better for my cheerful temper, and our days were winged by joy. Five years afterwards I was suddenly summoned to the bedside of the dying Cornelius, he had sent for me in haste, conjuring my instant presence. I found him stretched on his pallet, enfeebled even to death. All of life that yet remained animated his piercing eyes, and they were fixed on a glassed vessel, full of a roseate liquid. Behold, he said, in a broken and inward voice, the vanity of human wishes. A second time my hopes are about to be crowned. A second time they are destroyed. Look at that liqueur. You remember five years ago I had prepared the same, with the same success. Then as now my thirsting lips expected to taste the immortal elixir. 
you dashed it from me, and at present it is too late. He spoke with difficulty and fell back on his pillow. I could not help saying, How, revered master, can a cure for love restore you to life? A faint smile gleamed across his face as I listened earnestly to his scarcely intelligible answer. A cure for love and for all things, the elixir of immortality. Ah, if now I might drink, I should live forever. As he spoke, a golden flash gleamed from the fluid. A well-remembered fragrance stole over the air. He raised himself, all weak as he was. Strength seemed miraculously to re-enter his frame. He stretched forth his hand. A loud explosion startled me. A ray of fire shot up from the elixir, and the glass vessel which contained it was shivered to atoms. I turned my eyes toward the philosopher. He had fallen back. His eyes were glassy, his features rigid. He was dead. But I lived, and was to live forever. So said the unfortunate alchemist, and for a few days I believed his words. I remembered the glorious intoxication that had followed my stolen draught. I reflected on the change I had felt in my frame, in my soul. The bounding elasticity of the one, the buoyant lightness of the other. I surveyed myself in a mirror, and could perceive no change in my features during the space of the five years which had elapsed. I remembered the radiant hues and grateful scent of that delicious beverage, worthy the gift it was capable of bestowing. I was, then, immortal. A few days after I laughed at my credulity, the old proverb that a prophet is least regarded in his own country was true with respect to me and my defunct master. I loved him as a man, I respected him as a sage, but I derided the notion that he could command the powers of darkness, and laughed at the superstitious fears with which he was regarded by the vulgar. He was a wise philosopher, but had no acquaintance with any spirits but those clad in flesh and blood. His science was simply human, and human science, I soon persuaded myself, could never conquer nature's laws so far as to imprison the soul forever within its carnal habitation. Cornelius had brewed a soul-refreshing drink, more inebriating than wine, sweeter and more fragrant than any fruit. It possessed probably strong medicinal powers, imparting gladness to the heart and vigour to the limbs, but its effects would wear out. Already they were diminishing in my frame. I was a lucky fellow to have quaffed health and joyous spirits, and perhaps long life, at my master's hands. But my good fortune ended there. Longevity was far different from immortality. I continued to entertain this belief for many years. Sometimes a thought stole across me. Was the alchemist indeed deceived? But my habitual credence was that I should meet the fate of all children of Adam at my appointed time, a little late, but still at a natural age. Yet it was certain that I retained a wonderfully youthful look. I was laughed at for my vanity in consulting the mirror so often, but I consulted it in vain. My brow was untrenched, my cheeks, my eyes, my whole person continued as untarnished as in my twentieth year. I was troubled. I looked at the faded beauty of Bertha. I seemed more like her son. By degrees our neighbours began to make similar observations, and I found at last that I went by the name of the scholar bewitched. Bertha herself grew uneasy. She became jealous and peevish, and at length she began to question me. We had no children. We were all in all to each other, and though, as she grew older, her vivacious spirit became a little allied to ill temper, and her beauty sadly diminished. I cherished her in my heart as the mistress I had idolized, the wife I had sought and won with such perfect love. At last our situation became intolerable. Bertha was fifty, I twenty years of age. I had, in very shame, in some measure adopted the habits of a more advanced age. I no longer mingled in the dance among the young and gay, but my heart bounded along with them while I restrained my feet. 
and a sorry figure I cut among the nesters of our village. But before the time I mention, things were altered. We were universally shunned. We were, at least I was, reported to have kept up an inquietous acquaintance with some of my former master's supposed friends. Poor Bertha was pitied, but deserted. I was regarded with horror and detestation. But what was to be done? We sat by our winter fire. Poverty had made itself felt, for none would buy the produce of my farm, and often I had been forced to journey twenty miles to some place where I was not known to dispose of our property. It is true, we had saved something for an evil day. That day was come. We sat by our lone fireside, the old-hearted youth and his antiquated wife. Again, Bertha insisted on knowing the truth. She recapitulated all that she had ever heard said about me, and added her own observations. She conjured me to cast off the spell. She described how much more comely grey hairs were than my chestnut locks. She descanted on the reverence and respect due to age, how preferable to the slight regard paid to mere children. Could I imagine that the despicable gifts of youth and good looks outweighed disgrace, hatred, and scorn? Nay, in the end, I should be burnt as the dealer in the black art, while she to whom I had not deigned to communicate any portion of my good fortune might be stoned as my accomplice. At length she insinuated that I must share my secret with her and bestow on her like benefits to those I myself enjoyed, or she would denounce me, and then she burst into tears. Thus beset, methought, it was the best way to tell the truth. I revealed it as tenderly as I could, and spoke only of a very long life, not of immortality, which representation, indeed, coincided best with my own ideas. When I ended, I rose and said, And now, my Bertha, will you denounce the lover of your youth? You will not, I know. But it is too hard, my poor wife, that you should suffer from my ill luck and the accursed art of Cornelius. I will leave you. You have wealth enough, and friends will return in my absence. I will go, young as I seem and strong as I am, I can work and gain my bread among strangers, unsuspected and unknown. I loved you in youth. God is my witness that I would not desert you in age, but that your safety and happiness require it. I took my cap and moved towards the door. In a moment Bertha's arms were round my neck and her lips were pressed to mine. No, my husband, my Winsy, she said. You shall not go alone. Take me with you. We will remove from this place, and as you say, among strangers, we shall be unsuspected and safe. I am not so very old as quite to shame you, my Winsy, and I dare say the charm will soon wear off, and with the blessing of God you will become more elderly looking, as is fitting. You shall not leave me. I return the good soul's embrace heartily. I will not, my Bertha, but for your sake I had not thought of such a thing. I will be your true, faithful husband while you are spared to me, and do my duty by you to the last. The next day we prepared secretly for our emigration. We were obliged to make great pecuniary sacrifices. It could not be helped. We realized a sum sufficient, at least to maintain us while Bertha lived, and without saying adieu to anyone, quitted our native country to take refuge in a remote part of western France. It was a cruel thing to transport poor Bertha from her native village, and the friends of her youth to a new country, new language, new customs. The strange secret of my destiny rendered this removal immaterial to me, but I compassioned her deeply, and was glad to perceive that she found compensation for her misfortunes in a variety of little ridiculous circumstances. Away from all tell-tale chroniclers, She sought to decrease the apparent disparity of our ages by a thousand feminine arts, rouge, youthful dress, and assumed juvenility of manner. I could not be angry. Did not I myself wear a mask? Why quarrel with hers because it was less successful? I grieved deeply when I remembered that this was my Bertha, whom I had loved so fondly, and one with such transport, the dark-eyed, dark-haired girl, with smiles of enchanting archness, 
and a step like a fawn, this mincing, simpering, jealous old woman. I should have revered her grey locks and withered cheeks, but thus, it was my work, I knew, but I did not the less deplore this type of human weakness. Her jealousy never slept. Her chief occupation was to discover that, in spite of outward appearance, I was myself growing old. I verily believe that the poor soul loved me, truly, in her heart, but never had woman so tormenting a mode of displaying fondness. She would discern wrinkles in my face and decrepitude in my walk, while I bounded along in youthful vigour, the youngest looking of twenty youths. I never dared address another woman, on one occasion fancying that the belle of the village regarded me with favouring eyes. She brought me a grey wig. Her constant discourse among her acquaintances was, that though I looked so young, there was ruin at work within my frame. She affirmed that the worst symptom about it was my apparent health. My youth was a disease, she said, and I ought at all times to prepare, if not for a sudden and awful death, at least to awake some morning white-headed and bowed down with all the marks of advanced years. I let her talk. I often joined in her conjectures. Her warnings chimed in with my never-ceasing speculations concerning my state, and I took an earnest, though painful, interest in listening to all that her quick wit and excited imagination could say on the subject. Why dwell on these minute circumstances? We lived on for many long years. Bertha became bedridden and paralytic. I nursed her as a mother might a child. She grew peevish and still harped upon one string of how long I should survive her. It has ever been a source of consolation to me that I performed my duty scrupulously towards her. She had been mine in youth, she was mine in age, and at the last, when I heaped the sod over her corpse, I wept and fell and had lost all that really bound me to humanity. Since then how many have been my cares and woes, how few and empty my enjoyments. I pause here in my history. I will pursue it no further. A sailor without rudder or compass tossed to a stormy sea. A traveller lost on a widespread heath, without landmark or stone to guide him. Such have I been, more lost, more hopeless than either. A nearing ship, a gleam from some far cot may save them but I have no beacon except the hope of death. Death. Mysterious, ill-visaged friend of weak humanity, why alone of all mortals have you cast me from your sheltering fold? Oh, for the peace of the grave, the deep silence of the iron-bound tomb. That thought would cease to work in my brain, and my heart beat no more with emotions varied only by new forms of sadness. Am I a mortal? I return to my first question. In the first place, is it not more probable that the beverage of the alchemist was fraught rather with longevity than eternal life? Such is my hope. And then it be remembered that I only drank half of the portion prepared by him. Was not the whole necessary to complete the charm? To have drained to the half of the elixir of immortality is to be but half immortal. My forever is thus truncated and null. But again, who shall number the years of half of eternity? I often try to imagine by what rule the infinite may be divided. Sometimes I fancy age advancing upon me. One grey hair I have found, fool. Do I lament? Yes. The fear of age and death often creeps coldly into my heart. The more I live, the more I dread death even while I abhor life. Such an enigma is man, born to perish when he wars, as do I, against the established laws of his nature. But for this anomaly of feeling surely I might die, the medicine of the alchemist would not be proof against fire, sword, and strangling waters. I have gazed upon the blue depths of many a placid lake, and the tumultuous rushing of many a mighty river, and I have said, Peace inhabits those waters. Yet I have turned my steps away, to live yet another day. 
I have asked myself whether suicide would be a crime in one to whom thus only the portals of the other world could be opened. I have done all, except presenting myself as a soldier or duelist, an object of destruction to my, no, not my fellow mortals, and therefore I have shrunk away. They are not my fellows. The inextinguishable power of life in my frame and their ephemeral existence places us wide as the poles asunder. I could not raise a hand against the meanest or most powerful among them. Thus I have lived on for many a year, alone and weary of myself, desirous of death yet never dying, a mortal, a mortal. Neither ambition nor avarice can enter my mind, and the ardent love that gnaws at my heart never to be returned, never to find an equal on which to expand itself, lives there only to torment me. This very day I conceived a design by which I may end all, without self-slaughter, without making another man a cain. An expedition, which mortal frame can never survive, even endued with the youth and strength that inhabits mine. Thus I shall put my immortality to the test, and rest for ever, or return, the wonder and benefactor of the human species. Before I go, a miserable vanity has caused me to pen these pages. I would not die and leave no name behind. Three centuries have passed since I quaffed that fatal beverage. Another year shall not elapse before, encountering gigantic dangers, warring with the powers of frost in their home, beset by famine, toil and tempest. I yield this body too tenacious a cage for a soul which thirsts for freedom to the destructive elements of air and water, or, if I survive, my name shall be recorded as one of the most famous among the sons of men, and my task achieved, I shall adopt more resolute means, and by scattering and annihilating the atoms that compose my frame, set at liberty the life imprisoned within, and so cruelly prevented from soaring from this dim earth to a sphere more congenial to its immortal essence. End of The Mortal Immortal Recording by Glenn Carruthers Ghana Country Since I Died by Elizabeth Stewart Phelps Ward This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Since I Died by Elizabeth Stewart Phelps Ward How very still you sit. If the shadow of an eyelash stirred upon your cheek, if that gray line about your mouth should snap its tension at this quivering end, if the pallor of your profile warmed a little, if that tiny muscle on your forehead, just at the left eyebrow's curve, should start and twitch, if you would but grow a trifle restless sitting there beneath my steady gaze, if you moved a finger of your folded hands, if you should turn and look behind your chair or lift your face, half lingering and half longing, half loving and half loath, to ponder on the annoyed and thwarted cry which the wind is making, where I stand between it and yourself against the half-closed window. Ah, there! You sigh and stir, I think. You lift your head. The little muscle is a captive still. The line about your mouth is tense and hard. The deepening hollow in your cheek has no warmer tint, I see than the great Doric column which the moonlight builds against the wall. I lean against it. I hold out my arms. You lift your head and look me in the eye. If a shudder crept across your figure, if your arms laid out upon the table leaped but once above your head, if you named my name, if you held your breath with terror or sobbed aloud for love or sprang or cried, but you only lift your head and look me in the eye. If I dared step near or nearer, if it were permitted that I should cross the current of your living breath, 
if it were willed that I should feel the leap of human blood within your veins, if I should touch your hands, your cheeks, your lips, if I dropped an arm as lightly as a snowflake round your shoulder, the fear which no heart has fathomed, the fate which no fancy has faced, the riddle which no soul has read, steps between your substance and my soul. I drop my arms. I sink into the heart of the pillared delight upon the wall. I will not wonder what would happen if my outline were defined upon it to your view. I will not think of that which could be, would be, if I struck across your vision, face to face. Ah, me, how still she sits! With what a fixed and curious stare she looks me in the eye. The wind, now that I stand no longer between it and yourself, comes enviously in. It lifts the curtain and whirls about the room. It bruises the surface of the great pearled pillar where I lean. I am caught within it. Speech and language struggle over me. Mute articulations fill the air. Tears and laughter, and the sounding of soft lips, and the falling of low cries possess me. Will she listen? Will she bend her head? Will her lips part in recognition? Is there an alphabet between us? Or have the winds of night a vocabulary to lift before her holden eyes? We sat many times together and talked of this. Do you remember, dear? You held my hand. Tears that I could not see fell on it. We sat by the great hall window upstairs, where the maple shadow goes to sleep, face down across the floor upon a lighted night. The old green curtain waved its hands upon us like a mesmerist, I thought. Like a priest, you said. When we are parted, you shall go, you said. And when I shook my head, you smiled. You always smiled when you said that, but you said it always quite the same. I think I hardly understood you then. Now that I hold your eyes in mine, and you see me not. Now when I stretch my hand and you touch me not. Now that I cry your name and you hear it not. I comprehend you, tender one. A wisdom not of earth was in your words. To live is dying. I will die. To die is life, and you shall live. Now when the fever turned, I thought of this. That must have been, ah, how long ago. I miss the conception of that for which how long stands index. Yet I perfectly remember that I perfectly understood it to be at three o'clock on a rainy Sunday morning that I died. Your little watch stood in its case of olive wood upon the table, and drops were on the window. I noticed both, though you did not know it. I see the watch now, in your pocket. I cannot tell if the hands move, or only pulsate like a heart throb, to and fro. They stand and point, mute golden fingers, paralyzed and pleading, forever at the hour of three. At this I wonder. When first you said I was sinking fast, the word sounded as old and familiar as a nursery tale. I heard you in the hall. The doctor had just left, and you went to mother and took her face in your two arms and laid your hand across her mouth, as if it were she who had spoken. She cried out and threw up her thin old hands, but you stood as still as eternity. Then I thought again, It is she who dies, I shall live. So often and so anxiously we have talked of this thing called death, that now that it is all over between us, I cannot understand why we found in it such a source of distress. It bewilders me. I am often bewildered here. Things and the fancies of things possess a relation which as yet is new and strange to me. Here is a mystery. Now, in truth, it seems a simple matter for me to tell you how it has been with me since your lips last touched me, and your arms held me to the vanishing air. Oh, drawn, pale lips, nerveless, dropping arms, I told you I would come. Did ever promise fail I spoke to you? Come and show me death, you said. I have come to show you death. I could show you the fairest sight and sweetest that ever blessed your eyes. Why, look, is it not fair, 
Am I terrible? Do you shrink or shiver? Would you turn from me or hide your strained, expectant face? Would she? Does she? Will she? Ah, how the room widened. I could tell you that. It grew great and luminous day by day. At night the walls throbbed. Lights of rose ran round them, and blue fire and a tracery as of the shadows of little leaves. As the walls expanded, the air fled. But I tried to tell you how little pain I knew or feared. Your haggard face bent over me. I could not speak. When I would, I struggled, and you said, She suffers. Dear, it was so very little. Listen till I tell you how that night came on. The sun fell and the dew slid down. It seemed to me that it slid into my heart, but still I felt no pain. Where the walls pulsed and receded, the hills came in. Where the old bureau stood above the glass, I saw a single mountain with a face of fire and purple hair. I tried to tell you this, but you said, She wanders. I laughed in my heart at that, for it was such a blessed wandering. As the night locked the sun below the mountain's solemn, watching face, the gates of space were lifted up before me. The everlasting doors of matter swung for me upon their rusty hinges, and the king of glories entered in and out. All the kingdoms of the earth and the power of them beckoned to me, across the mist my failing senses made. Ruins and roses and the brows of Jura and the singing of the Rhine a shaft of red light on the sphinx's smile, and caravans and sandstorms, and an icy wind at sea, and golden mines that no man knew, and mothers sitting at their doors in valleys singing babes to sleep, and women in dank cellars selling souls for bread, and the whir of wheels in giant factories and a single prayer somewhere in a den of death. I could not find it, though I searched. And the smoke of battle, and broken music, and a sense of lilies alone beside a stream at the rising of the sun. And at last, your face, dear, all alone. I discovered then that the walls and roof of the room had vanished quite. The night wind blew in. The maple in the yard almost brushed my cheek. Stars were about me, and I thought the rain had stopped, yet seemed to hear it upon the seeming of a window which I could not find. One thing only hung between me and immensity. It was your single, awful, haggard face. I looked my last into your eyes. Stronger than death, they held and claimed my soul. I feebly raised my hand to find your own. More cruel than the grave, your wild grasp chained me. Then I struggled, and you cried out, and your face slipped, and I stood free. I stood upon the floor beside the bed. That which had been I lay there at rest, but terrible before me. You hid your face, and I saw you slide upon your knees. I laid my hand upon your head. You did not stir. I spoke to you. Dear, look around a minute. But you knelt quite still. I walked to and fro about the room, and meeting my mother, touched her on the elbow. She only said, She's gone, and sobbed aloud. I have not gone, I cried, but she sat sobbing on. The walls of the room had settled now, and the ceiling stood in its solid place. The window was shut, but the door stood open. Suddenly I was restless, and I ran. I brushed you in hurrying by, and hit the little light stand where the tumbler stood. I looked to see if it would fall but it only shivered as if a breath of wind had struck it once. But I was restless, and I ran. In the hall I met the doctor. This amused me, and I stopped to think it over. Ah, doctor, said I, you need not trouble yourself to go up. I'm quite well tonight, you see. But he made me no answer. He gave me no glance. He hung up his hat and laid his hand upon the banister against which I leaned, and went ponderously up. It was not until he had nearly reached the landing that it occurred to me, still leaning on the banister, that his heavy arm must have swept against and through me. 
where I stood against the oaken moldings which he grasped. I saw his feet fall on the stairs above me, but they made no sound which reached my ear. You'll not disturb me now with your big boots, sir, said I, nodding. Never fear. But he disappeared from sight above me, and still I heard no sound. Now the doctor had left the front door unlatched. As I touched it, it blew wide open and solemnly. I passed out and down the steps. I could see that it was chilly, yet I felt no chill. Frost was on the grass, and in the east a pallid streak, like the cheek of one who had watched all night. The flowers in the little square plots hung their heads and drew their shoulders up. There was a lonely, late lily, which I broke and gathered to my heart, where I breathed upon it, and it warmed and looked me kindly in the eye. This, I remember, gave me pleasure. I wandered in and out about the garden in the scattering rain. My feet left no trace upon the dripping grass, and I saw with interest that the garment which I wore gathered no moisture and no cold. I sat musing for a while upon the piazza, in the garden chair, not caring to go in. It was so many months since I had felt able to sit upon the piazza in the open air. By and by, I thought, I would go in and upstairs to see you once again. The curtains were drawn from the parlor windows, and I passed and repassed, looking in. All this while the cheek of the east was warming, and the air gathering faint heats and lights about me. I remembered presently the old arbor at the garden foot where, before I was sick, we sat so much together, and thinking, she will be surprised to know that I have been down alone. I was restless, and I ran again. I meant to come back and see you, dear, once more. I saw the lights in the room where I had lain sick overhead, and your shadow on the curtain, and I blessed it with all the love of life and death as I bounded by. The air was thick with sweetness from the dying flowers. The birds woke, and the zenith lighted, and the leap of health was in my limbs. The old arbor held out its soft arms to me, but I was restless, and I ran. The field opened before me, and meadows with broad bosoms, and a river flashed before me like a scimitar, and woods interlocked their hands to stay me, but being restless, on I ran. The house dwindled behind me, and the light in my sick room and your shadow on the curtain, but yet I was restless, and I ran. In the twinkling of an eye I fell into a solitary place. Sand and rocks were in it, and a falling wind. I paused and knelt upon the sand, and mused a little in this place. I mused of you, and life, and death, and love, and agony, but these had departed from me as dim and distant as the fainting wind. A sense of solemn expectation filled the air. A tremor and a trouble wrapped my soul. I must be dead, I said aloud. I had no sooner spoken than I learned that I was not alone. The sun had risen, and on a ledge of ancient rock, weather-stained and red, there had fallen over against me the outline of a presence lifted up against the sky, and turning suddenly I saw, Lawful to utter, but utterance has fled. Lawful to utter, but a greater than law restrains me. Am I blotted from your desolate fixed eyes? Lips that my mortal lips have pressed, can you not quiver when I cry? Soul that my eternal soul has loved, can you stand enveloped in my presence and not spring like a fountain to me? Would you not know how it has been with me since your perishable eyes beheld my perished face? What my eyes have seen, or my ears have heard, or my heart conceived without you? If I have missed or mourned for you? If I have watched or longed for you? Marked your solitary days and sleepless nights and tearless eyes and monotonous slow echo of my unanswering name? Would you not know? Alas, would she? Would she not? My soul misgives me with a matchless, solitary fear. I am called, and I slip from her. I am beckoned, and I lose her. 
Her face dims, and her folded, lonely hands fade from my sight. Time to tell her a guarded thing. Time to whisper a treasured word. A moment to tell her that death is dumb, for life is deaf. A moment to tell her. End of Since I Died Read by Verla Vieira Las Cruces, New Mexico, USA The Wraith by Dora Sigerson Shorter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker The Wraith by Dora Sigerson Shorter John O'Driscoll walked up and down the little boreen that led to the wood, his heart bitter within him. A young moon looked down upon him silently. A bird twittered sleepily in the hedge close by disturbed, no doubt, by his restless tread. He was a jealous man, John O'Driscoll, and quick to fly suspicious. He drew forth his watch and glanced at it impatiently. It was still warm from the hot hand that had closed upon it but a moment before. Mary Ryan was late at the trysting place where so often she arrived before her time. Her father was from home tonight, and her mother was his friend. There was nothing to keep her, nothing except her own desires. James Farrell loved her. Was there anything in that? John O'Driscoll ground his heel into the path and cursed below his breath. Over the crooked bridge that led to the trysting place a little figure came, white-cheeked and frightened-eyed. She ran looking over her shoulder, so she stumbled often on her way. John O'Driscoll sat forlorn at the foot of the great tree that so often listened to his love story, and never till tonight beheld him deserted. His eyes were hot with anger, and his heart cold within him, so that when the little flying figure came towards him with outspread arms, he had no welcome for it. She sat weeping beside him, but did not attempt to embrace him. She clasped her empty hands loosely before her, and bent her sad gaze upon him, fearful of his anger. "'I would have been with you,' she said, "'long ago, but for a strange thing that passed me on the road.' She shuddered, as if with the cold. "'And what was that?' said John O'Driscoll roughly. "'That kept you so late. I am weary waiting you.' It was the corpse of a young girl, she said. Her eyes looked as though she had seen a vision, and she shrouded all in white from head to foot. Who was she? said John O'Driscoll, and his voice softened to tenderness. Some friend you loved? Some comrade you could ill spare? Otherwise I know you would not have deserted your own true love and left him here to mourn your absence. Who was she that made you forget the trysting hour was past? Oh, that I could discover, Mary said softly. But her dead face was turned from me, and the mourner's face were hidden as they passed. And if you could not see her, why did you not leave the place and hasten to me? Your curiosity was ill-advised, since you liked better the gruesome sight than my love and embraces. Mary Ryan laid her soft hand upon his arm, as though pleading forgiveness. Now I know not why I stayed, but... Some strange power drew me to follow, so I could not leave the sad corpse till it was underground. And where did they bury the maid? John O'Driscoll questioned, his curiosity aroused. Behind the church upon the hill or in St. Mary's graveyard, though I heard no keening and would have had it been so near. Neither on the churchyard by the hill nor in St. Mary's did they bring the corpse for burial, but where the four crossroads do meet they dug her grave and all silently, without prayer or cry, they closed the hard earth in upon her, and while I wept over her desolation they disappeared, so I knew not who she was or those who mourned her. Now in John O'Driscoll's heart a suspicion arose and would not be still. Sad as the sight was, it was not one to bring such tears or pallor to a sweetheart's face. Surely she had some better excuse than this, that a suicide had been buried in the four crossroads, such a sight was not so uncommon, nor was it sufficient excuse for his long waiting. He turned upon her angrily. Was it, then, so strange a sight that you should follow like a little child attracted by a passing show, and leave me here forgotten, waiting in impatience? Mary Ryan burst into tears at his anger, and in her own terror of what she had seen. Oh, she said fearfully, they whispered my name as they passed. My name... Each mourner that followed the corpse. 
I could hear it pass from lip to lip, so I had to follow. What does it mean, my John? I am frightened. John O'Driscoll rose to his feet and drew her up beside him. His lips were pressed together in a determined line. Come, he said. Let us go and see who it was, for your tale fills me with wonder. He took her hand loosely in his, for her story had not satisfied him in its telling. And as they went on their way, they met the old priest who had the little church upon the hilltop. Father, said John O'Driscoll, who was the young maid they buried today, and how did death come to her? Now the priest looked mildly through his glasses at the young pair before him. I have heard of no death nor no burial, said he, and looked surprised. Where did you hear the news? Perhaps it was a mistake, said John O'Driscoll, and there was sternness in his voice as he bid the father goodbye and drew Mary Ryan on beside him. And as they went over the little bridge leading to the crossroads, he saw, leaning over the parapet, the young priest who had the church of St. Mary's, and he stopped and spoke. Father, he said, they say a maid took her life and was buried today in this crossroads. Have you heard anything of this? No, said the young priest, lifting his eyes from the passing waters. What poor child has been so unfortunate? When John O'Driscoll heard the priest's denial, he laughed, but the laugh was not good to hear. It is but a story, father. Who told it did not speak the truth. That I know now. He tightened his hand till Mary nearly cried in the pain of his fingers, but he bid the father a gruff good day, and strode on, hurrying her after him. And so in silence they came to where the four crossroads met. When he came there he cast his eyes upon the ground, but though the dust lay thick and white upon it, there was no sign of any disturbance, no spade mark, no track of any feet. The wind blew the white earth into little whirlpools, and lifting it into the air tossed it far and wide over the hedges that bordered the lonesome road. John O'Driscoll looked at his sweetheart with furious eyes. She met his with a bewildered gaze. But he laughed again his ugly laugh and flung her hand from him. "'That was a foolish story to tell me, Mary Ryan,' he said. "'And by the lie you told me today I know you for a false maid. I shall leave you now, and never shall you see me more. I am well quit of one who could so deceive her lover, for she would not be good to bring into my mother's house.' With that he turned upon his heel and went his way without once looking back. When Mary heard the echo of his footsteps dying away in the distance, she crouched down in the dust, weeping. "'What evil thing did I see that took my senses from me?' she cried. "'To bring such misfortunes upon me, what fairy sight was it that it was my grief to come upon? Now my love has left me, and I no longer can live without him.' She rose from the hard ground and drew her shawl about her, shivering. And down the side of the deep stream she moved. Under the crooked bridge she went with a careless feet. The young priest, who still looked into the flowing waters, started, for he thought he heard a woman crying, but when he listened again he knew it was but the moving of the stream, leaping from stone to stone or pushing aside the reeds upon the banks. For three days John O'Driscoll traveled over the country without stop or stay, but as far as he went and quick as he went, he seemed always to hear Mary Ryan's voice calling to him, as if in great trouble. At night her face came before him in his dreams, so he feared to sleep, and by day the longing for her came so strong he could no longer bear it, and turned his face home. In the early morning he arrived and bent his steps half unconsciously toward the last place he had seen her. He felt she would still be there, crouching in the dust as he had left her, but when he reached the place he smiled at his own foolishness. There was no one at the crossroads to meet him. He started back as he looked around, for at his feet, cut in the hard ground, he saw a deep and narrow grave. Someone was to be buried here today. He thought of the story Mary had told him and drew his hand across his eyes in wonder. Here up the winding path, over the crooked bridge, he saw a dark procession come. He crouched beside the hedge to watch, and as he hid he heard Mary Ryan's name whispered on the tongues of the mourners. Poor Mary. Well it is that her mother is not alive to see her daughter buried in unholy ground. What came to her to take her innocent life? Poor Mary Ryan. But Mary passed at the head of the throng, sleeping so peacefully with a smile upon her face. No move did she make, no word did she say, even as she passed her lover so close that her shroud flapped across his cheek. Neither did she abate her strange smile when the clanging of a digging spade made him hide his face. When he raised his head, she was no more before him. The mourners, too, were going up the steep road that led to the church on the hill, some down the crooked path that led to St. Mary's. 
he could hear the sweet bells calling them to prayer. And before him was nothing save the white road, where the high wind lifted the dust in a soft shower and scattered it over the disturbed earth between the four crossroads. End of The Wraith by Dora Sigerson Shorter